Five years ago, the Johnson family was destroyed in the villa, and all because the head of the family, out of his own kindness, decided to save the little girl, thereby offending influential people in the capital, and only one child wanted to fight back. But the boy accidentally survived by falling into a deep lake, to spite his enemy. Now, five years later, Michael Johnson has acquired enormous power, capable of instilling terror by summoning ghosts and spirits into the real world. He returned to shed blood and avenge his dead relatives. God returned to the world to take revenge, to kill. A girl walks through the heavily urbanized city of New York, full of cars and people. Then, for some reason, she is stopped by a guy unknown to her until that moment. The girl turns around and sees a guy who tells her that he sees her soul turning black and predicts today's bloodbath. He justifies this by saying that it would be better to shed a little blood and hurry to prevent the consequences. The heroine is very surprised by what was said, asking again as if trying to make sure that she didn't hear it wrong. She then calls the guy a dirty pervert, refuses to date him, and walks off into the sunset. The guy reflects on the fact that he was just kindly remarking, and he was already called a pervert. How quickly women have changed in New York. But in the end, this is not Chicago. Then Michael remembers that he was born into a happy family, but his peers always mocked him for belonging to the Johnson family. But five years ago it all ended because his father decided to save the little girl. But one high-ranking person did not like this, and therefore a few days later, during a banquet at the villa, the Johnson family was destroyed. Only Michael survived. All the family's friends did nothing and just stood and looked at such a tragedy. Michael was very angry at the killer of his family. He vowed to kill him no matter what. However, the boy's attack was unsuccessful, and the rich man only laughed at his stupid attempt. In the end, the mother miraculously managed to push the child into Lake Newark, where the master saved him and took him with him to Chicago, giving him the ability to summon ghosts and spirits. Now the master gave Michael the task of returning to New York, and he vowed that he would take full revenge. After his memories, the guy feels that his body does not move, and because of the oppressive atmosphere it becomes harder to breathe. He then notices the spirit that he assumes is to blame for these feelings and captures it. Passers-by on the street feel something strange, but cannot understand what exactly happened. Michael understands that before carrying out his revenge, he must first complete the task assigned to him. Apple is one of the 500 largest companies doing business in New York. Three days ago, the old man found out that within a hundred days trouble would happen to Sarah Walsh, after which she would most likely die. The old man said that he had something with her grandmother, maybe Sarah was his granddaughter. At the entrance to Apple, Michael Johnson is stopped by security guards. He wonders if they know a person named Sarah Walsh. The guards indignantly ask whether he has an appointment with the above-mentioned lady, to which he declares that he has a very important matter and they need to meet in person. The security doesn't want to let him in and doesn't believe him, saying that Michael needs to leave immediately while he's still alive. The guy uses his strength and makes the guards fall to their knees in a panic attack. The main character turns everything into a joke for those around him and goes about his business. He sits in a comfortable pale yellow chair in the organization's lobby and orders the chief to be called to him. People start to panic. Something strange is happening. Michael is confused. An armed detachment bursts in and encircles young Johnson. The head of security approaches the guy and threatens him with consequences for entering this office. Michael, in a rage, repeats everything he told the security earlier. The head of security senses that something is wrong with the guy, and he is very strong, so he caves and says that Sarah is not in place today, but Michael can leave his contacts. The hero pretends to believe that his goal is not in the workplace, and therefore resigns himself to his fate. But he immediately reports that he still has nothing to do, so he can sit here all day, indifferently sending the squad to rest. The chief security officer is confused. He understands that he will lose his job if he does not drive Michael away, but he cannot do anything about it. Then he changes his mind and orders his men to seize the young man who broke into Apple. Some pretty girl with good shape and heels appears and orders the security to retreat. She attracts the attention of those around her and turns out to be a director named Jessica Nightingale, whose beauty can only be matched by President Sarah Walsh. The security officer tries to warn the headmistress about the danger, but she brushes his words aside like an annoying fly. Jessica introduces herself to the intruder and asks how she can help him. Michael peers at the director and some images from the past begin to pop up in his head. 
He recalls that Jessica was his deskmate in elementary school and that they had a great relationship until middle school. Johnson again falls back into the events of five years ago, seeing his return to the already sealed house after the incident. The whole city turned its back on his family, and an assassination attempt was made on his father's company. All of New York was at the mercy of one man. Despite the pressure from others, Jessica endured all the rumors and buried my parents on the mountain, placing a tombstone. Michael did not think that they would ever meet again. Now he is obliged to thank her somehow. Coming out of his memories, the guy finds himself too close to the girl, which she delicately hints at. Jessica repeats her question, to which the guy replies that he saw her somewhere. She is embarrassed and says that this is an old-fashioned way to start a conversation. The girl ends the conversation and, despite the cries of the clerks, asks to leave the guy alone and not create so much useless noise. Michael notices that Jessica has changed a lot since their last meeting, especially her breasts. He decides that his priority now is Jessica, not Sarah. Director Nightingale gets into his cool, expensive car. Then she notices Michael in her back seat, who shouldn't be there. The guy casually starts the conversation, as if this is how everything was supposed to happen, completely ignoring the girl's reaction. She doesn't understand what the guy wants to achieve, and how he even ended up here. Michael sweetly announces his desire to go for a ride with Jessica, again ignoring her confusion. The girl embarrassedly asks if he was waiting for someone, but he reports that this is not that important at all. Slightly irritated, the heroine says that she cannot allow a stranger to sit in her car, and therefore he needs to introduce himself. Michael reports that he is ready to give his name, while simultaneously sensing darkness and a bloody trail from her soul, which foreshadow a big event and then shyly gives his name. Downtown, a big, beautiful building that every office clerk would love to be in. Jessica appears at the banquet with Michael, wearing a chic dress that emphasizes the girl's equally attractive figure. All eyes are on her. Everyone wants to know who she is and what kind of guy came with her. They sit down at a large banquet table, surrounded by whispers from those around them that the director has never brought a man over for the evening. Wealthy men immediately gather around her wanting to get to know her better. Michael remains meaningfully silent, while Jessica tries to keep the attention on herself. Everyone offers Mrs. Nightingale a drink, to which she becomes very embarrassed. Michael intercepts the glass intended for his companion, wondering how many glasses he needs to drink. Those who recently communicated so nicely with Jessica are greatly outraged by the intervention of some unknown beggar. Michael does not ignore the insults, smiling sarcastically. The director takes the glass from the guy, demonstrating his control over the situation. Jessica touchingly reports that she doesn't know how to drink wine, so she asks to be allowed to drink just one sip. This does not go unnoticed by her newly acquired fans. A man with a bottle of wine, standing out from the crowd with his charisma, appears and asks if one sip will not be enough. Jessica, straining greatly, recognizes him as Raphael Burke. Everyone around is gossiping about the influence of the young man and that the last time Nightingale threw a glass of wine on Burke, as a result of which he became madly angry. Raphael angrily reveals that Jessica must drink the whole bottle to atone for her past incident. He clearly makes it clear that this is not a request, but an order. The mistress tries to get out of it by insisting on one glass, otherwise she will cause trouble for others remembering that she threw the glass on him that time because she thought it contained drugs. She, Raphael, approaching her at a dangerously close distance, reports that he has already booked the presidential suite, and therefore she will have a place to rest, and she should not break down. Jessica is afraid that there might also be drugs in there this time, so she doesn't dare to drink. The aggressor flares up in his displeasure, calling Jessica dirty names, hinting that even Sarah Walsh is drinking today. Sarah tearfully reflects on her situation, realizing that compared to his power, it means nothing. Michael bursts between the two people, taking Raphael's bottle away, leaving him in angry confusion. Burke curses dirty at the hero, for which he is instantly hit on the head with a bottle, causing it to shatter into pieces. The former abuser complains of a pain in his head, like a small child. Michael responds to the complaints by saying that it is rude to force a girl to drink. Everyone is shocked by what just happened to such a highly respected person. Someone notices that the guy will not live to see tomorrow morning, because he went against the Burke family, one of the most influential politicians in New York. Jessica begins to beg to spare her friend, promising to drink any wine in any quantity, understanding the consequences. 
In great rage, Raphael curses at the heroine and hits her in the face, informing her that the two of them will have big problems today. Burke continues to appear, but young Johnson interrupts him with a sharp kick to the balls. Raphael, crumpled on the floor in pain, swears that he will kill Michael, calling him a bastard. The main character flares up with hatred and hits the enemy's face on the floor, saying that he will still see which of them will die first. Many significant-looking men in black glasses appear, who look disapprovingly at what is happening in order to stop. The man standing in front, with growing anger, repeats twice that Michael must let his victim go. Onlookers report that this is the head of the Burke family and also the father of Raphael, and therefore Johnson is finished. Next to the head of the family stands a strange man with a long beard and an inscrutable gaze, who is most likely a legendary warrior. Jessica realizes that she and Michael are in huge trouble, and Raphael calls his daddy for help. Johnson releases the arrogant rich man with demonstrative indifference. In the past, the handsome and charismatic Raphael runs to his daddy like a little coward. The ancient warrior also has some kind of secret power, like Michael, but does not express any emotions. Little Burke begs his father to punish his offender for taking Jessica from him. The father, furious, orders his pathetic son to shut up and get out of here, to which he is very surprised. The head of the family inquires about the origins of the young man from that same warrior named Jack Larson, addressing him personally while Burke's son hides behind him. Larson reports that Michael also has power, and due to his youth it is easier for him to activate the power. The main character listens with feigned indifference, and then wonders what else they have to say, and what they generally want to achieve. The dishonored head of the family sets his warrior against Johnson, telling him to leave the body if he asks for mercy. The legendary warrior warns the hero that the guy should not have gotten involved with someone like him, and begins his attack. Quickly approaching, the old man recommends that the young man beg for mercy. Michael indifferently responds to the enemy, and Jessica, in confusion, wonders whether this is really the same ancient warrior in front of her. Young Johnson, with complete indifference, grabs the old man by the top knot of his hair, wondering if the family has prepared a coffin for him. The old man experiences an indescribable range of emotions from the impudence of the boy. Jack Larson's eyes flash with blue flames, and he himself makes a sharp lunge towards his opponent, intending to deliver a crushing blow. Michael dodges the attack without any problems, leaving the warrior confused by his lack of control over the situation. The main character, using his advantage, delivers a crushing blow right to the face of the legendary warrior. From the power of Michael Johnson, the ancient warrior is finally and irrevocably defeated and slammed into the floor, and the main character complains about the old man's dishonorable attack. Everyone around is shocked by what they have just seen and is in a stupor from the shock they have suffered. Michael asks with absolute indifference who will be next. Father and son are shocked by how their legendary war was defeated with one blow. The old man wonders how the main character could have such power. Michael sarcastically discusses who he is. A strong sound wave emanates from Johnson, which does not go unnoticed by anyone present, including the great warrior Larson. Michael arrogantly approaches the head of the family, without even taking his hands out of his pockets, and addresses him by name. Using his power, the young hero intimidates the elder Burke, repeating the threats that were previously addressed to himself. Michael remembers that the Johnson and Burke families feuded for many years, even when the hero was not alive. Raphael's father orders his people to get rid of this insolent man. In the hope of increasing their salaries, the guards, as if in a race, are trying to be the first to get to the enemy. All the guards rush at Michael at the same time, but he calmly deals with them in an instant. The main character says that ordinary people obey and leave, looking around at their defeated rivals. Members of the Burke family humiliate themselves before Johnson and apologize in every possible way, begging him to leave them alive, and Michael mocks their helplessness. The hero's eyes flash with the red flame of revenge, and he says that the debts must be repaid. Just in time to ensure no one gets hurt, security rushes in and orders it to stop immediately. The chief officer, a pretty young girl in a tie and shirt with shoulder straps, asks Michael to move away from the people. Finding members of the Burke family on their knees, she wonders what her son has done again. Encouraged by the arrival of the security service, the father, joyful and relieved, says that they have been saved. Also, being in great shock from what she saw, she notices the defeated legendary warrior of the Burke family, who is dragging on his knees on the floor. Michael grabs the head of the family by the hair 
and says that he was just bravely defending a girl from a prosperous family from the advances of this guy. The officer aims a gun at the protagonist, ordering him to let go of Burke's hair or she will shoot. Meanwhile, Michael indifferently reflects on the fact that the captain turned out to be a woman. Young Johnson does not comply, which is why he receives a second warning, and all the other armed people aim their weapons at him. Michael is going to deal with them too, again tapping into his inner strength. At this moment, Jessica grabs his hand, apologizes and says that the guy is not okay, he has cramps in his arms and legs. The lady invites the guy to stay here, to which he rightly asks why he needs this. The main characters argue, Jessica says that she will leave Johnson if he doesn't stop, to which he is indignant. At the same time, the head of the Burke family is worried about the state of his hair. Mistress Nightingale sits the guy down and tries to show the security captain that he's surrendering so they don't have to shoot. Michael is very upset that he was not allowed to deal with the security service, so he asks what to do next, and Jessica asks that this be left to her. The director tells Johnson that he will have to travel with the captain, fill out a statement that he defended himself, then everything will be fine. He replies that he will be able to leave without any problems. It's already late at night. There is peace and quiet in the city. The sky is clear. The stars and the police department are clearly visible. Another police officer comes into the office of Captain Jenkins, who is at the crime scene, and reports that they have watched the video footage more than ten times. The subordinate reports that all cameras show that Michael Johnson acted in self-defense, with the exception of one. The girl asks what he means by doubts in one cell, to which he shows her the recording. The cameras show that at first the old man approaches the guy, but in the next frame he is already lying on the floor, and what happened at that moment is unknown. The captain reasons that despite their quick reaction, someone could have managed to erase the data from the CCTV camera. Despite the fact that he may have enormous power hidden within him, there is no evidence against Johnson, and therefore they recognize it only as self-defense and let him go. A satisfied Jessica and an indifferent Michael leave the police station into a clear night. The girl is glad that they got off easy. The young hero realizes that if he leaves New York, the Burks will get their dirty paws on her again. Michael decides that he needs to find time to deal with them. They walk through the city at night, having a nice conversation, the guy offers to walk her home. Jessica begins to get nervous. Johnson reports that he just arrived in the city and has not yet found a place to stay for the night, and therefore he will apparently have to spend the night on a bench in the park, to which the girl replies that she has a free room in her apartment that she can allocate for Michael. Johnson begins to make vulgar jokes towards Mrs. Nightingale, which makes her very embarrassed. They continue their casual conversation, not noticing the car parked nearby. In this car is Captain Jenkins, already familiar to us, who is watching the couple, talking about Michael's strength, since all the bodyguards of the Burke family are former special forces. After reasoning, she calls her brother and sends the CCTV footage in the hope that he will help figure it out. The mountains are at the level of the clouds. A lonely house with a pair of windows and an orange triangular roof has been built here. Captain Jenkins' brother, who has solid muscles, a scar on his face and a bunch of weapons on his back, complains about his sister, since she always asks for his help. He is outraged by the current situation, because he is the captain of the Dragon Spirit Squad, and not a movie policeman, but he still undertakes to help his sister and pulls the laptop with his power. The brother Jenkins turns on the device and begins watching the video sent by his sister. Smiling maliciously, he is indignant at the inability of the bodyguards to resist such a child, they should be fired, this is a disgrace. The dragon spirit captain notices a shot of Michael dispatching opponents without even touching them, realizing that he has the power. He says that skill is the peak of opportunity, and Johnson is a true martial artist. Brother Jenkins calls her, and says that he would really like to know more about this guy in the video as soon as possible. There is a growing crescent moon in the sky, there is light cloudiness, a panel house in which the lights are on, and Jessica lives there. Mrs. Nightingale comes out of the bathroom and says that it is now free and Michael can go there. Standing under hot water in the shower, doused with steam, he again begins to remember his past. After being saved from death, he thought it was a blessing, but an even worse nightmare began. On the very first day, without any explanation, the master threw him into a cage with a tiger that had been starving for three days. But in the end, Michael survived and defeated the tiger but this was only the beginning of his trials. The master sent him to dangerous places, to 
tempering his body and soul, each time he faced hopeless situations, and each time he survived, so he feels alive only when he is constantly in anger and hatred. The last Johnson swears that he will find all those who were at that ill-fated banquet, and they will pay for everything in full. Meanwhile, Jessica is slicing a watermelon, thinking about how Michael has nothing to change into and remembering that she forgot to hide her underwear. In a panic, she runs to pick up what she left in the hope that the guy has not yet seen anything. The girl runs into the shower, asks Michael not to leave, but notices that he has already left and is standing in front of her, covering himself with a towel. In front of him, she cannot say what she wanted and begins to stutter, but he cannot understand what she wants, asks to wait, while he gets dressed and pulls off the towel. She runs away, slamming the door behind her, leaving the guy very bewildered. A very embarrassed Jessica is in her room trying to prove that she didn't see anything unnecessary. Michael understands that she won't come out anymore, but that's good, because he still needs to settle some things. It's late at night in the Burke family's luxurious villa with a swimming pool and the lights on in the room. The father grinds his teeth from public humiliation, the son tells his father to stop shaking with hatred, as it makes him dizzy. Dad is very indignant, he shouts that because of his useless son, the legendary warrior Jack Larson is seriously injured, and only his grandfather can protect the family instead. The son, sobbing, offers to call his grandfather, since he still does nothing, and the father says that he cannot leave it like this, so he will not calm down until he deals with that guy. Together they decide to call the elder Burke, and Raphael imagines how he will mock Michael, undressing Jessica in front of him. During the conversation, a dark figure appears, suspiciously reminiscent of Johnson, who wonders what they are talking about. The members of the Burke family present are in indescribable shock at the appearance of their newfound worst enemy. Michael sits casually on a chair and invites them to chat, while the others are afraid that he will kill them. The Burkles do not believe that he is capable of killing, but the protagonist begins to use his power against them, directing his supernatural power against his son. The father begins to tearfully beg Johnson to let him live, explaining that he has no claims against him, to which Michael just laughs madly, sarcastically questioningly repeating the phrase about claims. The guy angrily reminds the father of the Burke family that five years ago there was a banquet at which all the Johnsons were killed. Berkeley suddenly begins to realize that his opponent is the same boy who fell into the lake, and is surprised that he still survived. Michael slams his hand full of magical power into Berkeley Sr.'s face. The last Johnson, before killing Burke Sr., says that he is not an ancient warrior at all, but a god of medicine, and then laughs at his idea that a warrior is the peak of his capabilities. Michael uses his magic to deal with the man and shouts that he will deal with any one blow. On this day, New York shook. Claude Burke, the eldest of the Burks, materializes above the mountain in extreme dissatisfaction, he is dressed in a kimono, magical energy flows around him. He sees the death of his relatives, but does not know who dared to do it. The old man swears that he will find the one who did this, behead him and chop him into thousands of pieces. At Jessica's apartment, Michael meditates in the company of his power spirit, and muses about how he needs to train more while being there. Johnson is holding a black stone in his hands, a gift from his father for the boy's tenth birthday, he still doesn't know what to do with it, and in a week the day of his parents' death will come, and therefore he will need to visit them. The guy notices a strange inscription in red on the stone. He suggests that blood should be dripped onto it. The stone jumps out of the hero's hands. The artifact begins to spread large waves of energy around itself, pressing on Michael, which makes his head spin. He won't last long. The young hero appears at the cemetery beaten and half-naked, surrounded only by a clear night swords stuck in the ground, and tombstones. Michael comes to his senses, his head is pounding, and he notices a black fog around him. He ended up in the cemetery of rebirth, and does not understand what is happening there, and how he ended up there. Magic swords glowing with violet fire from the sky begin to fall on him. Among the swords, red eyes with vague outlines of mouth appear, they seem to have bad intentions. Roth angrily says that being in the late stage of life, the hero dared to enter the rebirth cemetery. Multiple dark spirits order the guy to leave immediately if he wants to live. Michael sleeps on the bed in a cold sweat with a black stone in his hand and a sore head. He remembers last night and that his strength has not yet reached the threshold of entering the rebirth cemetery. There are exactly 100 tombstones, 
therefore one hundred souls. A knock on the door interrupts his thoughts. It is Jessica who informs him that breakfast is ready and she is waiting for him. Finishing his reasoning, the guy goes out and sits down at the table, where Mrs. Nightingale is already there in a rich, delicious breakfast. Michael turns to Jessica that she cares about him so much that he doesn't want to leave and offers to wash the dishes, cook on his own and warm his bed on cold winter nights. She notices that she has heated floors in winter, and if he wants to stay, it's not possible since she has monthly rent and household chores. The guy embarrassedly says that he doesn't have money now. Jessica suspects that he decided to live at her expense. Young Johnson grabs a napkin, begins to write something intensely on it, and then hands her a piece of paper with some kind of recipe. This rejuvenating product of one of my friends is considered low-grade, but if you register it, then rent will not be a problem. Jessica laughs at his proposal and says that no company in the market would be interested in his proposal. Michael imagines the complete success of the product in his head. Then the director's phone rings. It turns out to be Sarah Walsh. Jessica takes off and runs to the meeting, leaving the guy alone in confusion, recommending that he find a job rather than think about the elixir. The central market, where Michael is trying to sell his miraculous remedy, Miracle Hands, which cures all diseases. Passers-by notice the extravagant price of 100000 and they clearly do not intend to buy this product for that kind of money, considering the guy a man-man and a charlatan. Suddenly, a pretty girl in a beret and a pink windbreaker appears in the crowd. She calls the seller to her, jokingly calling him a charlatan. Michael leaves with the girl. Upon arrival, they see a large, beautiful house. The guy again advertises his medicine, but the girl explains that this is not what she brought him here for. She introduces herself as Anna S. and says that she is extremely captivated by his desire to outweet everyone, to which Michael says that he has no time for games, and then he tries to leave. After that, she gives a card, the balance of which is the promised hundred thousand, and the main character changes his position and says that he is all at her disposal and will go through fire and water for her. Anna tells a sad story about her family and about the illness of her father, who only has a couple of days left to live, and she is also afraid that after his death her mother will do something stupid. She asks Michael to take his father to the mountains for pretend treatment to make it easier for his mother to bear his loss, and the guy notices that this miss is not very smart. Finding a benefit for himself, the hero promises to do everything in the best possible way. They enter the house and are greeted by the doctor, noting that now is not a good time to receive guests, since her father Robert Clark is ill. The guy and the girl enter the chambers, finding the older Clark looking sick. The girl tells her father that she has returned again. Michael realizes that things are very bad. He sees that this man will soon leave for another world, since his chest is already filled with dead air, and when it reaches his head, nothing will help him. The daughter also sees her father's condition and tells Michael that they have been undergoing treatment for a long time, but not a single doctor could help him, and the latter said that dad had one day to live she asks the guy to help hide this fact from her mother at any cost. Then the mother comes into the room and asks if it is true that the father has one day to live, as the doctor told her. Some guy remarks that there is no point in hiding this information from his mother. He introduces himself as Percy Clark, Anna's brother, and says that he has already organized the funeral, which will take place in a picturesque place. The daughter complains about the indifference and callousness of her brother, with which he says this in front of his mother, but he says that his father has already suffered enough, and when Percy himself becomes the head of the family, he will not offend anyone. Michael understands that if his mother is gone, then there will be even more money for Percy, and Anna says that his father will never allow him to become the head of the family, telling his brother that he is just an animal. Percy curses his sister dirty, threatens her cruelly, and raises his hand to her. Michael defends the girl, attacking her brother, saying that her father is not dead yet, but this one has already planned everything. The doctor intervenes and states that the main character has just hit the future head of the Clark house and wonders who he even is. The god of medicine asks for a price of 10 million and promises to heal the father of the family. The mother asks her daughter whether that guy can really help her father, to which the girl lies, saying that she has known him for a very long time and is completely confident in him. Anna reasons that he simply has to cure dad because he charged an incredible price for his services. Percy is clearly not happy with the intervention of some charlatans sent by his sister, 
and feels from him a danger to himself and his plans, he does not care what happens next, the main thing is that he will definitely receive an inheritance. Michael approaches the bed of the father of the Clark family. There is no one else in the room. The guy decides that he will not let him die, since they have already met. Particles of his power begin to appear around him. He reports that the knowledge he has acquired about medicine should be enough to pull the old man out of the ghostly gates. Michael's eyes glow pinkish purple and he recites a spell. Robert, to the loud exclamation of the guy who shouts get up, rises into the air. Black energy begins to come out of his eyes and mouth along with dark smoke. Michael realizes that this battle will be much more difficult than he expected, since the man is enveloped in the energy of death. But the old man still has a pulse, and therefore all is not lost. Michael continues to fight with the dark force of death for the body of the father of the family. The dead spirit escapes from the man's body, and Michael catches it in his fist. The remnants of the dark essence forcefully splash out from the old man's body heading into Michael's fist. Exhausted but alive, the old man falls onto his bed, and Michael argues that saving him was harder than killing any of his previous opponents. The god of medicine goes out the door to his waiting relatives and reports that everything is fine with their head of the family, and he will wake up soon. Percy can't believe his ears in the fact that his plans will go to waste. Anna doesn't understand whether her new acquaintance is deceiving them, and her mother cries from her newfound happiness. Michael asks to pay him, the enthusiastic wife of the reborn thanks him and gives him a card, telling him the password for it. But Percy, clearly dissatisfied with this set of circumstances, intervenes and brings his mother down to earth, reminding him that his father has an advanced stage of lung cancer, and it is not possible to cure him. Percy sticks his finger in the supposed charlatan's face, insisting that he must see the results first to which the medicine god replies that it wasn't that easy for him to earn that money and grabs his finger. The next moment, Percy is already writhing on the floor in pain, and Michael says that he took the money as if for a consultation, and the master will wake up for three days, and after that they can turn to him again, and if they don't come, then death for their relative is already guaranteed. To Percy, enraged, vows to finish Michael off, and the doctor tries to calm him down, and says that he will help him sort everything out. Then, unexpectedly for everyone, Robert comes out to the family, the son is in incredible shock from what he sees, and mother and daughter are sincerely happy to see him. With his first words, the father asks where the doctor who saved his life has gone. The head of the Clarks thanks his wife and daughter for calling such a wonderful doctor for him, and sarcastically remarks to his son that he has done a lot of good things lately. The father angrily attacks his son, knowing full well what he really planned, and that Percy will never see his father's money again unless he finds the doctor who saved his life again. At the same time, a meeting of directors is taking place at the Apple office, where it is reported that shares are falling, and the company is in a difficult situation and that the forecast will not change in the near future. Everyone is discussing that they need to launch a new line of cosmetics to avoid bankruptcy. Jessica sits in complete confusion, remembering Michael's recent dubious proposal. She's all nervous, her chest itches, she tries to do something about it, and finds Johnson's note. The paper contains a recipe for the very elixir that the young man was talking about. While Jessica is talking about how something like this can cost 10 million, a girl with glasses comes up behind her and snatches the piece of paper from her hands. Carmen wonders what the headmistress is hiding in her underwear, and then wonders what the recipe is. The girls begin to argue over the piece of paper since Carmen does not want to give it back and mocks Jessica, hinting that she got the recipe through the bed, to which the heroine hints that not everyone is like her. The rival ignores Mrs. Nightingale's requests and tears the paper in front of her eyes. Jessica is incredibly angry and cannot say a word out of anger, and then pushes Carmen, shouting that it was her piece of paper. The others, noticing this altercation, completely ignore what is happening, since this is not the first time this has happened. The girls swear and angrily grab each other by the hair, swearing over the just-destroyed piece of paper, and Carmen also insults Jessica, and she threatens to tear her painted face like that note. Some seemingly bossy woman appears and tells the girls to stop quarreling immediately. Apple President Sarah Walsh fully enters the room, her eyes glowing, and the flames of her employees' fear of her person blazing behind her. Everyone calms down and the meeting begins. Everyone present listens carefully to the president's speech. She is very unhappy with the research and development department because their products remain the same for many years. 
workers try to justify themselves by complaining about high competition and the fact that they have already searched through all the known recipes. But this does not help improve the effects of cosmetics. Sarah thinks in her head that it took her a long time to build her biggest cosmetics company, and therefore she can't give up so easily. Carmen sarcastically remarks that Jessica had some kind of recipe from a famous person. Everyone gets inspired when they hear the name of this person, wondering if she really has something like that. She reports that this is not entirely true, because this recipe was written by her friend. Jessica frantically shows the torn piece of paper, trying to say that her friend was just trying to make a joke. Everyone around is disappointed with the priceless formula written on a napkin, and Carmen is happy that she was able to humiliate her rival by making her look like a fool. Then one of the employees of the research and development department notices that the recipe is true, despite everything. All the hatred of those gathered was directed at Carmen, since everyone saw that she was tearing this napkin to annoy Jessica. Sarah promises to fire the culprit, and if the recipe is not restored then to prosecute her. Carmen begs for mercy, noting that she did not do this on purpose. The employee reports that with this formula, they will be able to make a real breakthrough in the industry surpassing their competitors. The president is extremely inspired by the information received and orders an immediate search for the pieces and restoration of the elixir recipe. Carmen is shocked that Jessica had the same recipe, and she also helped introduce it, so she freezes on the spot, and Sarah tells her to go to the shopping department. They will look after her. The director returns home and calls Michael, but he seems to have already left. Jessica sits on the sofa in thought and wonders whether her new friend, who wrote that very recipe, will return. Michael amazes the girl with his actions, because in fact he is a stranger who spent the night with her and wrote the right recipe. She even begins to think that he is the hidden ruler of the world. Someone's hand falls on her head, she begins to scream in horror, covered in cold sweat, and behind her is a guy whom the heroine was thinking about just recently, who asks why she called him and how she is doing. Jessica asks when he managed to return, the guy says that he had just heard her call. They talk. The girl is incredibly embarrassed. She asks to write the recipe for the elixir for her again, since the previous formula was spoiled. Michael reports that the recipe is not that good yet. It's just a note. The guy offers to write another recipe. The guy is about to go to bed, and therefore says that Jessica should also go to bed early today, but she tries to continue the conversation, grabbing his hand. Michael jokes that he is ready to listen to her if she asks him as a man, to which the girl says that she can still call the police. Jessica turns the conversation to the topic of his search for Sarah Walsh, and says that she herself wants to see him. The guy with a dissatisfied face repeats Sarah Walsh's name, and says that he won't go to her, he can't, he's busy. The girl tries to remind him that he went through a lot to get to her, and now he himself is resisting. He quips that yesterday his love was ignored so today it's his turn to be hard to touch. Michael insists that Mrs. Walsh call him herself tomorrow, since he is not in the mood to go to her, after which he ends the conversation and goes to bed. Then Jessica's phone rings. It turns out to be her boss, who is interested in what she was able to get from Michael. Sarah says she'll think about contacting him herself, but for now let the director keep an eye on the guy. The president, having hung up the phone, talks about what an unusual young man she came across who first makes a scene in the office, and then does not dare to come. The next morning, Michael enters the Temple of Humanity, pondering the strange appearance for the pharmacy. Michael notices a long line at the pharmacy, so he decides that he needs to look around first, at the largest pharmacy he has ever seen. Michael stops next to a huge painting, which he really likes, even though he understands that it is just a fake. Michael notices that someone behind him asks where this beetle came from, turns around and sees in front of him Lily and Jacob Sanders, who are grandfather and granddaughter. The girl is indignant that the guy called their family's treasure a fake, noting that she doesn't may be so, since it was bought in the capital. Jacob delicately notes that several collectors have noticed the authenticity of the image, to which Johnson replies that this only proves that they and the collectors are uneducated. He notices the flaw, but dismissively says that the copy is very good, and therefore they can continue to deceive people, and then sadly remarks that he expected to find something worthwhile here. The granddaughter begins to glow with magical turquoise energy, and the grandfather tries to stop her, reminding her that this is a simple person. She can't let the bastard be so arrogant, and prepares a magical strike, 
swinging her leg at him. Grandfather shouts that ancient martial arts cannot be used against mere mortals. Michael, without much difficulty, grabs the girl by the leg with which she wanted to inflict a magical blow, disdainfully wondering if this is really all she is capable of. Lily in her head is shocked that the guy so easily defended himself from her technique, with which she easily knocks out two bags of sand. The main character asks if she has calmed down and begins to tickle her recently captured leg. The tickling makes the girl lose concentration and falls to the floor, leaving her grandfather shocked by what is happening. Michael jokes and laughs at the girl's abilities, but says that a couple more years of training could fix everything. Lily Sanders screams in rage at her attacker, who remains completely indifferent. The adult notices that he coped with her reception without any problems, and therefore only with his mercy, she is still healthy, and she complains that he simply pissed her off, so she would have easily won. Michael hints that he can repeat it at full strength by showing her terrifying form behind him. The girl wants to run away. The grandfather apologizes for her behavior, and also orders his granddaughter to apologize. After this, the old man asks Michael to tell him more about this picture, since he is already too old for such riddles. Michael, using his superpower, shows the old man why he said that the painting is a fake, and also reports that sometimes it is very difficult to distinguish a fake from the original. Besides, the author of this work tried very hard and not for a small amount. After the story, the hero receives medicine from the hands of Lilia Sanders herself, the granddaughter of the chief physician. Michael offends the girl, to which she flares up again and declares that today is simply not her day, and in general her grandfather interrupted her. Jacob puts the girl in her place, saying that even her master cannot learn the powers that the guy standing in front of them has. Michael orders more medicine, they say they will do it for free for the inconvenience, but the guy insists on paying. Johnson says that he has enough money to pay, and the girl makes faces at him in order to somehow offend him. Jacob tries to explain to his granddaughter that this warrior is from a famous family, and if it's really him, then the city will be uneasy in the near future. Michael walks through the city and remembers his plan for revenge and that it is time to prepare for it. But first he realizes that he needs to deal with the annoying fly, meaning the suspicious guy behind him. Meanwhile, in the pharmacy the argument continues about who this guy was here just now, the girl does not believe that he is special, and the grandfather says that he is, however, stronger than her master. There are rumors that he can destroy entire troops with his bare hands, all weapons are powerless against him, and people are just ants to him. The girl says that he is too young, but grandfather continues that he is not even a master, but something more powerful. You can't give him more than twenty, and he already has so many opponents, so we shouldn't become one of them. The Clark family messenger is happy to have found the one he was ordered to find so quickly. Michael turned into an alley. The guy thinks that he was noticed, but it turns out that his target has completely disappeared. The guy is still confused, but Johnson is already diving on top of him using his magical power. The servant finds himself under Michael. The young hero tells the servant not to force him to kill. The pursuer asks for mercy, promising to tell everything he knows. The guy turns out to be a private detective and tells everything about himself, his family, profession, hobbies, complains about living conditions, says that he took out a loan. Michael explodes and shouts that he needs the name of the customer, and not all the nonsense he just heard. The detective says that the father of the Clark family is looking for him everywhere and has offered a reward of one million for his capture. Michael remembers about the untreated old man. The detective simultaneously offers a lucrative offer, asking him to go with him to the customer. The hero leaves indifferently, recommending the guy not to do this kind of thing again if he wants to live. The character returns to the house and notices a very nicely dressed Jessica there, who is getting ready to go somewhere. She tells Michael that they are going shopping together to get new clothes for him and a phone to keep in touch. He says that she shouldn't spend so much money on him and Jessica tells him not to worry about it, taking his arm and heading to the store. Michael is standing in his new dress suit. It suits him very well, perfectly complimenting his appearance. Jessica embarrassedly remarks that he looks very attractive in this suit. She, winking, says that in this form it's not even a shame to pick up students, and also wonders if he has anyone and talks about her friend's older sister as a real beauty, to which the hero sharply replies that he doesn't have one. There will never be a girl. The girl suspects that Michael has never fallen in love and that he is generally a virgin, but he remembers in his head that he clearly had no time for this. 
For five years he honed his skills, and therefore he had no time or desire to communicate with girls. But once upon a time, when his family was still alive, he liked Lucy Vox, who was the most beautiful in school, he even wrote her a love letter, which she replied to. The answer was a request to admit this in front of everyone at the line at school, which he did in his naivety, and she blew him off in front of everyone, it was a trap, and he fell for it. Then he realized that girls are a waste of time and resources and not worth it. The guy is burning with rage, and the girl tells him not to worry so much, because she didn't have anyone either, but life is still wonderful. They go to another store, talking peacefully, and on the way they meet Maria, a friend of Michael's first love. Dahlberg ignores the hero, turning only to Jessica, noting that she has not changed at all and seems to have a boyfriend. Then she notices that he looks suspiciously like Michael Johnson. Next, she tells her friend the story that the hero recently recalled. After searching the internet, they find out that the victim of their dispute has already died along with his entire family. Michael flares up and wants to shut up the stupid old acquaintance along with her vile boyfriend. Jessica notices the guy's condition, grabs his hand and tells him not to pay attention to them, and takes him further to the shops. Insults fly in the back. Michael says that he could get rid of them without any problems, to which Jessica gently hints that the guy was already at the station a couple of days ago. They notice a very cool suit that would be great for Michael. The consultant notices them and says that they made a great choice, and the price is only 360000 Jessica realizes that she doesn't have enough money on her card, so she tries to pretend that the suit doesn't suit him at all. Maria Dahlberg appears again and speaks, insulting Mrs. Walsh, to which she tries to justify herself. Jessica is very angry and wants to hit her friend, but she threatens with her connections and says that there will be consequences. Michael can hold back his emotions and gives this pathetic woman a juicy slap, telling her that she'd better shut her mouth forever. Everyone is shocked by this act. Jessica is surprised. An old friend is surprised that she was hit. Her boyfriend is very confused. The bitch's boyfriend threatens with his status, simultaneously performing some actions on the phone, saying that such poor people as they can only dream of money like his. In the midst of an argument, Percy appears with his father, who are confused by what they saw in the store. He wonders how someone dared threaten the god of medicine using his own company's name. The boyfriend cannot believe his eyes. He sees in front of him the president of the company, who should now be seriously ill. A girl and a rich guy bow to the power of the father of the Clark family. The president ignores the clinging, heading straight to his savior, thanking him for saving his life in sincere gratitude. Everyone around is shocked by the relationship between the rich man and Michael, especially Jessica, who thought that her friend had no power. Michael disappointingly reports that, unfortunately, most of his family is not happy to learn that he survived, but the master says that his son is ready to improve and orders him to kneel before Johnson. The guy, sitting on his knees, apologizes for the inconvenience caused to the god of medicine. Those familiar with Percy are shocked by his behavior, because he has always been very proud and incapable of such things. Michael pointedly ignores everyone around him and turns to Jessica saying that it's time for them to go to some women's clothing store to buy her something too. The father punishes his son, believing that Michael's neglect is caused by his behavior, and also informs him that if he never earns forgiveness, he will spend the rest of his life on his knees. The bitch's boyfriend notices that the president of the company made a mistake about something, to which he slaps the slanderer in the face and says that he and his father no longer work there. Maria Dahlberg notices that they crossed the path of the wrong person, and her boyfriend is crying because he has nothing more, and now he is the rogue here. Now, Jessica and Michael leave the store with a bag of clothes. The girl happily reports that the guy couldn't pay the rent, but allows himself to buy clothes for her. Mrs. Nightingale is very touched by Johnson's behavior, and he knows that she took pity on him, buying only goods at a discount. Although everyone understands that he has millions in his hands, she really is a good girl. Already on the street, the Clark's father Robert catches up with them. He asks the young people to wait for him. With a helpful face, he invites them to take a walk. Behind him are two of his employees with their arms full of boxes with expensive brands. Michael asks what he needs, and the head of the Clark says that he does not need Johnson. But the girl next to him, he says that he has gifts for her and hands over everything that his servants had behind his back. Jessica realizes that these are the things she wanted to buy, but for which she did not have enough money. 
Johnson understands that Robert is not a mistake, and therefore decided to come from the side of a girl who is easier to please. Michael notices his interest in saving his life, and therefore says that he will come to them tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning, giving him one last chance. Robert is very happy that Johnson paid attention to him, and reports that he and his company are always ready to provide him with any help. An unknown mansion, in which Dahlberg tries to prove to Lucy Vox that she saw Michael Jocelyn, who has not changed at all in appearance, but his character has undergone major changes. The girl is very interested in the words spoken by her friend, so she listens very carefully to the detailed story about the guy's adventures. Lucy notes that a young man must have very great status and power for Robert Clark to crucify himself in front of him. And if Michael had survived, he would have been homeless. So this whole situation is simply unthinkable. The girl reflects that five years ago the Johnson family was weaker than the Vox family. So even if he survived, the situation cannot be equal to hers. The couple gets to Jessica's house. She is very interested in how Johnson knows Robert Clark because she could only dream of buying such expensive things. Interrupting her enthusiastic thoughts, the girl remembers work and wonders if Michael will meet with the president of her company. Jessica teases the main character, but he calmly parries her attack and sits down to watch TV. It is reported on television that two male bodies were found in the same mansion. The report said that the dead were Raphael Burke and his stern father. The police confirmed that it was a brutal and premeditated murder. Jessica, Horrified says that, of course, she would like to take revenge on them, but obviously not in such a harsh way. Michael reports that bad people tend to make enemies for themselves, and therefore this is a common occurrence, and also indifferently says that this is his doing. Mrs. Nightingale does not believe that her friend could do this, because being able to fight well is not the same as being able to kill. She rejects the guy's words changes the subject and goes in a cheerful mood to try on new things that she has just purchased. Michael goes for a walk through the quiet city at night, talks about the medications he has purchased, and realizes that now he has everything he needs to train his skills. During his thoughts, he meets Captain Jenkins, who is already familiar to him, and she is glad that they have finally met again. The hero remembers who it is and says that he is busy now and is trying to leave. The officer, as if to the point, asks if the guy has heard about what happened to the Burke family, even if she doesn't believe that it could be him. But the Johnson family has gone into oblivion. Michael interrupts her by grabbing her by the neck, sparkling with his power, and asking what she is hinting at. A frightened Jenkins realizes that despite her martial arts training, she can handle the guy, and also says that there are still some things they need to discuss, but she wanted to do it over dinner. He refuses and leaves, saying that he has other plans for this time and the girl is trying to catch her breath after the capture. She argues that the guy has achieved perfection in ancient martial arts, but even in five years it is impossible to achieve such a result. What happened to him during this time? Michael is standing in the kitchen of Jessica's apartment, chopping ingredients for something. He plans to use Nightingale's microwave while she sleeps to practice alchemy. Something goes wrong, and the guy realizes that the ingredients the doctor gave him have already gone bad. But at the same time, he still manages to create at least five red spheres, although he should have gotten much more, but this should be enough. In the morning, Jessica wakes up from some noise and goes sleepy into the living room, yawning heavily. In the hallway, she discovers Michael, who is intensively getting ready for something. He says that he is going for an examination, and if necessary, he will gladly accept her call. She says that she would not call him a doctor, because he talks some kind of nonsense all day long and argues that he knew the recipe, and therefore can be able to heal, then she remembers the incident that happened with the Johnson family. She does not understand why trouble befell such a good family. Each member was as kind as possible. Was Anna is standing somewhere in the middle of the city, and seems to be actively waiting for someone. Some guys are thinking about who such a beauty might be waiting for, a friend or a boyfriend. One of them says that a rich girl can't wait for a guy like that, she can only drive around in an expensive car with a security guard. The second agrees that there is something in this meaning. A third appears and says that she is clearly not waiting for one of them, but they are intrigued by his words. Michael says that he doesn't understand women, but this girl is clearly waiting for him and not anyone else. The guys begin to mock Johnson, since a beauty with such a luxurious car cannot wait for a freak like him. But at that moment Anna notices him and calls the main character. Anna runs up to Michael and is genuinely happy to see him, 
leaving the other two guys confused. She brings the hero to her home in a luxurious living room, where Robert Clark and his wife are already waiting for them. Michael hands over five already blackened balls, and the patient wonders if this can really be eaten and asks if there is any alternative, such as acupuncture or a decoction. The hero says that you need to eat all five of them at once. Robert obeys and throws them into his mouth. The father of the family immediately flares up with magical energy, shocking those around him. Robert feels full of strength and energy under the influence of a large number of medicinal herbs. The completely revived head of the family almost flies into the sky with joy. His relatives think that he fed him stimulants. Robert says that he will be grateful to Dr. Johnson all his life, giving him $100 million for his help. Michael says that this is just a deal and there is no need to exalt him too high. The restless father of the family reports that he has an empty property and gives the key card to Michael for use, and also hopes that the doctor will have time to have dinner together. Michael thinks that he can store his medicine in the empty apartment, and Clark himself can be useful to him because he understands business, and therefore he can help with the company taken away from the Johnsons. The hero happily accepts the key card and makes an appointment for dinner tomorrow evening, and Robert agrees. The young god of medicine says goodbye and silently leaves the Clark house to go about his business. Michael stands next to a huge pile of medicines that the eldest of a dynasty of doctors has prepared for him. The recipient is satisfied with the quality of resources for his work, and thinks that these doctors are successfully maintaining the bar. The seller sets the price at five million, because he remembers that Johnson will not accept the goods for free. But Michael understands that the price of the goods is at least twice as much. The main character wonders where his granddaughter went, and having received the answer that she went to the mountains with the master, Michael gives the old man an incomprehensible piece of paper for his granddaughter and tells him to give it to the master if she doesn't understand what it is for. Michael asks where alchemical supplies can be purchased in New York, and the old man wonders how this young gentleman even knows about alchemy. The pharmacist notices that the alchemists disappeared thousands of years ago. There are only a couple of pills left on the market, but they are priceless. It used to be that a family with an alchemist could become one of the leading families in just three years. The old man is shocked by Johnson's capabilities, but he jokes that he doesn't understand anything about alchemy, he just likes the aesthetic appearance of alchemical furnaces. Having received the answer that the stove will be available at auction in five days, Michael asks to contact him and leaves. Then Lilia Sanders unexpectedly returns with her master and shouts to her grandfather that they have returned. First, the grandfather asks whether his granddaughter behaved well, and then he talks about how Michael Johnson was here again, and she offended him last time, and this time she ran away. The girl insists that his master is cooler, and the teacher himself tells the girl not to say anything stupid, because her grandfather does not say meaningless speeches. Jacob reports that Johnson left something for her and hands over the piece of paper. The granddaughter, of course, cannot understand what is written there. She throws away the paper saying that everything is written there in terrible handwriting. The note ends up with the master, and he wonders if her grandfather mixed up something and whether it's really for Lilia. The master determines that this note is from a real professional, and very nervously asks Jacob to meet this young man. The teacher says that even in his youth he trained and his strength was of astronomical proportions. After a long time he noticed that something even touched his internal organs. The girl says that this explains the discomfort she feels after training. The master reassures the girl that there is nothing wrong with this, because he is watching her so that nothing happens. He says that if he continues to train himself, he will die, but Johnson wrote on this piece of paper a salvation that will help him become even stronger. The girl thinks that even if the master calls this guy a noble man, she doesn't understand who he really should be. Michael stands near a huge villa and realizes that this is exactly what Robert Clark has prepared for him and not some luxury room that he was counting on. The guy didn't think it would be so big. He is simply delighted with the apartment provided to him and praises the furniture, and notices that he likes Robert more and more. The guy thinks that it's somehow lonely here for one person, and therefore he's going to invite Jessica here too. At the same time, Jessica calls Johnson to say that she needs to return home to her parents for a while, so they will not meet in the evening, and Michael is a little worried about her. The hero argues that his house used to be smaller, but it always had a harmonious and lively atmosphere. Michael remembers that tomorrow is the anniversary of his parents' death. He promises to avenge them. 
he has already managed to get out of the whirlpool, which means revenge is just around the corner. Michael hears the doorbell ring and goes out to take the large quantities of medications brought to him, noting that he can easily fit all his purchases in this building. The elder Sanders personally calls him, along with his granddaughter and the master, informing him that they are ready to help him at any time, if anything else is needed. Here Michael draws attention to the ancient warrior who came with them, and he greets him and slightly swears. Michael politely invites them to his new mansion, wondering who this great warrior is. He falls to his knees and introduces himself as Jason Reynolds and thanks him for saving his life. Lilia is shocked that her master fell on his face in front of the guy. The master calls him a benefactor and a great master, to which Johnson wonders why they call him that and scratches his head. Reynolds is very surprised, thinking that he is even stronger than the great master, since this is the basic knowledge that everyone has. Michael pretends that he is a beginner and does not understand the classification of martial arts ranks that is accepted here. The master is glad that he can teach such a warrior something and enthusiastically says that there are four levels, external force, internal force, master of half transformation and master of transformation. And Jason tells Michael that he is at the highest level and belongs to the class of transformation masters, and countless martial artists look up to him. The idea pops up in the head of the main character that his strength is an order of magnitude higher than those classifications that are accepted in New York, which goes without saying. Remembering the correct classification, Michael understands that he is approximately on the same level with the strongest current masters in America, although he is still very far from the true peak. Johnson believes that he underestimated the masters, and therefore asks Reynolds about how many of them there are and discusses whether there might be someone stronger than him nearby. Jason reveals that he does not know the exact number, but he knows that most of them are somehow connected to the Hodges family, and also says that despite the current era of technology and progress, those who truly control their rights know about martial arts. No. Jacob says there are four main families in New York and the fourth of them is the Burke family. It's a pity that they were recently killed, but their old man is a master who secretly practiced the arts. Michael recalls that just before his death, Raphael's father threatened him with violence from the eldest in the family, calling him a strong master. Among the rest of the families, Lucy Vox made the most impression. If not for her humiliation, he would not have received the brand of a worthless person. He declares to himself that he will soon deal with her, showing who the real non-entity is here. Reynolds, from the outside, senses a strong aura of hatred surrounding Johnson, and wonders how much blood Michael has on his hands at such and such an age. The main character walks through the evening city, cheerful crowds of people milling around, busy with their evening rest, and he talks about the fact that Jessica does not answer his calls and is afraid that something has happened to her. Michael's stomach insists that they need to find some place to eat. He walks into his old friend's diner, remembering the past that united them and how the food was always very tasty there, and even when he was deeply depressed, his friend was always there. But it turns out that there is no one in the stall but Michael still decides to order something. Michael asks to bring him a branded kebab and a bottle of something, but is refused, since the owner is already closing the stall and recommends that he eat elsewhere. A woman familiar to Michael says that tomorrow they are moving to a new place, where he can visit them. The hero is sincerely surprised that they are changing place after so much time and is wary at the sight of an abrasion on the face of a friend. A man appears out of nowhere and brings the order to the young man, saying that there is no need to drive away the guests. The guy also recognizes his face and is even more worried, since he was also beaten, and they have always been friendly, there can be no violence in their family. The hero salivates at the sight of the delicious kebab, which he associates with childhood. Michael is enjoying the dish when a chair flies past him, which he successfully smashes with his magical powers, already in a fighting mood. Three big guys burst into the cafe who noticed that the guy is not a failure, but today they need a store, so he can finish eating and leave. The owners of the establishment had clearly already met these guys, fearfully calling the leader Tiger. The Tiger runs into an old acquaintance of Michael, forcing him to pay for security, starting a skirmish. The big man threatens that he knows where the cafe is moving, and therefore threatens to destroy it too if he doesn't have $50,000 tomorrow. The Tiger condescendingly recommends that Michael leave, and the hero sharply replies that it would be better for them to leave. The big man is irritated by such insolence, 
and is about to show Johnson that he cannot be joked with like that. But Michael knocks the wind out of him with one blow. The owners of the establishment are shocked that this guy knocked out the creator of their problems so quickly that they didn't even have time to see, and Michael wonders if everything is fine with them. The tiger comes to his senses and, with a wild scream, attacks the young small business advocate in a sharp counterattack. Michael counters the attack with a sharp uppercut that sends his opponent's head crashing into the ceiling, landing him on the next floor. Tiger's henchmen are shocked by what they saw and don't know what to do now, looking at their boss, who is stuck in the ceiling. The main character, spraying his aura everywhere, clearly explains to the extortionists that he promises to give them a good reception if they show up here again. The gang sits on their knees in front of Michael, begging for mercy, and promising that they will never allow themselves to do this again, and will not dare to disturb the owners of this establishment, and then they run away, released by the young guy. Johnson examines the mess in the cafe that was left after their fight and thinks that it would be good to force the villains to clean up here before letting them go. The owners ask the guy if he is Michael by chance, to which he joyfully remarks that they forgot him. Everyone is glad that they met an old friend. The owners of the establishment notice that Johnson has always been different from the other visitors, so they could not forget him. Michael returns to Jessica's apartment late in the evening and asks if she is home. The hero finds the girl and asks why she didn't answer his calls. Then she turns to face Johnson and it turns out that it is not Jessica at all, but Sarah Walsh herself. Michael doesn't quite understand what this girl forgot at his friend's house, but she comes up with an excuse, to which she asks why he lives here, he says that Jessica sheltered him for a while. Michael notices that Sarah looks great and doesn't need anyone's help at all, although the master sent him to her. They begin to talk and during a two-way interrogation they realize that neither of them can contact Jessica. Then Michael fears that she has become a target for his enemies. Young Johnson abruptly takes off in search of his girlfriend, and Mrs. Walsh is shocked that after everything he takes her and leaves her, although he himself had recently been looking. Sarah is not ready to put up with the insolence of a guy who has a recipe that she needs and decides to come up with an approach to it. Michael left, and she wonders what kind of person he is, because there is no information on him in the public domain and comes to the conclusion that it exists, but is protected by higher authorities. Such a guy can be useful for the company, but it will not be easy to control him. The girl cannot come to terms with the loss of such a shot, and therefore decides to achieve it at any cost since this is very important for her company, and he himself was the first to come to her. Michael wanders alone through the night in New York, realizing that the city is too big, and he has no information, and therefore it is not possible to find Jessica alone, he is afraid of being late. The hero decides to resort to the alliance of the person with whom he promised to no longer have anything in common, but realizes that now this is his only way out. John Locke stands in his luxurious office in the middle of a luxurious building that completely belongs to him, and looks at the panorama of the city. His phone rings, he thinks out loud that no more than six people on the entire planet know this number, and therefore this call definitely means something. Michael threatens John not to try to trace the call or find the caller, otherwise he will take away everything he has given him, including his life, and then asks for help finding the director of Apple named Jessica Nightingale who has not been in touch for ten hours. Then he explains that he should have information about this person in the next five minutes and hangs up, leaving the listener in nervous confusion. A man with an interesting tattoo on his arm says that he kept this phone for three years and was looking forward to this call. John tells Michael that Jessica is now in the hospital because she received a call about the critical condition of some patient. She is still there. She needed an urgent operation. The director has already managed to sell a car for 50000 while she was there. Mrs. Nightingale is in a very upset state. She has already connected all her finances and even sold the car, but there is still not enough money for the operation. Jessica's parents say that they have also already collected all their money and even contacted distant relatives with whom they have tense relations and have not communicated for a long time. Jessica's uncle, who obviously has a lot of money, arrived at the hospital and wonders what had to happen for them to start looking for him. Relatives beg to borrow money for the operation, but the uncle reports that his business is going through hard times, and therefore he has no money. The uncle's wife notices that a match needs to be found for the son of an influential man, and Jessica is beautiful and there is no doubt about it. If she gets married, her husband will be promoted. 
The aunt not very politely hints that if Jessica agrees to a marriage contract with the stupid son of a rich man, then they will have money for her brother's treatment. Jessica is shocked. Her uncle's wife says that this is the only solution available to solve their problem. The parents are against selling their daughter. A distant relative puts pressure on the girl, saying that her brother is only 14 years old. Can she really calmly watch him slowly die? You are his sister. But then from the door comes the inquiring cry of Michael, who is interested in who is going to marry off his girlfriend. He wonders why Jessica didn't tell him about her brother's illness. For him, as for her boyfriend, this is too much, and all the relatives are shocked by what is happening. Jessica's greedy distant relatives are trying to destabilize the guy, since they do not benefit from his existence. The girl, to prove that Johnson is her boyfriend, kisses him on the cheek, stunning even him. The uncle insists that not every man can afford to pay for such an expensive operation. Michael, with a smug look, reports that 400000 is mere change. He paid for the operation on the way to the hospital. Johnson understands that he didn't have time to do this, but he's glad that he managed to get here before Jessica agreed to the marriage, even if he was found out. Michael laughingly reports that the money did not go to the hospital but directly to the best doctor in New York, Johnson who will cure the guy in no time. The uncle's wife remarks that for some reason she has never heard of this doctor. The hero thinks this woman should work as a detective, and he confidently replies that, of course, she didn't hear, because this doctor is himself. The uncle dies laughing from such a statement, and his wife says that if he is a doctor, then she is a god. Two doctors enter and ask the patient's relatives to be quiet. One of the doctors turns out to be Robert Clark's attending physician. This doctor immediately rushes to Michael as soon as he notices him, to warmly greet him as a true god of medicine. All the relatives are on the verge of fainting from what they heard from a highly qualified doctor. Michael tries to hide what happened in the Clark house, hinting to the doctor that they saw each other in the hospital, but the doctor does not accept the information received and directly reports where they saw each other before. Jessica's uncle is shocked that such a piece of trash as Johnson can be called a doctor, and also be so widely known. The doctor gets tired of the constant performances of distant relatives, and therefore he calls security, who immediately escorts them out of the premises. The doctor suspects that they may have rabies and suggests placing them in a dispensary to prevent the spread of the infection. Michael, hugging the doctor, says that despite his average skills, his methods are quite cruel, to which the doctor remarks that they dared to disrespect the god of medicine and deserve such punishment. Jessica lightly tugs the guy's sleeve and asks him to help her brother. She and her family will definitely reimburse the cost of the operation. The doctor convinces the relatives that he will undertake the operation, and besides, he will do it completely free of charge as a token of Michael's merits. The guy doesn't stand aside and quickly writes something down on a piece of paper for a doctor he knows. The doctor reads the note and sees that it describes an ancient needle insertion technique that will greatly improve his work. Michael also takes out his card and wants to pay despite the doctor's previous words, but he strenuously refuses, saying that he will sort everything out himself. The relatives themselves are on the verge of ending up on the operating table from the exorbitant surprise they experience from everything that happened before their eyes in the last five minutes. The parents are very surprised that their daughter has a boyfriend, and one who is capable of such actions. Upon leaving the hospital, Jessica's parents send her home to rest saying that from now on they themselves will be able to look after their son. Then the father calls his daughter over and says that he and Michael, while they are not yet married, should not forget about contraception, leaving Jessica very embarrassed. Michael, who heard this, further confuses the already hurt girl, saying that he did not think that her father was so concerned about safety. Jessica, blazing with anger and embarrassment, screams at Michael because he overheard someone else's conversation to which he only notes that he just has keen hearing. Finishing the conversation, Jessica is about to go home by car, but remembers that she pawned it, and therefore will try to return it tomorrow. The guy pretends that he doesn't understand what Jessica is talking about, and says that she left him the keys to her car. The girl rushes into Johnson's arms, warmly thanking him, who clearly did not expect such an outburst of feelings. Already behind the wheel of the car, Mrs. Nightingale wonders why Michael is helping her so much, to which he reports that she may find out about it tomorrow. The girl feels the cold, saying that the air conditioner is broken, but Johnson realizes that, unfortunately, everything is not so simple, he feels the spirit of extermination nearby. 
the guy asks Jessica to follow all his instructions exactly, and he jumps out of the car, informing her that she needs to return home to her apartment and not stop, so that she doesn't hear behind her. Next, the girl needs to hide in Michael's room and call the last contact from his phone and ask him to send the strongest person to her within 30 minutes, and when people come, don't resist. Wait for me. Michael is left alone on the road, watching Jessica's car go around the corner. A black car drives up to him, from which two figures get out. The guy says that it's time to meet the enemy. The man who killed his family five years ago appears before him, declaring that he did not think that anyone from the Johnson family was still alive. Michael asks if the man wants to kill him, and he laughs and says that the guy is real trash and doesn't deserve him to want to kill him and sets his driver on. The villain lunges at Johnson, who stands in the same unchanged position, ignoring the threat. The hero delivers his signature blow, knocking back his defeated opponent, calling him a weakling. The main villain says that it was useless to give such a weakling a chance. The man admires the perfection that Michael has achieved in five years. Today Liam Sparks himself will let him die. The hero notices pointedly that his opponent is talking too much nonsense. The handsome man begins his speech by revealing that he was the one who killed the entire Johnson family five years ago. Liam invites Michael to be his loyal dog, instead of the guy the last Johnson just killed. The main character reports that Sparks takes on too much, relying on his amateurish kung fu. The young hero wonders if his opponent has noticed that his main weakness is illusion, and multiple images of dark spirits appear behind him. Michael flares with the quintessence of all his power and strength, and warns that he will not allow the murderer of his family to die so easily, like his subordinate. The main villain cannot believe that there is such a young master in America. He himself cultivated for forty years, spent countless efforts and wealth, and only barely became a master. Even if he doesn't understand how the guy achieved such a result in such a short time, nevertheless, the gap in their experience is colossal. Liam screams about his intention to blow Michael's head off and, burning with anger, rushes to attack. Young Johnson blocks his opponent's deadly attacks, ignoring his skill and knowledge. Michael notices that Sparks was able to cause minor damage to him in the form of scratches on his arms, albeit more severe than he expected. Liam, spewing blood from his eyes and mouth, is horrified to discover that he broke his fingers during the attack on Johnson. Michael, with a smug smile that even the spirits of darkness behind him would envy. Wonders if this is the gap in experience his opponent was talking about. The main character, blazing with magic and hatred, shouts that today Liam Sparks, the killer of the Johnson family, will pay in blood for his actions, and rushes into the attack. The villain reassuringly notices that Michael decided to attack him in the air and believes that this is his chance to win, thinking that the opponent is still extremely inexperienced. Sparks concentrates all his power in his left hand and performs a critical blow with it, cutting off the legs of the last Johnson. The main villain, with a smug smile, arrogantly asks how Michael plans to fight without legs. But after a moment, with horror in her eyes, she realizes that it was only a transformed illusion, calling on a higher kingdom. Johnson at this moment makes his true blow, filled with the full power of his magic from the back of his doomed opponent. With the blow of the main character, Liam is slammed into the road, breaking off huge pieces of the roadway with his body. Michael is in the night, standing over the site of his enemy's defeat, blazing with magical power. He notices that the opponent is still alive and says that the villain, as befits a master, is stubborn. Sparks, his face crumpled from the blow, whispers that the guy's superiority over him is impossible. Michael lifts Liam Sparks by the hair and invites him to answer one question and then the guy will think about whether to burn his enemy alive. He wonders who told Sparks about Johnson's existence and how many others know this. The enemy wonders whether he will really be released if he tells everything. In a very angry manner, Michael shows that his opponent is in no position to negotiate terms with him and slams his head into the asphalt. Sparks says that he saw photos of the hero on the internet and because he does not like to be in danger, he instructed his people to find and follow him, and arrived to deal with him. The Dragon Lord said that none of the Johnson family should survive in the end. Michael slams his soul into Sparks' back and demands to know the real name of the Dragon Lord. Liam reports that he has not had direct contact with the Dragon Lord, since he is not worthy to even know his name. Johnson wonders why then the Dragon Lord decided to attack his family, whether his father really insulted him. 
The dragon lord only said that he was looking for something, and in the end his search led him to the Johnson family, and Michael remembers the stone that the old man gave him. If the Johnson family has anything worthwhile, it's a cemetery rebirths. They hear some kind of rumble, then the bastard reports that his people have already reached Michael's girlfriend, so he can spend his time killing, but then it's not a fact that Jessica will survive. The hero once again presses the enemy's head into the asphalt, reminding that it is not Sparks who sets the conditions here. Meanwhile, Jessica gets to her house, but feels that someone is following her. She realizes that she needs to get home quickly. Running inside, she remembers that she needs to hide in Johnson's room and call the last number dialed earlier. Locke listens to Jessica's instructions on the phone about calling the strongest person to her as soon as possible. The girl, screaming, asks to be faster, since someone has already broken down the door. A bunch of unknown aggressive people are standing near Jessica's door, listening to the instructions of the main one. While Jessica calls Locke, the enemies make their way up the stairs towards her. The man quickly ends the conversation. The girl does not understand why she hung up and thinks that she called the police. John loses his temper, not understanding what kind of bastard wants to harm his master. He orders his two best people to immediately go to Jessica to protect her, and if something happens to her, they will be personally responsible to him, and also asks him to prepare a helicopter. He is flying to New York today. His people report that there will be an important meeting tomorrow, and he cannot cancel everything like that, to which Locke snaps to tell everyone gathered that he will not come. Meanwhile, Liam's men break into Jessica's apartment and actively search for her. Jessica, panicked that they are so close, notices that something is wrong with the door to Johnson's room. It seems to be glowing. One of the thugs says that he will kill the girl quickly if she comes out to them on her own. But the second one says not to listen to the first one and shouts that he will slowly torture her. The chief reports that today they must do without the murder, since there has been no contact with Mr. Sparks for some time and the plan could change. However, he also means that he doesn't forbid playing with it for a while, leaving his colleagues delighted. One of them hits the door with all his might, but it does not give in under this inhuman pressure, and the striker is shocked that the door remains intact after his attack. The one who hit the door lights up with a blue flame, and fiery spirits gather around his head, filling him with flame from the inside. The burn thug falls to the floor with hellish screams and stops moving. His accomplices do not believe that he is dead. The smartest one notices that this door cannot be dealt with by brute force. This time Mr. Sparks came across someone who is not so easy to kill. One of them offers to open the lock of this door, taking out from his pocket the tools necessary for breaking. Jessica sits on Michael's bed in horror and realizes from the sounds that someone seems to have died behind her door. She sees how the door begins to slowly open, and from behind it a hand and a mask appear. The man wearing it frighteningly says that he has come. Jessica is horrified to hear compliments on her beauty from these thugs. She does not understand at all what they are going to do to her. Three strange figures in costumes and masks stand in front of her. One of them says that she lost her brother trying to catch her, and therefore the girl will have to compensate for this. The same figure reaches out to Jessica, and she, blue with horror, prays for Michael to save her. Out of nowhere, a throwing knife flies by and pierces the offender's head right through, leaving him no chance of survival. The figure of Locke's assistant appears in the window, who was supposed to come to Jessica's aid. The thugs are very angry because of the loss of another brother, and even the blow was dealt on the sly. A second bodyguard appears from behind and plunges a knife into the skull of another masked man. The main thug, left alone and hearing that the bodyguards have arrived on Locke's orders, realizes that he has no chance of life. He tries to surrender, but is too late, because one of the guards has already prepared a fatal blow for him. The bodyguards bow to Jessica, saying that they are Mr. Johnson's men, and Jessica does not believe that she is saved. Michael drags his enemy to the cemetery, carelessly dragging him along the ground by the collar. He throws the body near the grave of his parents, and he turns to them, saying that he came to see them on the anniversary of their death. Michael kicks Liam's mangled body and demands to kneel in front of his parents. Sparks mutters that he is the master of an entire generation. It is impossible for him to kneel in front of ordinary people and ask to kill him. Johnson again grabs him by the hair and hits him against the tiles six times in a row to convey to the cripple the seriousness of the guy's intentions. And then he decides to make a sacrifice to his parents, dealing with Sparks. 
He swears that everyone who was associated with the tragedy in their villa will be personally sent to hell to atone for their sins. In the morning, Jessica appears at the cemetery with flowers. The sun is shining around her. She talks about what a busy day it was yesterday, and what a mysterious person Michael is. At first she mistook him for a charlatan who looked like a former deceased classmate. She would never have thought that it could be him. The stream of thoughts is interrupted by the fact that she discovers Michael at the grave, drunk, at the very grave where that classmate and his family are buried. Jessica realizes that he was her old acquaintance all this time. She understands that she should have guessed earlier. Now, the girl understands the origins of the reasons why the guy protected her and tried to solve her problems. She considers herself stupid for not noticing this earlier. She cannot imagine what he had to go through and hugs him tightly. Jessica sympathizes with Johnson, understands how much pain he was in and says that now he won't have to go through all this alone. She turns to the grave of his parents and says that she did not believe that Michael would return. But now, she will look after him and will not allow him to do anything stupid, even though he has already grown into a good, worthy man. The guy wonders where Jessica came from here, because he's still drinking, to which she exclaims that it's time for him to stop, he needs to go home. Jessica takes a drunk Michael home to shower and go to bed. The embarrassed guy realizes that Jessica is not his wife to take care of him so much, and she replies that until he finds a wife, she will perform duties for her. Michael thinks that maybe this is exactly what his parents would like to see instead of revenge for them. Three hours after the couple leaves, Lucy Vox appears at the cemetery and discovers the sacrifice Liam sparks at the grave of the Johnson family, and does not understand who could have done this. She puts the death of the Burke family and this murder in her head and realizes that they are somehow connected. She wants to immediately check all the cameras near the cemetery to find out who did it. Jessica and Michael sleep peacefully in bed in the apartment, but are awakened by a knock on the door. A sleepy Jessica wonders who is knocking on the door. Michael argues that he doesn't often drink too much, and then notices that the girl somehow ended up in his bed. He ironically asks if she really desires him to which Jessica sharply and angrily replies that she doesn't need him. They have a nice fight, and the girl says that he is a bad guy who got drunk and slept with her in his arms, so she only thinks about how to get rid of him. Their argument continues. Michael notes that Jessica is his temporary wife, and therefore should hug him, and the girl says that it is not normal for him to be so drunk and reek of fumes. Jessica asks Johnson to open the door since she can't do it like this. Michael heads towards the door. Anna Clark appears at the threshold. The hero is very surprised by her arrival. She reports that Michael promised to come to her father for dinner, but he did not answer his calls, so she decided to come to him. The girl notices the guy's athletic physique, which she had not noticed before, and Michael makes an appointment at 7 o'clock in the evening at a certain place. The Clark family realizes that they do not know where Mr. Johnson's name is located, but their driver sarcastically remarks that he knows where it is. Robert talks about the high cost of the restaurant they are going to, and the driver says that this is just a street with eateries and shops where the price of a dish does not exceed a couple of dollars. Father and daughter are confused by this news. The owners of the diner do not understand what kind of car drove up to them, but they know very well that it is terribly expensive. They do not understand how a person with such a car could come to their restaurant. Michael and the girl appear behind them and joyfully announce that it was he who called them and it's time for the owners to set the table. Mr. Clark, stepping out of the car, immediately understands why Johnson chose this place, but his driver and daughter do not share his enthusiasm. Everyone sits down at a simple but extensive table with a bunch of tasty and juicy shish kebab from Michael's childhood. Robert argues that the food here is really delicious, but there are no customers at all. He decided that this needs to be corrected at all costs. Having heard the orders of a rich man to his subordinate, the owners of the cafe are perplexed about how powerful this man is, and the reason he is here is Michael. Johnson thanks Clark for helping the establishment and takes a direct interest in the Tazen Group, which was previously owned by his family. The businessman says that after the incident five years ago, the future of the company became very unclear and wonders why Michael needed information about this company. Suddenly it dawns on him and he realizes that Michael Johnson is the same heir to the company who supposedly died that day along with his parents, but he learned medicine and returned. Michael understands that his interlocutor has already guessed everything, 
but still says that he wants to revive the company and asks Robert what he knows. Then Clark says that now the main share belongs to Dick Lawrence. Michael understands that he will never forget this name, because it was a friend of his parents, an uncle whom he always trusted. But it was he who gave his father the invitations to that damned party when his parents were dead. He smiled to please the man from Washington. Jessica, seeing Michael flare up, tries to calm him down by placing her hand on his shoulder, to which he replies that she doesn't need to worry and he's fine. Clark wonders if he understands Johnson correctly, that he wants to unite and return the Tazen group to its former greatness. Anna notices that her father is shaking, she believes it is from nerves, but soon realizes that it is from his determination to team up with Michael Johnson. Michael asks if Robert is afraid for his family, to which he replies that businessmen always strive for money, and if he can count on 10% of the profit, then he is in business. Jessica notices that Clark has changed his usual strategy in order to continue collaborating with Johnson. Michael decides to agree to the businessman's proposal, since he seems sincere, and in return says that he will always help his family. The couple walks through town happy, discussing how Michael's father would be happy if he could bring the company back. The hero understands the surveillance, but understands that these are the people of John Locke, who sent them for protection. On the way home, Jessica suggests dinner, to which Michael replies that he is not hungry. Michael is going to thank Locke for saving his girlfriend. Johnson makes an appointment with his agent, preparing to meet him at 8 in the evening at the Imperial Club, where they will not be disturbed. Michael wonders who this John Locke is, because he invited him to the coolest club in New York, you can't even get into it for money, and it belongs to John himself. Lucy Vox, in company with an unknown man, head to the Imperial Club, discussing the death of Liam Sparks. She proves to her father that it was not an accident, since at the last moment someone erased all the evidence. The club is full of various martial arts masters. Today there are many more of them. Even strong ones have appeared. They talk about an old man who is a local administrator. It is because of his strength that the club has nothing to do with politics. Lucy wonders why a club with such power has not crushed all the families in New York. Her father explains that the reason lies in the man behind that powerful master, his name is John Locke and he is the governor of the entire region. Lucy understands what powerful power this man has, and her father asks her not to think about the governor, since the difference between them is too great. The daughter and father split up to unwind before an important meeting. She can't get Sparks' sacrifice to the Johnson family out of her head even though they should all be dead. She wonders if any of them could have survived and notices Michael. The girl thinks that Johnson could not have been here since he would have been a beggar if he had survived. But no one would mind if she personally verified her theory. Lucy greets Michael nicely, but then says that she misspoke and mistook him for an old acquaintance. She notices that since the guy ended up in this club, he can't help but know her, and therefore hands over her business card and tells him to contact her if he needs help. Michael, in a rage, knocks the card out of the girl's hands and asks if he heard correctly about the Vox family. The girl is confused by the guy's impudence and he is even more persistently trying to drive her away. The girl does not tolerate such an attitude towards her family, and is going to slap the impudent man in the face. Then an administrator appears who demands that this stop immediately. Lucy tries to start a conversation with the great master, advertising her origins, but he brushes her off and shouts at her to get lost, because he doesn't care about her and her family, and if she doesn't get out now, then she won't set foot in the Imperial Court Again Club. The girl, terribly offended, quietly leaves because she doesn't want big trouble. The master begins a conversation with Michael, noticing that Locke still has not arrived for the meeting, although the time has already come, and suggests that something might have happened along the way, but the governor will be here soon. The administrator wonders why this guy can be so disrespectful to the governor himself, who he should be. Here John Locke appears in person along with his bodyguard. The master bows to the governor and his power greeting him in every possible way, noting that he is still as strong as a year ago. Michael annoyedly reports that Locke was a full two minutes late from the appointed time, he made him wait so long. The governor kneels before Johnson and asks him not to be so angry. The entire governor's retinue is shocked that their ruler is kneeling before some nameless guy. Locke calls Michael the Lord and says that it was not easy for him anyway and behind him his subordinates understand that this guy is the same legendary lord that the governor has been talking about for a long time. John Locke, the governor, 
controls all the powerful underground power of New York. But initially he was just a dummy. Locke himself repeatedly emphasized that the real master is the ruler, not him. Locke's subordinates, who only now realized who was in front of them, kneel before Michael, calling the guy a great lord. The main character orders John to kick out his people so that they are left alone. The governor sends them out the door, specifying that no one should interfere with the negotiations. And if someone appears, they must kill the person who came. John tells the Lord that now they are alone and no one will hear or disturb them, to which Michael asks why he received such a nickname. Locke recalls an incident in Devil's Valley several years ago when Johnson saved his life. Then John and his brothers were surrounded by martial artists and would undoubtedly have died if Michael had not come to their aid. At first, Johnson didn't care about these people, but when he found out that they were from the same area of New York as him, the hero simply could not pass by. He used the talisman given to his teachers to destroy those masters. Governor Locke says that after that incident he cannot help but respect and appreciate Michael, and the reason for which he calls Johnson Lord is because of the order. Michael doesn't understand what the order has to do with it, but after John shows it, he is very surprised. The boy, depicted against the backdrop of a huge dragon, is very similar to the god of medicine himself. Johnson asks Locke if he knows who made this boy like him, to which the governor replies that the order is already a hundred years old and was made long before Michael saved his life. A fake is impossible. Michael incredulously asks where Locke got his name from, trying to catch him in a lie. John swears that this thing is an heirloom of his family, which he inherited from his grandfather, who literally gave the concept of the very word feng shui. When it was predicted that his family would disappear in a hundred years, he used a secret technique to break through the heavens, there he I learned that I need to find a lord with the magic of the purple dragon. He then spent twenty years of his life on this order, in the hope that his fate would change forever, and his last words were that Locke would meet the lord engraved on the order in a hundred years and his last name would be Johnson, so John will not miss this opportunity, because he is guilty of the extermination of his clan. The young hero believes that Locke somehow greatly exaggerates his importance, and then remembers that the master said that Michael's fate is special, that it is the fate of a ruler with the magic of a purple dragon, that's why he saves Sarah Walsh's life here. So how such a ruler is able to break the path to heaven and change the fate of others. Change. The governor reports that he knows about the incident with the Johnson family five years ago. Over the past couple of years he has developed his strength. But if he is given a little more time, he will definitely help the ruler in defeating his enemies. To which Michael sharply replies that his family does not need others to avenge it. And if Locke interferes, he will never be on his side. John understands that the god of medicine is already too powerful, and that his help is clearly of no use to him. Michael reveals that he is willing to become a ruler for the governor if he is willing to fulfill three conditions. Firstly, Locke must not interfere in the life of young Johnson without his order. Secondly, he must help find a person to protect Jessica. And thirdly, John must help find out the whereabouts of the man from the capital. The governor agrees to the terms. Michael tries to leave saying he will contact Locke when he is needed. John stops the hero, warning him that information about him has already been leaked several times, first by the Vox family, then by the Walsh family, and the National Security Bureau and the Dragon Spirit Squad were also interested in him. Michael argues that the first two families could well be interested in him, but the Bureau and the detachment are already worrying the main character. Locke reassures Johnson, saying that he will find a person who will take responsibility for the three murders arguing that even if something comes to light, without proof, no one will be able to do anything to Michael. Johnson says goodbye to the governor and goes outside, wondering why Lucy Vox was looking for him. Then he unexpectedly meets the girl herself on the street, who demands an apology from him. Michael is not going to answer the girl and begins to talk out loud about how he needs to buy a car so that he doesn't have to walk home so late at night. Lucy is furious at the guy's behavior, she begins to glow with some kind of power and attacks Michael. Michael grabs the girl, who is already in flight, by the hand and throws her back onto the road. Johnson's ex-lover cannot understand how this happened, because she is quite good at martial arts. Michael stands over a very dissatisfied, defeated girl who has broken through the asphalt with her body. Upset, Vox tells the guy that he doesn't dare insult her family like that. No matter who he is, he won't be able to stay in the Imperial Club forever and then she will kill him. 
Michael cannot listen to the voice of this terrible girl and covers her mouth with his hand. He says that a disgusting woman like her belongs in the trash heap. Young Johnson, in a rage, throws the girl head first into the trash, saying that this is the most suitable place for her. Michael, shaking off his hands, turns around and leaves amid the girl's loud insults. A very dissatisfied Lucy, getting out of the trash, says that now this guy will not only die, he will make his death painful. Already standing near Jessica's apartment, Michael begins to think that although Lucy is a terrible girl, she has nothing to do with the death of his family. Of course, if she dared to do something out of line, then Michael would have killed her, even though he doesn't like killing women. At one o'clock in the morning, Johnson enters his girlfriend's apartment, realizes that it is already late, and therefore is not going to bother her. Opening the door to his room, the main character sees a girl in his bed. He understands that she is still scared from recent events. Satisfied, Michael decides not to disturb the girl and just go to bed in the same bed with her. The hero wakes up the next morning and asks his neighbor what time it is. Michael turns to the girl, and drenched in sweat, realizes that he did not spend the night with Jessica. The girl turns out to be Sarah Walsh, who is very embarrassed and asks the guy how he ended up here, to which the guy asks her the same question in return. Then Jessica opens the door to the room, shocked by what she saw, she asks Michael what he is doing here, because he said that he would not come that night. Everyone is very embarrassed, Jessica, burning with shame, asks if there was anything between these young people that night. Michael remembers that he told his girlfriend that he would not come home so that she would not worry and go to bed, and Sarah thinks that if she had not drunk too much yesterday, she would not have found herself in such an awkward situation. Yesterday, Sarah's mother came to see her and said that the situation in their family had changed a lot, and now she needed to return home and marry some person. The girl was very upset, and so she came to her friend, and they drank heavily, and when she got drunk, she immediately fell asleep. She completely forgot that Michael lives with her and is very upset that she slept in the same bed with this womanizer. Now her reputation is tarnished. Johnson tries to turn the situation into a joke, saying that if there was anything between them, he will take full responsibility. Sarah gets very angry and insults the guy, saying that they are from different worlds, and that he cannot understand the horror of the current situation. A distressed Michael leaves his room, and then his phone rings. It turns out to be Robert Clark. He tells the guy that his people dug up information on the Tazen group. In order to return it he needs to get Dick Lawrence's signature and defeat the Black Eel group, which controls the company itself. Michael promises to fulfill all the conditions, to which Clark promises to return the company within three days after that, reasoning that if Johnson can do this, then his capabilities are simply beyond imagination. The main character approaches the headquarters of his father's company, knowing that an interview with Lawrence is currently taking place there. Michael decides that the time has come to express everything to this man, and also remembering the words of John Locke that the building has 33 floors, and the elevator only goes to 29, for the rest you need a special pass. Johnson talks about the last four floors, suggests that on 30 to 31 there are ordinary people, on 32 there are black eels engaged in illegal trade, but on 33 there is Dick himself. The god of medicine discusses how he can get to the top floor and decides to melt the window because it is the safest way. Michael uses his supernatural magical powers and rises to the 32nd floor through the air. The black eels notice something strange. They sense someone approaching and decide to check who it could be. Out of nowhere, young Johnson appears. Everyone is shocked by his presence here. They ask who he is and how he got here, to which Michael with a grin in his eyes, informs them that he is the one they see last in their lives. The leader of the group shouts in rage that this brat has gone crazy, to which the hero kills this upstart with one precise blow. Everyone else is shocked by what they see and cannot believe their eyes. Michael, replaying Locke's words in his head, remembers that this group is engaged in smuggling, selling drugs and weapons, trading and killing people, so these guys better keep their mouths shut. Meanwhile, on the top floor of the building, they hear that something strange is happening downstairs, but Dick calms everyone down and says that his guys are getting rowdy from playing cards. No one needs to worry. Introduce Country's M sets conditions for the head of the company that he must supply military maps of the New York airfield, and as long as he is willing to cooperate with them, he will be an agent. 
Lawrence's people with frightened faces inform their boss that such cooperation could bring them trouble and in general this is treason, to which the owner of the company reassures them, saying that for such fraud they face a maximum of execution, and the weapons and contraband that they are currently smuggling are already enough for several executions. The representative of Country M wants to add one more clause to their agreement. He says that he is ready to provide the company with 10 units of high-precision automatic equipment. The market price of which would be more than 500 million. Dick Lawrence, laughing and throwing out his arms, says that he agrees to cooperate with the country with good intentions, and they enter into an agreement. Here, at the moment of their handshake, the door shatters into pieces. No one understands who dared to break into Lawrence's office. An enraged Michael enters the room and says that if the good people don't intervene in this collaboration, then all of New York will soon become the dogs of Country M, and therefore all these bastards must be killed. Dick suddenly recognizes the younger Johnson in this young man. He cannot believe his eyes, because this trash should have been dead for a long time. The head of the company tries to call his security, to which Michael smugly remarks that his people are sleeping and will never wake up. Lawrence wonders how this is possible because he gathered the best masters, Johnson shuts him up, pressing some kind of envelope in his face and asking him to sign it. The envelope contains an agreement on the unconditional transfer of share capital. Dick is shocked by the guy's impudence. The representative of Country M orders his bodyguard to finish off the young man who disrupted important negotiations. He obeys and begins to shoot at the guy with a machine gun. Michael creates an invisible field, on which all the bullets are simply smeared, not reaching the guy. The main character says that he has seen a lot of firearms, but he doesn't like using them at all. He turned all the bullets in the opposite direction, straight at the bodyguard, blowing off his head. After this, martial artists working for Lawrence rush at the guy, but Michael throws them in different directions with one wave of his hand, saying that they are too far from growing up to his level. Dick panics, sweats profusely and says that at that age it is impossible to become a martial artist and asks who this guy even is. The representative from Country M is very nervous and tries to leave, saying that he does not want to disturb someone else's conversation. Michael rushes at him, screaming, die, and very quickly deals with the man in a white business suit, leaving him and Dick alone in the office. Young Johnson orders the head of the company to sign a document transferring part of the company. Lawrence has no choice but to fulfill the demands of the brutal killer, and he signs the contract begging for his life to be spared. Now Michael is going to kill Dick, and he asks not to act so radically, saying that behind his company there is a stronger group of prismen, which will very cruelly take revenge for Lawrence. Johnson tells him that he will kill this man too, he doesn't care. Dick angrily tells Michael that he is not so invincible to defeat Theo Prisman himself, he is also a master, and if Lawrence dies, he will kill not only the hero himself, but also his whole family. Going into the shadows, the god of medicine states that he has no family. She was killed five years ago in that very villa. Lawrence kneels in front of the guy, realizing the situation he is in, and tries to prove to him that it was a misunderstanding, that his uncle is his father's best friend, and he could not harm his family. Michael cannot stand it, and in a rage, knees Dick right in the nose, saying that he has no right to mention his father and be called an uncle. The head of the company begs to let him go explaining that so many years have passed, it's time to forget everything, to which Johnson, no longer himself, begins to beat Dick, asking why he should let him go if five years ago he did not let his family go and betrayed them. Michael, hating this man, continues to brutally beat him, saying that because of him the guy does not have a normal life, that he wants to be an ordinary person, and because of Lawrence's betrayal, Johnson now lives only with hatred and he will kill until will not take revenge on everyone involved. The main character leaves the Tazen group building, surprised by the thoughtfulness of Locke, who not only sent a janitor to clean up the crime scene, but also gave him a new, clean suit. Then Michael unexpectedly meets police officer Jenkins, who asks what Johnson is doing here, and the guy asks her a question in return. No one is going to answer such a question, and they find themselves in an awkward position, Suddenly there is an explosion behind them in the company building. One of the fragments flies directly onto the head of a young girl, and she understands that she cannot dodge, and this is where she will really die. Michael grabs Jenkins in his arms and jumps with her to the side. The piece lands where the girl stood a second ago. 
The guy asks if she is safe, to which the police captain very sincerely thanks the hero for his salvation and says that she is fine. Johnson looks at the burning building and wonders what kind of cleaning style locks subordinates have, because it was only necessary to erase traces of the murders and not blow up entire floors. Michael notices people wearing the same clothes and with the same tattoo, they look too suspicious. Jenkins tells the guy that these tattoos indicate that these people belong to Prisman's group. She has been investigating their case for the last few days, but there was not enough evidence. The girl quickly says goodbye to Johnson and runs away on business, starting to spy on the group, promising to contact the guy later. Michael is very tired of these obstacles on the way, he decides to quickly deal with them. His hand flashes with a pink flame. Jenkins follows the Prismanians to some building, where they suddenly disappear. She finds a window and looks inside, realizing that there is no connection here and it will be difficult to call for help. The girl doesn't understand where she ended up and decides to at least take a picture of what's happening inside. Then the head of the group, Theo Prisman himself, appears. He accuses his subordinates of the explosion that occurred in the company building. His assistants try to justify themselves. Theo doesn't believe their words, noting that they didn't even notice the surveillance, and draws everyone's attention to the window where Officer Jenkins is standing. She realizes that she is in a difficult situation and decides to simply run, but Theo quickly overtakes the girl in two short jumps. Prisman looks like a huge rock against Jenkins. He holds the girl by the head with just his fingers. Paying attention to her beauty, she tells him that she is a police captain. Her people already know where she is, and Theo would be better off letting her go quickly. The head of the group, in a rage, forcefully throws the girl away, saying that he has been brewing in the criminal world for a long time, that countless bullets were fired at him, and she, a woman, does not dare threaten him. Smug Theo threatens the girl and tells her that today his brothers will have a good time with her. The girl, with a flash of rage in her eyes, tells the leader that her father is from the southwestern military district, and if something happens to her, her father will get them all out of the ground. Prisman, hearing the name of Jenkins' father, is very worried, because this man is really a big shot, he wonders why his daughter came here and became a police officer. The girl realizes that she made a mistake when she decided to follow the group alone, and in general with such success, it would be better for her to commit suicide. Theo decides that it's time to get down to business, and there's no time to stand on ceremony. Then out of nowhere on the roof of the building a silhouette of some guy appears, who says that if a person doesn't want to, there's no need to insist. Prisman invites the guy to introduce himself and explain what he forgot here, because this territory is his, and since he appeared here, he probably wants to die. Michael apologizes with a smug smile and says that he came here for a reason, he came to kill them all. All the gang members begin to laugh very loudly at the impudence of this guy. The leader invites his people to grind him into powder, showing what they are capable of. The Prismanians begin to shoot at Johnson, but he, not noticing the bullets, flies past them, throwing them in different directions with his superpower. Theo's right-hand man believes that Michael performed a weak trick, and that's all he can do. Laughing, he rushes at the guy, but immediately receives a retaliatory blow, from which he dies in a second. Jenkins, looking at all this, is surprised at the guy's movements, which are so lightning fast that she doesn't even notice them, and considers the guy a killing machine. Theo Prisman sees that the guy is strong enough to be considered a worthy opponent for himself, and, satisfied with his perfect body, prepares to attack. He tells the guy that it's not too late to give up, but at that moment he receives a crushing uppercut that sends his huge body flying into the air. An enraged Prisman quickly rises to his feet and again advances on Michael, raising his large fist to kill the guy with it. Before the blow has time to fall on Johnson, he is already delivering his own directly to Theo's steel abs, causing his eyes to fly out of their sockets. The leader of a powerful group realizes that the guy is much stronger than him and offers to negotiate, promising weapons and women. Michael does not want to listen to these empty words and deals the final killing blow to Theo, sending him to the next world. Jenkins, in indescribable shock, looks at this powerful guy who destroyed a great group in a few minutes. Johnson approaches the girl, she asks in a panic what he wants from her. The guy stretches out his hands to her. Jenkins is afraid that he wants to force her to remain silent. The guy spreads her crippled legs, the girl, calling him a pervert, tries to escape, she is upset because she considered him good, 
but he decided to take advantage of the situation. Michael, not even outraged by the girl's behavior, explains to her that the bones in her legs have shifted and many cracks have appeared and, if she does not want to remain disabled, she will have to trust. The girl relaxed and allowed the guy to help her. The god of medicine directs his power into the girl's body. She feels good. Energy spreads throughout her body. A very pleased girl thanks the guy and says that if he decides to become a doctor, then great success awaits him. But he replies that he doesn't want to and suggests Jenkins collect phones from all members of the group. They have evidence of any kind. Michael himself intends to leave. And when the girl asks where he is going, he replies that he has not finished all his work yet. The police arrive and discover the entire group, including Theo Prisman, whose face shows that he saw something terrible before his death. Jenkins, already changed, calls her brother and tells in detail what she witnessed. The older brother immediately goes to New York to help his sister and asks her not to get close to this guy under any circumstances. Michael walks through the sunny city and remembers the previous night, reasoning that killing a person is easy as long as it does not involve the blood feud that he seeks. Then he notices Sarah Walsh in the cafe window, drinking tea, arguing that life for the rich is pretty good. Johnson decides not to notice the girl and passes by, but Sarah herself accidentally sees the guy and runs out into the street after him, asking him to stop and wondering where he is in such a hurry. Michael pretends that he was just passing by and didn't even see Mrs. Walsh, but since they met by chance, she can treat him to a cup of coffee. The young people again begin to discuss the situation that happened at night when they ended up in the same bed. Then Megan Walsh, Sarah's mother, comes out of the cafe and asks her daughter who the guy next to her is. Sarah, alarmed by her mother's question, pretends that Michael is her boyfriend. He is very shy and therefore embarrassed to talk. The mother is outraged by her daughter's behavior. She reminds her that if that man finds out that Sarah is having an affair with someone else, the entire Walsh family will be in danger and therefore she is taking her daughter home today, where she will never leave again. The youngest Walsh, in a panic, tries to convince her mother that she is a person, and not just property, to which Megan sharply replies that the daughter has no right to disobey her father. Michael intervenes in a mother-daughter argument, grabs Sapa's hand and pulls her aside, telling her mother that she is already pregnant with his child and he is ready to take full responsibility. The girl, not understanding what is happening, quietly asks the guy what he dared to do to her that night. Michael asks her to play along for his mother. Sarah, with an embarrassed face, ostentatiously strokes her belly and says that she just felt a kick. Michael thought that the girl had overplayed her hand, but he needed to hold his ground and get her out of here, even though she didn't ask for help. Moreover, when Sarah almost agreed to return home, a bloody mark appeared on her forehead, given that Johnson, at the request of the old man, must protect her, then this mark definitely means something. An incredulous woman asks her daughter if this guy is telling the truth. Sarah understands that this is her chance for salvation and tells her mother that if that man found out that she lost her virginity with another, he would definitely give up. Megan rushes at her daughter in a rage, offended by her behavior, and orders her to immediately return home, where she will have an abortion, and she will never leave the house again. Michael stands up for the girl, grabs the woman's hand and asks her not to treat Sarah like that, to which Megan shouts at the guy so that he doesn't dare interfere in the affairs of their family. The offended Johnson promises to return to this miss in six months and show who really deserves respect here, and is now trying to take Sarah away from her rude mother. A disgruntled mother calls someone on the phone and asks for more information and investigations about a man named Michael Johnson from New York. Left alone with the guy, Sarah tries to apologize for her mother's behavior explaining that she is not such a bad person, although she has different values in life. Mrs. Walsh, looking at her savior, notices that he is even a little handsome, and Michael at that moment thinks about the words of the old man who asked to protect this girl. Then Johnson stops a taxi, quickly says goodbye and leaves, leaving Sarah completely bewildered by the guy's behavior. Michael rides in a taxi and reasons that he needs his own power and might. He already has the support of Locke. But he is more suitable for dark affairs, not for legal ones. Johnson asks the driver to take him to Robert Clark's address. Half an hour later, the guy is sitting in Clark's living room, who is wondering why such a great man paid him a visit. Michael hands Robert an envelope signed by Dick Lawrence and says that he has fulfilled all the conditions. Silent questions arise between the interlocutors, 
so Johnson also decides to mention that he has dealt with Prisman's group, and now further actions depend on Robert. Encouraged, Clark reports that now in three days he will resolve all the problems and the Tazen group will be revived. Michael is also interested in information about the Walsh family, to which Robert responds that this family is very powerful, the assets of their company are terrifying and far from comparable to the current situation of the Tazen group, he suspects that this young man is going to crush this family under himself. Johnson turns it into a joke, saying that he was just asking what was what, but Clark understands the guy's true intentions. Michael asks Robert an important question. Will he dare to go against all of America if the guy gives him a sword? Clark wonders if the sword is the Tazen group, mentioning that his company is much more powerful. Johnson begins to explain that he can give Robert a force similar to the Prisman group, but only more powerful, as well as many extremely profitable products, and wonders if Clark will then be able to elevate the Tazen group over the Walsh family in six months. Robert intends to help Michael, but for this it will not be enough what the guy can give, he also needs powerful public support. The old man is afraid that he will not have enough time, because he is not so young anymore. Johnson reassures the old man that he himself can solve the issue with society and his age. He hands the old man a magic pill, saying that it can extend life by 50 years. Taking the magic pill from his friend's hands, Clark happily agrees with the medicine god's cause. Michael casually bids Robert farewell, saying that he's expecting company in three days, leaving Clark with his thoughts about how radically his life has changed and what he can achieve by following this guy. It's late at night when young Johnson returns to Jessica's apartment. Walking into the room, he sees Mrs. Nightingale and Mrs. Walsh, who are very surprised by his arrival. Michael, turning to Sarah, wonders what she forgot here. Has she really decided to push Jessica and himself out of their apartment? To which the owner of the apartment is shocked that he already considers this apartment to be their common one. Unhappy Mrs. Walsh explains that her Apple company has now been taken over by her family. Her bank card has been frozen, and now she is left with nothing and nowhere else to go. Michael asks where she is going to sleep, warning that he will not share a bed with her. Jessica interrupts the guy, saying that Sarah can sleep with her. Johnson sarcastically asks Sarah if she's really going to sit on Jessica's neck. Walsh complains that she's not going to live like that, she just doesn't have a job yet, and Nightingale thinks to herself that it's Michael who's sitting on her neck. Mrs. Walsh casually asks the guy if maybe he would like to give her a job, to which the guy says that maybe he will, and she is shocked. Michael offers Sarah a place in his company. Recalling her great experience, she promises to do everything possible to make his company flourish. However, the girl, realizing all the responsibility, warns the guy that if he hires her, then her family will definitely want to suppress the company. Michael is not afraid of her words, and he says that he will take her. A very happy girl immediately swoops down on the guy, demanding to tell him everything about his company, what the policy is and what type of industry. Johnson replies that the company has not yet been formed, but everything will be ready in the near future. The disappointed girl does not understand how she could trust this guy. Sarah remembers that he also promised her mother that he would rise in six months, and concludes that this boy knows too little about life. All the main figures in America are in the shadows. Meanwhile, her mother Megan ordered her people to find out if her daughter's pregnancy was possible, to which she had already received an answer that Sarah was not pregnant, but some time ago she actually ended up in the house where Michael lives, so there is still a small chance of pregnancy. Megan is furious and says that if this guy really slept with her daughter then he should die. She orders her assistant to quickly tell everything about the origin of this impudent man and learns that there is no such information. He seems to have appeared out of thin air, but he is probably the same boy who survived the tragedy in the villa five years ago. Megan recalls that this tragedy shocked all of New York at the time. In the end, the Johnson family really offended big people in the capital. Now Sarah's mother understands why the guy became close to her daughter. She assumes that he wants to infiltrate their family and use their power to avenge the death of their parents. But if this is the case, then he shouldn't have made a bet with her. Although perhaps this is even a plus for the Megan family, she is interested in what this guy will do, so she will wait. Michael is sad, standing on the balcony of Jessica's apartment, there are now too many people in the house, and therefore, more trouble. The guy can't even go to the shower or toilet, there's always someone there, shouting at him that he's a pervert, 
even though he just thought the room was free. Johnson decides that it would be better to think about business. Now he has enough strength, given the support of Locke and Clark, plus his recipes, he just needs to achieve public opinion. Then the guy feels that someone is watching him. He decides to play cat and mouse with this person and pretends to go back to the apartment. The mouse turns out to be the older brother Jenkins. He is watching Michael from the roof of a neighboring house. But so far he has not noticed anything unusual. This guy behaves like a normal person. At one point, the elder Jenkins notices that the guy has disappeared. He looks around in panic and manages to notice Johnson's body flying towards him. The guy strikes the follower, but he dodges, not wanting to directly meet Michael's power. The younger Johnson, being a little in shock, decides to strike again, but also misses the target and only destroys the roof of the building. Michael shouts that his opponent cannot win, and he is already behind him, hoping to strike. The main character repels the attack without any problems. Without even using his limbs, he simply covers himself with a shield using his strength. The opponent, with horror in his eyes, realizes that the information was incorrect, and Johnson is not just a martial artist, he is a real cultivator. There is a silent pause, during which the elder brother Jenkins thinks about what he should do in this situation, and about Johnson's strength. Because people like him can easily suppress many ancient warriors, because such people improve not in martial arts, but in immortality. But a cultivator does not have to be stronger than an ancient warrior. At least the strongest martial artist can, in theory, defeat a cultivator. The main character suddenly appears behind him and delivers a crushing blow to the enemy's torso with his foot. After a missed attack, the guy goes into free flight, which is interrupted by the nearest wall that is on the road. Now many cracks appear on it from a strong collision. The defeated man, in severe panic, shouts that he just wanted to talk, but how will he do it if Michael is so eager to kill him? Young Johnson wonders who could have sent him a spy, the Walsh family or anyone else, to which the supposed enemy replies that there is no conflict between them, and then hands his documents to the winner. Michael makes sure that it is indeed not one of his enemies, but the captain of the special forces of the Dragon Soul, Leslie Clinton, who confirms this in every possible way and asks to let him go. But Johnson has not heard of any such captain, and therefore incredulously asks how long he has been watching him and preparing to strike a magical blow. Leslie begs the hero to stop, saying that they have a mutual friend, Gloria Jenkins. Michael, slightly surprised, asks who Captain Jenkins is. He replies that she is his sister, who told about Michael. Clinton saw that he was good and decided to invite him. Nothing bad. Johnson is about to strike again and says that in order to invite him, they could have simply found him and not spied on him. Leslie again panically shrugs off the hero's impending blow and swears on the honor of the captain of the dragon soul that she will be indebted to Michael and will help if he has any problems in the future. The main character, thinking about Leslie's position, begins to think about using it to strengthen the social influence of his Tazen group, which needs it for development. Michael grabs the captain by the collar and sternly asks what place his squad occupies in America, to which Leslie readily notes that his group is the third of all in the fight against secret forces. Michael believes that this is enough for his company and sets a strict condition that Clinton will be released only if he signs a contract with the company in New York. The captain asks if he understood correctly that Johnson wants the company that previously belonged to his father to be taken under the wing of the squad, to which Michael answers in the affirmative and says that he has a special case, but he can contact his superiors, and even if they do not agree, he will find a way to solve this problem. The main character hands his new ally a brownish sphere, reminiscent of chocolate in color, and says that the captain will recover from his wounds when he eats it. Leslie increasingly does not understand who this guy is, because he also has pills, and then wonders if he has any more such things, because he has only heard about them but has never even seen them. Michael throws up a bunch of pills and says that he has more than one, and the captain looks at them in fascination, and then says that if they were handed over to the military, then the hero interrupts him and says that this is not some kind of relic, and therefore he should not give it away. Johnson arrogantly reports that if Leslie wants to get them, he will have to carry out the assignment and send a person for a personal meeting. Michael jumps off the roof, and the squad captain is left in bewilderment thinking that the right person is very busy and will not be able to show up for a personal meeting. Lying on his bed, 
the main character argues that two women in the house only means that the bath and toilet are always occupied, so now he will have to wait in line. He believes that his strength has increased greatly recently, and therefore takes out the stone given by his father to again try to penetrate the cemetery of rebirth. Michael again finds himself in the same dark place he found himself in last time. Johnson notices that his head does not hurt, and he does not feel any discomfort, and the cemetery does not try to push him away. Is it really because of his strength? Michael stands in front of a huge grave blazing with magic, next to which there are many different swords stuck. The main character is going to summon Claude Crank's fist of death, but he doesn't quite understand how to do this, and therefore tries different magical effects on the grave. Sarah and Jessica are talking in the middle of the apartment about how Walsh needs to sort out some things today, and therefore there is no need to cook for her today. Johnson, sitting next to him on the sofa, thinks that he has already tried everything possible to move the grave. Is his strength really not enough? The guy understands that he needs an alchemy furnace to strengthen, but he had to go to the auction for it today, and Jacob Sanders never called him, although he doesn't even have a number, so he should check on him. Johnson's phone rings. He assumes that it is Robert calling about the work done. It's really the head of the Clark family who calls. He reports that Michael's father's company is now under his control along with all the employees. Dressed in a smart suit, Robert announces that he has a couple of formalities to settle, and in two days he can arrange a ribbon cutting. Michael is glad that the old man did not deceive him, and says that by this time all of New York will know that Tazen Group is back. The main character argues that Leslie still hasn't contacted him, and he couldn't just leave the game without warning. Jessica and Johnson hear a knock on the door. The girl does not understand at all who could appear at such a time, but Michael understands that it is almost certainly Jacob. Out of breath, Sanders quickly begins to say right from the door that he waited all morning, but Johnson never showed up, and therefore he had to spend some time getting here. They were about to let him in. But Jacob said that this was not necessary and handed over an invitation letter to the auction, sadly informing him that something had happened in his family, and therefore he could not go with Michael. The hero just wanted to ask what happened, but the old man already closes the door and leaves without saying anything, making Johnson think that something serious happened. It's a sunny afternoon, there are only a couple of clouds in the sky, there is a large beautiful building with panoramic windows, there is a small park nearby. This is the Millennium Hotel. Michael is in the middle of the crowd waiting for the auction to begin. He is dressed in a black suit and matching trousers. He has an orange tie, and a red handkerchief can be seen inside his breast pocket. Young Johnson, using his peripheral vision, notices a familiar face. It turns out to be Lilia Sanders, Jacob's granddaughter. Lily is dressed in a pink evening dress. She, very embarrassed, also notices Johnson's presence awkwardly greeting him. Michael notices that she doesn't look very good, but she denies it and says that everything is fine, and since he is here, let him follow her. Lilia says that this reception is known as a round table, and is mainly designed for communication and relaxation. The auction itself will take place later on the floor above, and now you can have a snack. Some strange personalities sarcastically remark that the girl appeared here, moreover, as quietly as a mouse. And then they say that it is even more strange that she came at all, because the Sanders family could not defend themselves. Could the main character is trying to find out what happened to Lilia's family, but she says that Dad will definitely figure it out, and Michael is a guest, so he should concentrate on the auction. Someone calls out from behind Johnson. It turns out to be Sarah Walsh. She is dressed slightly revealingly, but very beautifully, unbalancing Sanders with her beauty. She asks what Michael is doing here and he addresses a similar question to her, and Lilia goes to the restroom, so as not to interfere, because she will not become so beautiful. Sarah asks him who the girl he came with was, to which Michael says that she is the granddaughter of a pharmacist who helps him, but what is Walsh doing here, all of whose bank accounts are frozen? The main character assumes that she is hungry, and she asks what makes him think that she is still unemployed, and she received an invitation earlier, and then asks how much money he has, to which he replies that he has an incredible 90 million, betting the girl is in an awkward position. Sarah says in a conspiratorial tone that this is an unusual auction, and the person responsible for it is not so easy to meet, and in general the world is full of people who secretly practice martial arts, and they are unusually strong, 
and can also kill with their bare hands. Obviously not impressed by this news, the main character is faintly frightened and surprised, leaving his fellow traveler in an uncomfortable position. Walsh tells Michael that it may seem like there are four main families in New York, but in fact there is one more terrible one. This news even arouses imaginary interest in Johnson. She says that this is a mysterious kind of martial arts. They are mysterious behind-the-scenes puppeteers. This family is divided into two branches, just like this auction. The first deals with paintings for ordinary people. The second deals with everything related to martial arts, including weapons and pill cultivation items. The price of one thing is more than a hundred million dollars. From Sarah's words, Michael understands that even his money may not be enough for the alchemical furnace he needs so much. But he also understands that he needs it. Johnson asks whether it is possible to display his things here. His companion replies that yes. But first they need to be approved by the expert commission that sits upstairs. Michael remembers that he recently heard that there are very few alchemists left, and therefore he should be able to sell his medicines at a high price. The main character enters the office and sees in front of him a bunch of strange people who play mahjong for huge sums, and one just lost ten million to the other. One of the commission members asks what Johnson forgot here. Does he really want to show his goods to the commission? Michael takes out one of his miracle pills right in front of the commission and says that he wants to sell it. These people are very confused at the sight of such a product. Someone says that such pills are always filled with energy. Someone doubts that there are still such ones left. Another tries to say that he knows better, and the last one even wants to continue the game as quickly as possible. Upon closer inspection, the commission members notice that they are not holding an ordinary pill in their hands, but with a real ornament. After such news, everyone completely loses their heads and tries to look at it one by one, putting Michael in a slightly awkward position. They are very surprised to discover that the thing has also recently been improved, and therefore there is no doubt left. They begin to ask the guy where it came from, whether his teacher is an alchemist. Johnson is nervous and realizes that there are not only few alchemists in America, there are none left, and therefore he urgently has to come up with something to get out. The young hero says that he doesn't want anyone to hear their conversation. The senior member of the commission understands everything perfectly and takes him to the back room. In the room there turns out to be a very beautiful and richly dressed woman with fiery pink hair. Michael had never met her before, even she is not sure that it was really possible to get such a thing. But the assistant dispels her doubts and shows her the very sphere that Johnson brought. The girl notices that this is indeed the same pill, and judging by the color, it was created at least a month ago. Great surprise can be seen in the eyes of the exalted lady, and the commission member leaves, not wanting to interfere with such an important conversation. The girl says that her name is Bell Stark and calls the guy to sit down, asking how to address him. Michael says his name, and without any hesitation calls to get down to business, whether he can put this medicine up for auction. Bell thinks that Johnson is too young to understand alchemy. After all, you need to know a lot of medicinal properties of herbs, not to mention production, simultaneously informing his interlocutor that he can exhibit the goods, and also wonders how many lots he plans to exhibit. Michael calmly reports that he has five more pieces with him, to which the girl asks loudly and begins to sweat heavily, realizing that a strong alchemist must be standing behind the guy. Bell chuckles and says that if you sell everything at once, the cost will be more than a billion. It's better to sell one at a time and not rush. Michael decides to cheat and wonders how much the Stark family can offer in this case for such a profitable investment. He recommends doing so, so that the price suits him. The girl embarrassingly notices that the guy is quite cocky, and in her head she thinks that by selling one at a time, they can make an incredible profit. Bell shows the plastic card and carefully informs him that there are billions of dollars on it, but this is not enough to buy pills, and therefore she offers him a lucrative offer. She says that her family will owe Johnson, so no matter what happens to him, they will always provide him with all possible help. The price completely suits Michael, and therefore he is about to leave, since the auction will begin soon. Bell throws him an object that looks like a card, and at the same time thinks that by doing him a favor, it will probably be possible to contact the alchemist who is behind him. Johnson asks what it is, and the girl replies that auctioneers like him prefer to hide their identity. After this, Michael leaves, realizing that she was trying to catch him on something. Bell affably says goodbye to him. When Johnson leaves the office, 
The girl calls someone and gives the command to collect information about this person. The auction begins. A lot of people are gathered. Everyone wants to buy something here. Soft sunlight breaks through the windows. The three heroes sit in their places, and Sarah wonders how much he sold his probably precious goods for. Michael arrogantly reports that about 10 billion, irrevocably breaking Lilia Sanders' psyche. Sarah doesn't give in to words so easily, and therefore jokes about his recipe, which is really good, but still not worth tens of billions. The last lot of the stage is a tear of Star's necklace, which has long been considered stolen. The starting price is 60 million. Each subsequent buyer must increase the amount by more than 2 million. It turns out that this work was stolen from Sarah's grandfather, but she just can't buy it back for that amount. Although it should have gone to her, she's very sad because she can't do anything. Michael silently enters a certain amount on the screen of his new device. Shocking Bell, who is watching him, was such a waste of money. The former owner of the money is indignant, but decides that it is a gift to the woman, and therefore calms down, remembering that the money is no longer hers. Some guy keeps raising the price and says he has 140 million to negotiate. This necklace has to be his so he can win Sarah Walsh's affections that he so craves. An unknown gentleman, who bet 200 million, destroys to smithereens the picture of the future arrogant young man who believed that he had enough money. The guy really wants to know who offered that kind of money, but those conducting the auction report that he wanted to remain anonymous. The restless guy furiously shouts that this is all a provocation, and no one could pay that much money for a trinket. Bell appears on the stage and asks if the young man is sure that he doubts the Stark family, because it is her family that he belongs to, the family of martial arts, and then says that he will not allow such humiliation, and they promise to kill the guy and prohibit his family from participating in the auction in future. Sarah wanted to buy the necklace later, but now she doesn't even know who bought it, so she can find it in the future and buy it back. The auctioneer's wooden hammer noisily announces that the last lot of the first stage has been sold. Bell, standing at the table, reports that the time has come for the second stage of the auction. The time for the tripod of a hundred herbs has not yet come, but the girl asks not to leave yet. She presents the first lot. It turns out to be armor made of gold thread. Starting price is 90 million. After some time, Bell presents the seventh lot. The art of wielding a sword in the style of M.O., the starting price is 150 million. The auctioneers are more interested in this lot and the bidding begins. Lilia remembers with horror how many things were sold and how much money was spent. Michael remains indifferent, and the girl is surprised by the unique book on sale. Johnson frowns, realizing how insignificant this thing is, complaining that the local craftsmen imagine themselves as gods, not realizing their own worthlessness. The auctioneers present the next lot from the heavy category and buyers are presented with something hidden under a large blanket. This turns out to be the same tripod of a hundred herbs that everyone has been waiting for so long. It glitters in the sun. Its body is covered with ornaments. Belle Stark says that this tripod was accidentally found by her family. It can be used to prepare medicine. This item will be a great addition to the collection. The price starts at 300 million. For the first time, Michael also turns out to be partial to the presented product. He notices that the tripod is of better quality than he expected, and understands that it is worth fighting for. Interested buyers very quickly increase the price. In a few seconds they are ready to pay $450 million for the tripod. Bell receives a message from Johnson on her phone, where he writes that he doesn't care about the price, he will take the tripod at any price. Stark smiles sarcastically and thinks that she immediately knew that this guy would want to get an alchemical thing. Disputes begin in the crowd that the last price was offered by a very dangerous person. You should not raise the bar higher, so as not to anger him and incur problems on yourself. Bell writes to Johnson that Phil Spencer is indeed very dangerous, so the guy should give up the tripod and not mess with him at all, to which Michael replies that he is ready to get himself into trouble. The girl understands that she must help him, since she bought his medicine for a billion. Meanwhile, Someone is offering 500 million for the tripod, the dangerous man is very dissatisfied with this fact, and there are rumors in the crowd that someone will die today. Phil calmly offers to raise the price to 530 million, thinking that even if someone offers more, no one will outbid his next bid. Stark tells the buyers that a gentleman who wishes to remain anonymous has offered a price of 700 million, infuriating the dangerous man. 
The rich gentleman loudly says to the crowd that he doesn't care who dared to do this, but he will get him out of the ground and make him regret today. Bell, with a joyful face, proclaims, hitting the hammer, that the lot has been sold to an unknown person for seven hundred million. Michael, glowing with happiness, realizes that with the help of this device he can finally become even stronger. Stark chants that the next lot was literally just purchased by her family, and she can safely call it priceless, and presents the buyers with the highlight of the program, a real pill. There is a commotion in the crowd. The buyers do not believe that they will have a chance to buy a real pill that not only heals wounds, but also improves well-being. But Bell sets a starting price of 400 million, but it instantly jumps to 680 and has no intention of stopping. Sarah doesn't believe that this thing can cost so much. She doesn't understand what caused such a stir. She's never seen anything like this before. Stark announces the end of the auction. People disperse. Bell invites everyone to attend the banquet for a wonderful leisure time. Michael is sure that the evil and terrible Phil Spencer would be torn with anger if he found out that the buyer of the tripod and the creator of the pill are the same person. Johnson receives a message from Bell, where she asks the guy to come to her. Her father found out about Michael and wants to give him some compensation. Sarah tells the guy that they are not going to dinner anyway, which means they can go home. Then she is surprised that Michael did not buy anything. But then she remembers that she needs to talk to her friend and abruptly leaves, leaving Johnson thinking about the proposed compensation. Michael came to Belle's hotel room. She was already waiting for him. The girl hands the guy a bank card with one and a half million on it and adds that he can also still count on the favor of their family. Johnson reports that he came not for money, but for a tripod of hundreds of herbs. But Stark asks the guy for his own safety to leave his address and phone number. She will personally order the alchemical tool to be sent to him in the evening. Belle invites Michael to stay for dinner, saying that her father would really like to meet him. But the main character brushes off the invitation, says that he is not used to eating out, and leaves. The girl is angry that the guy does not understand that, under the pretext of a dinner party, his father wanted to protect him, because Johnson insulted the Spencer family, and now he needs powerful protection. In the hotel on the fifth floor, in the observation room, the dangerous Phil Spencer sits with his assistants. There are many brutally murdered corpses of workers around. He examines the pill with interest, noticing that it is different from the ones his family collects. His assistant notices that the patterns on the pill were applied no more than ten days ago. Phil tells his interlocutor that he does not know where the Stark family got these pills, but it is commendable that they provided them to the public to which the subordinate expresses the opinion that perhaps if their family really controls the supply of pills, then they will be able to reach unprecedented heights and will become more powerful than the Spencer family. Here they are enthusiastically interrupted by another assistant, saying that the young gentleman should urgently look at the CCTV cameras. He shows on the screen a young man leaving Bell's room, saying that the girl was alone today only with this man. It must have been he who took the tripod and most likely the pill. 2. Young Spencer bears his teeth and sincerely does not understand how that guy dared to take what belongs to his family. It seems that life is not at all dear to him. Walking outside, Michael notices Sarah and Lilia waiting for a taxi. He approaches young Sanders and, thinking that a family of her status should have a personal driver, he wonders what their problems are. The modest girl, blushing and stuttering, answers the guy that everything is fine with them. Johnson asks her for a cell phone and enters his number there telling the girl that if trouble happens, she can call him, he will definitely help. The young man leaves with Mrs. Walsh, leaving Lilia with a grateful smile on her face. Sarah asks the guy why the girl calls him master, noting that it is so awkward. Johnson feels something is wrong. The girl asks him what happened, to which he says that he suddenly wanted coffee and asks her to follow him into the cafe and wait for the guy inside. Sarah nervously asks why she should wait for him and where he is going. Michael replies that he needs to go to the toilet. The girl doubtfully claims that the cafe also has a toilet, but Johnson thinks that he is too frail there and needs something stronger. Sarah is perplexed. Michael begins to blaze with his magical energy, defiantly rips off his tie and says that he is a man of principle, therefore he prevents any threat. Or Phil Spencer stands with his assistant waiting for Michael. The subordinate notices that the guy has already noticed them, but his boss no longer cares. The dangerous gentleman reflects on the fact that Michael is still a corpse, but he liked the girl who was with him. As soon as he sorts out all the problems, 
He will definitely return for her. At that moment Johnson's hand falls on his head. Spencer's assistant turns out to be a martial arts master. He calls Michael's attack vile and warns that he will now face death for such impudence. The master attacks the guy with his unique blow, called the flash of lightning. Electrical power oozes from his evil. Michael, pushing Phil away, meets the attack of his subordinate. Johnson, calling the master a fool, sends his head flying with one blow. Spencer, in nervous shock, does not understand how Teacher Ma, who has the level of semi-step transformation, is killed in the blink of an eye. The young hero turns to Phil, warning him that it is now his turn. Spencer tells Michael that he dared to kill his servant, which means he will face consequences. He invites the god of medicine to kneel and beg to make him a dog. Johnson does not allow Phil to finish, sending his magical energy into his forehead, causing the guy to instantly fall unconscious. Michael notices that someone else is watching him and asks out loud how long this will last. A guy comes out of the shadows, bows and says that Bell Stark sent him to look after him. The guy understands that Michael does not need his protection. His blow will easily fly him ten blocks. He reports that Mrs. Stark discovered that the surveillance room was hacked and therefore sent him to protect him. Michael notes that this is very nice of Bell. He orders the boy to return and tell his boss to calm down and no longer interfere in his life without asking. The guy, before leaving, warns Michael that although he is powerful and has already reached the level of a master of transformation, the Spencer family is very strong, and their head Rennie is ranked 514th in America, and therefore Johnson better not finish off this man's son. Johnson is surprised that there is some kind of rating, and that there are still 500 people ahead of Rennie Spencer. He concludes that the American masters are not as hopeless as they seemed at first. He thanks Bell's assistant and leaves. As soon as Michael leaves, the assistant calls the lady and tells her that the youngest of the Spencer family is dead, like the master who protected him. Bell is afraid for Johnson. Realizing that he will now have no peace, she asks her man whether the killer is really Michael, to which he gives a positive answer. She thinks that due to the death of the third son of the Spencer family, hard times have now come for her. Stark orders his subordinates to dispose of the body and contact the family, and also wait for the person who will destroy all the evidence. Already at Jessica's house, having dinner at the table, Michael asks Sarah why she doesn't eat. Does she really have no appetite? After this, the guy goes into his thoughts. He asked Locke about the rating and was completely confused by it. He cannot understand how the classification of masters works in America. After all, masters have weaknesses and strengths. Since there are no elite level masters, it turns out that the rating takes into account only the advantages. But then what place does Johnson take in this rating? Je Jessica reminds Michael that their beauty's birthday is next week. She wonders if the guy came up with a gift. He jokes that he will give her a red envelope with $250. Suddenly, Michael receives a text message from Lilia, who asks him to save her father. The guy immediately goes to the rescue. At the Sanders estate, he meets a huge crowd of people in uniform, notices that the situation is terrible. At the gate and on the roof three sniper rifles are pointed at him. He wonders what this family has gotten themselves into, and what does the military have to do with it. Michael doesn't think long about who he can call and decides that Jenkins can help the fastest. He asks the girl to help him get to the Sanders estate, which is full of military personnel. Johnson is already upset that help is not coming for a long time, when Paul Zengo, a huge man in military uniform who arrived on behalf of Gloria, appears. He shows his ID to the guards and tells them that they need to go inside. In the house, Lilia and Jacob are sitting on the sofa. The girl reassures her grandfather, saying that she has found a person who can help them, and the desperate old man says that everything is useless. Michael enters the room with Paul. The old man is surprised and asks his granddaughter why she called such a great man, to which she replies that she doesn't know anyone stronger, so there was no choice. Johnson asks Jacob what's going on here, to which he says that a few days ago a gentleman came to New York, he was feeling unwell, and he drank medicine from their pharmacy. In the end he became even worse, because in the medicine turned out to be poison. Lilia compliments her grandfather's story by saying that Jacob checks all the medicines personally several times, and there is no way poison could have been there. Michael, a little shocked by the story he just heard, understands that it is not profitable for the Sanders family to poison high-ranking people. Therefore, they were framed. He asks how that person is feeling now. 
An upset Jacob replies that he is still in intensive care, saying that if anything happens to him, all his relatives across America will suffer. The god of medicine asks where the hospital is, declaring that as long as this gentleman is breathing, he can save him. Jacob Sanders can't believe his ears, thinking that Michael is an excellent martial artist. Such people are good at killing people, not saving them. Michael sees the man's doubts and states in a confident voice that this is the only chance for their family, so they just need to tell them where that man is. In the hospital where the gentleman lies, his son, a military man, is standing and waiting for doctors from the intensive care unit. They come out saddened and report that, unfortunately, the poison has spread and they have done everything possible. A man in uniform and shoulder straps rushes at the doctor in a rage, grabs him by the neck, calls him a non-entity and useless trash. Then Johnson appears and tells this man that he himself does nothing, but insults others, calling him pathetic. The gentleman's son, releasing the doctor, turns his attention to the guy and aggressively shouts for him to stop and repeat what he said. He is stopped by Paul Zengo, who asks to let Johnson through to the head, maybe he can save him, and if not, then he himself will personally appeal to the military court. The saddened son agrees, because he respects Django and believes that he does not throw words into the wind. But if this guy does nothing, then even Gloria Jenkins will not be able to stop him. Michael, feeling the smell of death, notices a man on a hospital bed and says that this old man has a strong will. Anyone else in his place would have already gone to another world, but this one still manages to breathe. Johnson holds some kind of pill in his hand and says that this man is lucky to be here. He gathers his strength in his hands. They blaze with green fire, and in this tension immortal needles are created. The god of medicine directs these needles into the body of the dying master, shouting an incantation. They pierce his chest and expel the poison. Five minutes later, a satisfied Michael sighs tiredly, reporting that the gentleman should wake up in five minutes. He wonders who this man is, and hopes that he has done a good deed for the country. When young Johnson has already turned around and is about to leave, the patient calls out to him asking him to stay, the guy is shocked by such a quick recovery. The gentleman asks to know the name of the doctor, but Michael says that he saved his life because of one person, and he doesn't care about himself. Johnson also says that the patient needs to remember two things. Firstly, the Sanders family has nothing to do with the poisoning, and he needs to resolve this misunderstanding. And secondly, the poison was in his body for a long time and acted on him for more than a month. If someone else were in his place, he would have died long ago, but you shouldn't try your luck. Michael comes out of intensive care, and the patient's son attacks him, saying that at first he thought the guy was worth something, but he was only in the office for eight minutes, and therefore did nothing. A man, just dying, comes out of the emergency room behind Jones and asks his son to stop. Paul Zengo and all the doctors are in shock, they can't believe their eyes, the gentleman who was just on the verge of death is standing in front of them. The old man, who had recently been on the verge of death, smiles cheerfully and tells his son that if it weren't for this wonderful doctor, he would have had to prepare a coffin. He had never met such a doctor. The son of a sick officer wants to apologize to Michael, but he disappears somewhere without anyone noticing. The old man turns to the unfortunate Jacob Sanders and apologizes to him, sincerely understands that his family has nothing to do with it, and his son misunderstood everything. Inspired Sanders asks the head not to apologize to him, it's just a trifle, to which the gentleman asks whether his family invited the doctor, and who he is. Jacob says that the guy's name is Michael Johnson, they met by chance, he's a family friend, but he really doesn't like when he is disturbed. The house of the Spencer family, the head of the family with his eldest son look at the dead bodies of their son and master. Placing his hand on his son's coffin, he wonders to Rennie who the hell dared to kill him. The eldest son says that an investigation is already underway, but so far all they know is that someone secretly purchased the tripod at an auction, and shortly after that Phil was killed. The elder Spencer orders his interlocutor to go to this auction and check each participant there. He obeys. Rennie, with the veins on his head swollen with rage, exclaims that he needs to turn everything upside down, but find the killer. He wants him to go to hell. He wants to see people dear to him die a painful death. Robert Clark calls Michael on the phone and tells him that the affairs of the Tazen group have been settled, asks whether Michael himself will be the founder or someone else, and also warns that tomorrow the news about the company will spread throughout New York, 
and asks if it will deliver whether this is an inconvenience for Johnson. Michael confidently says that you can use his name without any problems. He wants to tell every resident of this city that Michael Johnson is back. Villa Johnson, Bell's assistant delivered a tripod of hundreds of herbs and a tear of stars that he had recently acquired. The Courier also reports that Mrs. Stark asked to convey the news that the head of the Spencer family has already raised everyone's ears. They are checking all the auction participants and will soon contact Johnson. He also says that Bell has ordered a private jet. If the gentleman agrees, then they can immediately send it to Salt Lake City. Their residence is located there, so the Spencer family will not get him there. Michael understands Stark's concern, but is not going to run away from problems. The assistant is very surprised that Mr. Johnson really wants to confront the Spencer family. How is that even possible? Michael sends Bell's man out of the house, and he himself is going to try out his new acquisition in action. The main character adds the herb to the alchemical furnace, lights it with his superpower, and says that the medicine consists of nine components, and each ingredient consists of nine more. The higher the grade, the more complex the ornament, and the better the effect. Michael is about to try to improve the aura refinement and cultivation acceleration pill, but doubts the possibility of this. But the tripod begins to glow very brightly in turquoise. An improved version of the old pill quickly flies out of the alchemical furnace. Michael is delighted with the result. He examines this pill and reasons that he initially thought that there would be three ingredients and three lines. But this exceeded all his expectations, because it turned out to be seven lines of the ornament. Michael is delighted with the tripod of hundreds of herbs. He, of course, knew that he could improve the quality of medicines, but did not think that so much. But everything turned out just like that. The money will flow like waterfalls. Young Johnson pops a brightly colored pill into his mouth, beginning the cultivation. The main character bursts into orange flames, which completely consumes him. Red fire bursts out of the guy's eyes and mouth like a bright ray, illuminating everything in the area. Michael feels incredible power and the transition to the sixth kingdom of enlightenment, laughing, saying that the effect is not bad and admires the greatness of alchemy. Michael stands over the alchemical furnace and realizes that in one evening he jumped two kingdoms higher, not believing what was happening. He catches a stone once given by his father, notices that the stone has changed not only in size, but also feels different to the touch. Michael decides that he needs to visit the rebirth cemetery again. Finding himself in the cemetery, he approaches one of the tombstones and believes that this time he will be able to notice something due to the fact that his state has changed. Now he can feel everything if he wants to, even summon some legendary warrior Claude Crank, Fist of Death. But he also feels that if he calls on him once, the tombstone will crumble into dust, and such a trump card is clearly worth keeping in his sleeve. Jessica's apartment, the girls read the news on the internet that the Tazen group, which disappeared five years ago, is returning. Sarah realizes that she heard about this company somewhere, and Jessica explains to her that the Tazen group was created by Michael's father, but for some reason it suddenly disappeared, and now it is returning. Then the girls notice another piece of news, the director is Michael Johnson. The shock Sarah remembers Michael's words that he wanted company for himself and wonders if he really did this just to annoy her mother. This a meeting of directors in the Vox family. Everyone also learns that the Tazen group has returned, and the younger Johnson is the director. Lucy Vox doesn't understand how this is possible, because he should be dead, what this guy is even up to. The director reports the results of the investigation. Michael Johnson, who runs the company, is the same child who fell into the lake five years ago. The head of the company shows his registration photo on the big screen. Lucy recognizes in this guy the same ancient warrior who insulted her so much. He is also the same Johnson, how a representative of their family was able to become a warrior in the first place. The very appearance of the company does not frighten the Vox family. What is scarier for them is that all the previous management and office of the company were destroyed without a trace. This means that the Tazen group is built on a sea of corpses which means that this can already become a threat, and therefore we need to find out who is sponsoring it. The head of the family remembers that Johnson was once interested in Lucy, but she says that he is not worthy of their family, because he ended up in the spotlight because of a feeling of shame and thanks to someone else's support. If you believe the latest news, Robert Clark and his company are behind Johnson, although he was sick with cancer, but somehow he survived, apparently he moved his head so much. 
He says that he would like to know what will happen next, because no one in their right mind would join him if they knew New York. Megan Walsh, sitting in her mansion, learns the popular news, and then laughs at Johnson's attempts to undermine the position of the Walsh family. She orders her man to send a letter saying that any person or company that dares to send flowers to the Tazen Group's opening ceremony tomorrow will become enemies of the Walsh family. The subordinate believes that thanks to the family's authority, not only will Johnson's company be left without employees, but this will also hit the Clarks. Michael is sitting in his villa meditating when he receives a call from Clark. He reports that things are bad, that the Vox and Walsh families are going to ban the Tazen Group from working. Three other large families supported this idea. No one will dare to go to the ceremony tomorrow. Michael takes this news calmly, saying that those who want war will get it, and also says to leave it to him, because he wants the Tazen group not only to start working, he is going to break in in triumph. Michael returns to Jessica's house. The main preparations for the event are completed. Locke wanted to attend, but Johnson decided that he was better off operating from the shadows. The girls attack the guy with questions about where he has been these two days, why he hasn't contacted him, and whether he is really the owner of the Tazen group. Michael awkwardly reveals that he's really some sort of head, and to be fair, it's his dad's business, but he considers it, to some extent, a family affair. Sarah rushes at the guy with tears, asking him to forgive her, because she didn't think that her mother would use family influence to harm his company. She even called her, but to no avail. Sarah thinks that Michael tried so hard, but because of her all his work will go to waste, but Johnson pats her on the head and tells her not to take it personally. He says that if she really feels guilty and feels bad, then she should just kiss him on the cheek and console him. But then, to the surprise of the main character, the girl actually kisses the guy. Jessica thinks with tears in her eyes that there was something between them before. Michael calms the girls down, assuring them that everything will go well tomorrow. No one came to the ceremony. Everyone watched the excitement, while only Clark stood on the carpet. He is waiting for Mr. Johnson, not believing that he will leave him alone in such an awkward position. A man with glasses approaches Robert. Clark is sincerely glad that his old friend came, despite everything. The man says that despite their many years of friendship, he is here to say that it is time to stop. He has no business helping this non-entity from the Johnson family. Here the hero of the occasion himself announces himself, and asks what the men are talking about. The men start throwing loud words at each other. Clark says that he is very glad if his friend is here for support, but if not, let him get out of here. And he says that he came to save Robert, because if he gets involved with this piece of shit, he will certainly die, and if he doesn't come to his senses now, he will lose all their joint projects. Passions between former friends are heating up more and more, Clark himself refuses projects, and his friend says that he is a fool, and he no longer needs his company, and wishes him good luck while waiting for the moment when four influential families come for his soul. The former friend leaves. Robert sadly reports that none of those he called wants to join them. Michael indifferently notes that everything will work out anyway. Clark's ex-friend approaches Lucy Vox. He says that it's already nine o'clock and no one is there yet. No one who has at least some kind of ID will be able to get through, otherwise they will pay with their lives, and his partner really wants to see how he gets out of such a situation. The home of the Knicks family, the head of the family is engaged in sports training in his personal gym. The son and his employees stand in front of the man, they say that the time will come soon and the Tazen group will soon enter the market. But no one has joined them yet, it is clear that everyone wants it to close. The head of the family complains that they have such influence and they all talk about closing it down. What did this Tazen group do? The first officials of New York stand on his carpet and mumble that, in fact, she did nothing and they will correct her situation. They frantically think that they did not expect the boss to call them so early because of the Tazen group. The boss shouts that if they want to improve the situation, why are they still here and quickly sends them to do their work. They quickly run away, assenting. The son asks his father if Michael Johnson and his company are really worth it because it will definitely worsen their relationship with the Walsh family. The father sadly notices that for some reason his child does not see prospects in people, because he met with him that day to make sure whether he really is a martial arts master. He also has the art of magical medicine. He is clearly a genius. If we do not side with him today, we may greatly regret it in the future. The Walsh family has influence due to its financial resources, 
but what is it worth ending relations with them? Haven't merchants loved entertainment for centuries? The son understands what the father wanted and says that he will do everything. A large press crowd gathered at the gates of the Tazen group to witness its failure and complete collapse. Lucy says there's no point in waiting because no one will come. To everyone's surprise, Jessica Nightingale and Sarah Wall appear on the carpet in chic dresses. Vox cringes with anger and wonders why the hell Walsh forgot there. Isn't it her family boycotting the company? All photographers and journalists immediately notice the appearance of such iconic figures. They praise the girls in every possible way and say that others like them cannot be found anywhere else. Sarah turns to Michael saying that her company is lost anyway, so she is not afraid of being fired. Johnson says he is truly touched by their presence, but in his heart he thinks that, unfortunately, he needs a crowd, but at least they came themselves. Immediately after the girls, the owner of the Imperial Club in New York arrives. All the spectators are shocked by his appearance, but no one can order him except for the first and second person in the entire city. Michael grins impudently. Clark simply does not believe that this is possible. How miraculously Johnson achieved it. A high-ranking official wishes all the best to Johnson and the company. He only honors him with a nod. The girls are shocked by the appearance of such important gentlemen and the attitude towards them. Two more cars, belonging to some important personalities, arrive at the ceremony site. The first and second officials in New York appear on the path and greet Johnson, leaving the entire audience even more bewildered. Everyone notices that a military vehicle from the southwestern district is approaching. What are they doing here? Paul Zengo comes out of the car, surprising the audience immensely, because even the military arrived for the opening, with such force, for families are simply nothing. Another car arrives. Everyone is interested in who it is this time. Megan Walsh herself appears from it immediately ordering her henchmen to find out who decided to go against her. The servant, in a panic and in a cold sweat, reports that the owner of the Imperial Club, the first and second officials of New York and military general Paul Zengo are here. She puts her hands on her hips and realizes that she underestimated her opponent, even if he may not have such connections. Megan orders him to take the gift with him and goes along the carpet straight to Johnson. The reporters are shocked by the appearance of another member of the Walsh family. Are they really scared? Michael does not react in any way to the woman's appearance. She says that she wanted to send flowers, but they were all sold out. So her servant presents a large golden statuette of the little spendthrift. Everyone understands that this is a vile trick, because it is taboo to give a gift to a small spender to open a company. The mother is very outraged by her daughter's behavior because she herself decided to go against the will of the family. She also makes a sarcastic gesture at Jessica and says that she is fired, to which she says that she does not need a job in a family that is on the verge of bankruptcy and declares that she is leaving herself. The immortal Megan orders her thug to teach the impudent trash some manners. Michael catches his fist and says that if he touches her, not only will the carpet turn red, but he will too. Stefan nicks himself, a representative of the most influential of the four families of New York, appears on the path and is interested in the fact that the Walsh family can still only boast of their status. Sarah in a whisper asks how Michael knows such an influential person, and Johnson replies that he didn't know his name, and last time he almost got into a fight with him. Stefan congratulates the company on the opening on behalf of his entire family, and Michael warmly thanks him. The military man, confused, notices the golden figurine and asks if he really sees the little spender, causing Megan's servant to become very nervous. Stefan swings his arm as hard as he can and smashes the taboo figurine into a pile of pieces. Megan is furious and asks how he dared destroy the Walsh family's gift, whether he is acting on behalf of the family or on his own. The head of the Nick's family appears and asks when his son stopped representing his own family. With a smile on his face, he wonders if he understood correctly that his family is represented only by himself. Megan is shocked by the appearance of the head of the Nick's family. The man stands next to Michael and says that this is his dear friend. If the Walsh family puts him in an awkward position, then he can count on the Nick's family. But this is unlikely, because Mrs. Walsh's husband will not want to be their enemy. Many conflicting thoughts enter Megan's head, but she understands that she cannot take unnecessary risks and therefore decides to leave with her servant. Michael warmly greets Peter Nix, who says that Mr. Johnson pulled him out of the dead, and this is just a small thank you. Vox, seeing the Nixes, 
understands that her family no longer has the right to cross Michael's path, she gives up and leaves with a pitiful face. Clark's former friend tries to catch up with her, not understanding what he should do now. The girl kicks the businessman away and tells him to go away, he cries, sprawled on the asphalt, he thinks that this is the end. He gets up, goes to the disgruntled Clark and shouts for his old friend to forgive him, because he said a lot of unnecessary things. A friend begs in every possible way to forgive him, says that he has fallen under. Influence of the Vox family, Clark furiously kicks the non-entity and says that as soon as he lost face, he immediately remembered that he was his brother. How did he even have the conscience? Let him get lost. Michael, standing with Peter, Sarah and Jessica, laugh together at this situation. The loser runs away, and Michael sincerely praises Clark for such an act. Johnson raises his hands in the air and exclaims the start of their celebration as fireworks are released into the sky. The onlookers are still reeling from the historical event that just happened, but they understand that for them the show is over here. But then Homeland Security forces show up and ask the paparazzi to stay behind to allow them to check their devices on orders from their superiors. New York International Airport People say that it looks like a movie is being filmed here, their outfits are too conspicuous. The old man of the Burke family with his retinue is displeasedly waiting for someone to meet him. The mustachioed man comes out and says that he has prepared a dinner party in their honor and hopes that he will be honored with attention. The man is really worried that some terrifying energy is coming from Burke after the Ural Mountains. He was once the head of the Burke family, which occupied the first place in New York before he left. If not for the murder of his relatives, he would not have come down. He is full of anger and will shake this city. The man asks permission to raise a toast to the master. Because he has served him faithfully for a long time, the old man is only angrily interested in how the investigation is progressing, to which the servant only mumbles something. Burke breaks the table in two and shouts that he doesn't want to listen to his excuses. The guy says that Michael Johnson is now under great suspicion, but there is no irrefutable evidence. The old man wonders how such a young guy could kill his family. Then he tears up the sheet in a rage and says that since a shadow has fallen on the guy, it doesn't matter whether it's him or not, he's still a corpse. There is a meeting of directors in the Tazen Group office. They are thinking about what they should do next to develop the company. According to Sarah, the most important thing in the company is the product. Clark agrees and is also worried about this. Clark suggests turning to the internet or investments if Johnson has no ideas. But even so, they won't catch up with Walsh's company in six months. Michael calmly reports that they will not get involved with the internet, not to mention investments. He says that his company is only involved in industry, because it is unimaginably profitable. The head of the company puts two sheets on the table and says that the first course will make a woman look at least five years younger, and the second is a pill that extends the life of old people by three years. The company's personnel are very confused by what Johnson said because a medicine with such an effect is literally an elixir of immortality. Clark swears that Mr. Johnson is not lying, because he saved his life with the help of this pill. Unnamed directors say that this product is the best in the world, and it is quite possible to overtake the Walsh family with it. Michael reveals that he has two conditions for production, the first being mass production, and the second being that the formula must remain absolutely secret. Johnson says threateningly that if someone spills the beans, it will instantly cost him his life. Robert gets up from his seat and, in a soldier's manner, reprimands that the Tazen group will shock New York if they give him a month. Michael willingly believes in the capabilities of his ally and offers to distribute responsibilities. Jessica is in charge of marketing. Sarah is also going to move forward, but she is interrupted by a message. Her father writes something to her on the phone and she says that she does not need a high position and in general she will be a temporary employee but she promises to do everything possible for the company. After everyone has left, Michael says that he thought Sarah would want to take a management position, but she sharply refuses. The girl shows the phone and says that in five months there will be a wedding between her and a member of the martial arts family. She has no choice. Sarah sits alone in the room. She is very sad and wonders why she cannot refuse, because she is not a product, but a living person. Michael and Jessica are sitting on the sofa, eating and having a nice conversation, the girl is clearly saddened by something. The guy asks the girl what happened to her friend. She says that she doesn't know, she hasn't left the room since their return and refuses to answer questions. Jessica's phone rings, it's Aunt Hordes, she tells the girl some scary story. 
The girl hangs up and with a very frightened face turns to the guy, informs him that this is serious, and asks him if he knows Link Moresby. Michael is surprised to hear this name, because this is the son of the owners of the cafe where he often ate as a child. He remembers that when everyone turned away from Johnson, only Link remained with him. He was too kind and stupid, but still Michael perceived him as his best friend. The last time the guy talked to his father, he found out that he studies at the university. Jessica reports that Aunt Horde said Moresby was beaten and had his arm broken near the university, but the ambulance couldn't get there. Michael and the girl arrive at the institute, where they see numerous guards. Jessica asks them to let them in, saying they are students, but the security says that the rector has given an order not to let anyone in and they ask to show their pass. Michael can't stand it. He walks up to the fence and angrily throws away the heavy fence, leaving the guards confused. Johnson tells them that the university is a temple of knowledge, and not a place for violence. He came here to save people, and if anyone dares to interfere with him, he will break his legs. The guards fall to their knees in front of him and answer that they won't dare stop him. Let him pass. A beating is taking place on the territory of the men's dormitory. A bunch of people surrounded the attackers and victims. Link's mother defends the guy, calling the attackers monsters. They simply laugh at her, and the rector himself is among the attackers. He reveals that the woman's son has a broken arm, asking the audience if it is not his fault that he could not defend himself. Link tries to attack his rapist, but he puts him in his place by swinging a bat right at his face. His blow is blocked by the boy's father, who asks the attacker not to go too far, warning him that he has already called the police. An arrogant guy, he turns to his father and says that he should look at himself and not make him out to be some kind of monster. He explains to Link's father that he was harassing his girlfriend and that as soon as the police arrive, he will be arrested. The guy's girlfriend with a fake face agrees with the guy's words, saying that Moresby groped her breasts. Link shouts in rage that this is all a lie. In fact, the guy was going to rape a classmate three days ago, but he stopped him, and now he is simply taking revenge. The guy laughs mockingly that he just wanted to win the girl for himself. He points his finger at the poor girl with the broken glasses and suggests asking her if he did anything to her. The girl agrees with the rapist, and Link, in a cold sweat, pointing to the state of his classmate, tries to prove that she was forced to lie. The brute, having enlisted the support of his intimidated allies, again advances on Link, asking him if he is afraid of getting punished for such words. The father tries to stand up for his son, insulting the attacker, calling him a shit, and for this he receives a powerful punch right in the face. The boy is afraid for his dad and asks him to stop beating him, to which the offender swings a bat at the boy's head, promising to break his neck. Then an angry Michael bursts through the crowd, attracting numerous glances. The thug, defending himself with a bat, asks who he is and shouts not to come near him. Johnson punches him in the face, breaking the bat in two and breaking the guy's nose. The offender falls, his partner shouts for Michael to move away from his friend. Johnson sends his opponent high into the air with a powerful uppercut, indifferently telling him to get out. Link Moresby is shocked by what he sees and sincerely does not understand where his friend came from here. Michael says that he will answer his questions later, and now, handing him a pill, he asks him to eat it, explaining that then his wounds will heal and he will feel better. Johnson promises to deal with Link's offender, and the guy himself feels some strange sensation and wonders what kind of pill this is. Moresby is worried about his friend, saying that there is no need to stand up for him, since it does not concern him. Jessica puts her hand on the guy's shoulder and says that Michael will handle everything. Link recognizes the girl, and in even more bewilderment, tries to find out where they are from. He also doubts that Johnson will be able to cope with so many thugs, and Nightingale informs him that there is no man stronger than Michael in all of New York. The main offender, covered in tears and blood, complains to the rector that he was almost killed. Johnson approaches the rector and threateningly asks him what he allows himself, this is a university. The same one is trying to call security. Michael shuts the man up with a strong blow. The rector's wig flies off. His bald head shines very brightly. He shouts at the guy. How dare he? Says that not even his own father beat him. And Johnson drives him away from here, saying that such a person is not worthy to be called a teacher, promising to deal with him later. Michael addresses the crowd, calling everyone dogs, telling them not to dare to run away he will break his legs. 
Johnson turns to the thug's girlfriend, asks her if Link really molested her, to which the girl frantically replies that this is not true. She points a finger at her boyfriend, saying that he was the one who persuaded her to lie. Young Johnson slaps the girl in the face, ordering her to kneel before Moresby and apologize. The girl fulfills the order of this strong guy, asks for forgiveness from Link and promises not to do this again. Michael turns to the thug and orders him to do the same, but he begins to say that he is the son of a gentleman from the great Clune family, and he cannot be treated this way. Johnson is not ready to listen to him, and therefore strikes him in the face, and then between the legs. When the younger Clune is already lying down, Michael swoops in on him, asking about his family. He, with tears in his eyes, raises his hand and asks to stop, admitting that he is to blame. Behind Michael's back, everyone in the crowd is whispering about how they are scared, whether he will really kill Kloon and what will happen to them next. Johnson, meanwhile, beats Kloon, who is already sitting on his knees, and he begs him to spare him, because if he kills him, Kloon's father will take revenge. Michael is tired of this tirade about his father, and he calls Locke, asking him to urgently call Kloon Sr. here. After some time, the owner of the Imperial Club arrives with Kloon Sr. in a black jeep with security. The guard throws the man to the ground in front of Michael, who panics and does not understand what is happening. Johnson asks the head of the family to demonstrate how he is raising his son. Michael warns that if the father does not teach his son well, then their entire family is in danger from him. Kloon has no choice but to pick up a telescopic baton. The younger Klun begs his father not to touch him, and he hits him hard with a baton, saying that he is a fool, he doesn't even understand who he offended, that Johnson is a close friend of Master Du himself from the Imperial Club, and now even killing him is not enough. The Master himself? While watching what is happening, Michael, seeing that he is impatient, asks him to deal with the Rector and everyone present here, except for the girl whom Moresby saved. The master snaps his fingers and tells his guys to do what the Lord said screams are heard. Michael approaches the rescued guy and his parents. They break into a grateful smile. Johnson is glad to meet his old friend, invites him to go with him, and he remembers that five years ago this guy's kindness saved him. It's time to return the favor. The elder Burke in his house talks about the appearance of Johnson Jr. His assistant says that there is nothing to be afraid of because the Johnson family has been destroyed and their main problem is the people behind the Tazen group. If they kill that guy, they will anger his patrons. The Elder Burke laughs at the threat from the Nick's family and the National Security Agency. Because this bastard killed his family, he must take revenge. The assistant, listening to his boss about how he will cut off the heads of Michael's loved ones right in front of him, making the guy feel despair, says that they cannot risk that. The servant offers to arrange a duel, the price of which will be life then no one will dare to interfere. Burke agrees, saying that he will easily kill the guy if he accepts the challenge. The assistant grinningly asks if Michael can refuse the challenge if he is blackmailed by a woman. Then Spencer Sr. suddenly appears and offers Burke cooperation. Burke Sr. is surprised by the appearance of this old man, because he did not hear him enter, which means he has exorbitant strength. The owner of the house asks the master what wind brought him here, he laughs. He pokes at Michael's photo with such force that he breaks his finger through the table. Burke asks if such a person really has a grudge against this young man, and he replies that this scoundrel killed his son. The head of the family happily invites Spencer to sit in the chair, announcing that their families are now allies. Spencer immediately proposes his plan for revenge on Johnson. He found out that there are two girls that are important to him, and he can contact one of them. This method is more effective and painful for the guy. The master also adds that he is ready to send three of his best people. Burke agrees with the plan and is also ready to provide four of his students. They want to see how the guy copes with this. In the morning, Michael and Jessica are sitting at breakfast. The guy asks how Sarah is doing. The girl replies that yesterday her friend returned with swollen eyes and apparently cried a lot. Sarah doesn't answer questions. She went to bed early and still hasn't woken up. Jessica wants to go take her breakfast. Johnson says that this is unnecessary. If she wants, she will tell everything herself. He gets up from the table and warns the girl that he is leaving to meet with Link. Michael also adds with a malicious smile that the girl better not forget about work, otherwise he will cut her salary. The girl suddenly pinches the guy and with frightened eyes asks Michael if he is still there. Because five years ago he behaved differently, she has a feeling that they live in different worlds. 
Johnson replies that in his life he has understood one thing, people have two options, either play by someone else's rules or dictate their own. He likes the second option better. Opening the door, the guy adds so that the girl doesn't worry about it, he will always be with her. Everything he does is his choice. Johnson sits on a dorm bed with Moresby and talks with a guy. Other students watch them from the doorway, admiring his power and strength. Michael notices them, and with a displeased face asks if they want to come in. The students quickly disappear, asking for an apology. Johnson notices that after yesterday no one will dare to mock Link anymore, and the guy says that everyone bows their heads before him and is afraid of him. Michael, hugging his friend, says that in the world everything is decided by power, and rules are just a tool for subjugating the weak. They strengthen the power of the strong. Johnson takes out some blue book and invites Link to become stronger. But he is not going to force him. He, the guy, without thinking twice, takes the book and says that he will no longer allow anyone to mock him and his parents. The book describes the technique of rolling a purple cloud. It will give answers to all questions. Today Link must write down all his thoughts in it and burn it. But no one should find out. Moresby realizes what an important thing his friend gave him. Michael warns him that the path of martial arts is extremely dangerous, and reminds him that it is very important to protect his heart. Michael understands that he will not be able to come to the rescue every time, so he needs to teach Link to defend himself. He begins to tell him about martial arts. But then, interrupting his story, the phone rings. It turns out to be Locke, reporting that Sarah has been kidnapped and the people who were sent to rescue were killed. Michael is shocked. John adds that, judging by the injuries, the master attacked. He also apologizes and is ready to be punished. Johnson yells into the phone to stop apologizing and immediately connect all his connections and find Sarah. He tells Link that he needs to go urgently and asks him not to forget what he told him. Michael goes out the window, smashing it to smithereens. Link yells that this is the fifth floor. Leaning out the broken window, he notices Michael jumping and hole in the distance and begins to suspect that he is not a person at all. Johnson breaks into the Walsh family estate, where he meets Megan. He realizes that Sarah is not there. She attacks the guy with accusations, asking why he didn't protect her daughter, and also saying that the connection with the bracelet tracking her location has been interrupted. Michael asks to give him a day to return the girl. If he doesn't succeed, then he will belong to their family. Megan reports that she has already connected her people. She doesn't care how much effort it takes, but she will find her daughter. Michael returns home to the room where Sarah slept. He notices that the remaining aura belongs to the martial artist, and he also needs people to search. He remembers who can help him. Some anonymous number calls Johnson and asks how the degenerate of the Johnson family is doing, if he is nervous. Michael says he doesn't know him or his plans, but knows that he must let Sarah go, then they will go their separate ways peacefully, otherwise his death will be slow and painful. The interlocutor says that Michael does not understand yet, but he hangs up. There was a girl's hair left in the room. Johnson didn't want to use this technique, but apparently he has no choice. Michael casts the spells necessary to find his girlfriend. As a result of the ritual, he receives seemingly unrelated words. This technique has a strong effect even on Michael's body. He coughs up blood and is alive only thanks to training. He is ablaze with magical energy and is glad that he now knows where to look for it. The kidnapper is standing at the port, and is angry at Michael's impudence, since he has a hostage, and he should be threatening. But it turns out the other way around. The main conspirators are wondering when their rival will arrive. The bandit says that he threatened him and hung up before he could say where they were. The guy doesn't understand whether Johnson even wants to save her. What the hell he's doing? The elder Burke thinks that he should have stolen another girl but this idiot decided that Sarah Walsh was suitable. Sarah thinks that these people have a plan. Not only did they not harm her, but they also give her water, which means they don't want to hurt her. She assumes that they are threatening the Walsh family. The guy brings the bottle to her and tells her to drink, but she refuses until they identify themselves. Otherwise, they will have to act at their own risk and deal with the consequences of insulting her family. He throws the bottle and says that he doesn't really need her to drink, she seriously wants him to treat her properly. He can calmly kill her. Some kind of sound signal appears. The bandit notices that his sensor has gone off, which means someone is approaching. The guy flies into the air and wonders in bewilderment about how they could have been found. It seems that he has some connections of his own, and maybe even information channels, 
and whether he even came. No matter who it is, it doesn't matter, because Burke sent four masters, and his family has three lower-ranking masters. He definitely intends to kill Michael with his own hands. He suddenly steps into a puddle of someone's blood, looks up in bewilderment, and shouts out that he will kill. Michael stands surrounded by the conspirators, all of them dead or seriously injured, his eye glowing red, and he looks at the last one remaining. Michael exclaims importantly that he noticed another one. The last bandit nervously thinks that this is impossible and incredible. He killed four of Burke's students so easily. Not understanding what happened, he panics and decides to run away before Johnson decides to kill him too. Michael turns out to be faster, he has already come close to the bandit, and with fire in his eyes, tells him that he is a corpse. The main character grabs the kidnapper by the head, and with all his magical power smashes his head on the floor. The bandit mumbles through the pain that he must not die, otherwise the consequences will be terrible. Michael says that he doesn't hear his squeak, and also that he gave him a chance, but he didn't take it, so let him be responsible for his actions. Johnson appears in front of the container in which Sarah is sitting and says that he has come to save her. The girl throws herself on the guy's neck and says that she couldn't even imagine that he would come to save her. He is sincerely glad that she is not injured. Michael asks if she can go, and then tells her that they are going home. Sarah notices blood on Michael's hands. She wonders what happened and where the kidnappers are now. The hero regretfully reports that they are all dead. He simply had no choice. The girl screams and realizes that Johnson alone defeated very strong masters. She heard that her fiancé is also a master. She thought that he could not be compared with Michael, but it turns out that he is not so simple. Sarah thinks that if her father finds out about Michael's power, he will change his mind, and then finds herself thinking about becoming Johnson's wife. But that's not such a bad option. Michael takes her on his shoulders. Sarah indignantly asks what he is doing and he replies that she thought for too long, so he decided to take everything into his own hands, because, most likely, he will not stay on his feet. At first she is very indignant, but then she allows him to carry her if he wants. Sarah decides to hold on to that thought. This guy may be strange, but with him she feels safe and can rely on him. The main conspirators look through the magic picture at the death of all the warriors. They see how the guy is mocking, looking directly at them. Their will is unshakable so they will destroy him at all costs, no matter how strong a master he turns out to be. They talk about challenging him to a fight and they are both happy with this outcome. They believe that they should play it safe. If he agrees, they will ask Master Rio to take on the role of judge. Burke wonders if we are really talking about the master who is in the first 400 in China. Jessica's house, an angry Megan wonders if her daughter is really okay. She wonders who dared to kidnap her, but Sarah gently reports that everything is fine, and in general it was a mistake. The mother is furious, she doesn't understand since when the kidnapping is considered a misunderstanding, she wants to take her home. The girl says that she is protected here. Megan says that her father brought three guys from the province for protection, they are much more reliable than anyone. Michael says that if Ms. Walsh doesn't stop, he will have to intervene, she understands that it's better not to cross this guy's path. Megan says that she is not forcing Sarah, but her grandmother came from abroad to attend her birthday, let her come for the holiday, and then she can come back here. Sarah does not believe that her grandmother has returned from abroad and really wants to see her. The mother says that she has no need to deceive her daughter, and she, slightly embarrassed, thinks that she has been doing this literally all her life. Sarah wants to know Michael's thoughts, but he calmly lets her go, he allows her to return whenever she wants. Sarah enthusiastically says that she will definitely return and will never leave Johnson. They shake little fingers, and the guy promises her that everything will be as he said. Sarah almost forgot that she had drawn up a plan for the work of Tazen Group. Then she hands it over. The girl does not know what level of competence Clark has, but she can also be relied upon. Michael has no doubt that she is earning her salary. Sarah and her mother say goodbye to Michael in a good manner and leave. Michael tells the girl not to worry and thinks that Jessica and her family are now in danger. He believes that he has a whole few days to deal with the problem. Someone rings the bell. The guy thinks Sarah forgot something. Michael looks through the doorway and sees a little boy there who wonders if he is Uncle Johnson. The boy holds out an envelope and says that grandfather asked me to give it to him. Michael immediately opens the letter, but does not understand what it could be. He sees that this letter is from Burke, 
who challenges him to a battle of martial artists, and if he refuses, his loved ones will suffer. Michael understands who was behind the kidnapping of Sarah. He is very dissatisfied, although this makes the situation easier. Someone else knocks on the door, he opens it with displeasure, and there is Belle Stark. She asks displeasedly whether he received a challenge to the master's fight. With some relief, he wonders where she already got this data from, if he himself just found out. She says that this was decided a long time ago, and now even the most important people in New York know about it. By the way, this is how the masters solve almost all their issues. She says that he should refuse, because everything here is done in such a way as to kill him. But Michael does not understand why he should refuse if he himself wanted to kill him. Bell shouts that Burke received the title of master ten years ago and went to the mountains to practice so that he would not be followed. Even her father would not cross the path of such a person. Michael calmly announces that he will accept the challenge, although he thanks him for his concern. The door slams right in front of the girl, leaving her bewildered. She calls her father and says that, unfortunately, she could not dissuade Michael from participating. Her father reassures her, saying that they did everything they could. The father says that he needs to call the funeral home and at least arrange everything after his death, if they couldn't help. After the conversation, Belle silently looks at the phone, not knowing what to do. Michael sits and displeasedly thinks that she could cheer him up. He'll deal with this old man with just his left hand. Then Johnson's phone rings. It's John Locke. Michael does not understand why he called. He says that Burke is one of the 600 best warriors and asks if they should send him to kill him. Johnson says that he can handle it himself. He is more worried about what to do with the corpses in the port. Locke says that everything has already been done. John starts talking about how Burke has some kind of unique technique. But Michael hangs up the call. Michael is outraged that they are trying to help him even after he refused. His phone rings again. The guy no longer understands who else it could be. It's the head of the Knicks family calling. Johnson can't stand it anymore. After a few more calls, the main character is already furious with all kinds of support from his friends. Why no one believes in him. Robert calls, the guy already thinks that he is dissuading him. Clark doesn't understand what he's talking about, and Johnson remembers that he has no idea about the world of martial arts. Robert reports that the product they produce is quite unusual, and therefore the control bureau does not want to accept it. He had to say this. Michael says that he will come up with something. He is thinking about contacting the Nixes. The phone rings again. Johnson thinks that someone else is about to dissuade or intimidate him. Brother Jenkins calls Michael to a meeting with the boss. He readily agrees. It's time to meet his boss. A military base, a lot of military personnel, a lot of equipment, anti-tank installations. Michael, accompanied by Leslie Clinton, walks through the base. Leslie gives Johnson a pass. He says that the boss is busy and asks to wait a little. They stand in front of the door. Clinton reports that Michael is already here. Huge double doors open. Michael enters and goes to the long-awaited meeting. The man looking out the window tells everything about Johnson's relatives and murders of famous people, which are carefully hidden. He turns around and says that just his description scares many. What happened to him, that he became so strong. He also wonders where he got so much courage from to accept Burke's challenge. The man asks if the guest wants tea and pulls the mug towards him using his powers. Michael catches the cup and says that this is just empty talk. The man reflects that the cup was filled with pure energy. A person would not have been able to catch it, and a less powerful master would have been torn apart. His name is Mark Seed, and he heard that Johnson wants to cooperate. If he wants to join the special forces, then the man is ready to help him. Michael says that this is not what he needs. His company produces one medicine. He would really like help to get it on the market. Mark says it's easy to arrange, but he's interested in what he'll get in return. Michael throws his magic pill sharply and forcefully right at the soldier. He says that he can provide 200 of these. He is not going to bargain. Sid realizes that this pill has incredible healing properties and many patterns. He must take advantage of it. The soldier says that there are 500 of these magic lotions, and he will agree. The guy is about to leave, Mark stopping him says that he agrees to 200. Michael says he's changed his mind and is only offering a 100, then gives him 5 seconds to think about it. The soldier understands that the young man does not take him seriously and agrees to 200. He asks Leslie Clinton to come to him tomorrow to pick up the cargo. The guy leaves, slamming the door. The man thought that Michael would go out of his way, but it turned out completely the opposite. 
it's incomprehensible to the mind. Leslie comes in and asks if they should do something about the duel. The commander says that he will talk to his superiors about it. He says that if they want to kill the boy, then at least the documents will protect him. Michael prepares materials to create 200 improved magic pills. Johnson gets a call from Jessica. She asks why he's not home at this hour and where Sarah is. Michael says that he is in his new villa, and Sarah returned home voluntarily. Jessica says that the prices for villas here are more than the cost of companies, and Michael drops off the address and says that the gates will be open, leaving the girl in shock. The phone call stops and the girl sulks and says she will check right away. Ten minutes later, she is already standing at the gate of the villa and is about to enter the gate. She comes in and apologizes for disturbing her and says she's Michael Johnson's girlfriend. The guy levitates in the air and directs his power into a tripod, which blazes with magical flames. Jessica is nervous and does not understand what is happening. She does not believe that she really sees it. A lot of pills fly out of the alchemical furnace. Michael, with his tongue hanging out, catches them in the bag. Jessica, shocked by what she saw, wonders if this is really his house. He says that this is now her house too, grabs her hand and leads her to show her around. Jessica is surprised by the luxury of the furniture and says that this can only be seen in a dream. Michael brings her to the bedroom. She happily plops down on the bed and is surprised by its properties. She doesn't want to get up from it. He says that he's giving her the bed, since she liked it so much, and can move in tomorrow. Jessica, confused, asks if this is a prank, why give her so much? Johnson enthusiastically says he owes her much more than that. Jessica thinks it's because of what she did five years ago. Anyone would do the same, it's not worth it. She rushes at Michael and says that she is very angry, because he got a real palace. This time even he is in shock. She would really like to live with him. There are so many rooms here, she won't have to share a bed with Sarah. Mike leaves, and Jessica thinks that if he treats her like that just out of gratitude, then nothing will work out. The girl brings breakfast for Johnson and asks if he has prepared a gift for Sarah for tomorrow's birthday. Michael thinks about how quickly time has passed, says that he will come now and leaves. Johnson meets with Leslie to hand over the most precious pills. Michael hands over the pills, but the soldier takes them for breakfast. He says in surprise that these are the promised pills. Leslie is shocked that such value is stored in a bag. He takes them and presses them to himself. The commando orders to strengthen the protection of the car, and the soldier says that it is already safe there and Leslie explains that he does not understand the importance of the pills. Michael calmly says that they shouldn't worry so much. If something happens to them, they can still turn to him. Leslie is glad to hear this. He says that his commander will protect Johnson, no matter what trap they prepare for him at the Battle of the Masters. A tea house, Mastery is in it. Burke and Spencer are sitting in front of him. Burke is very nervous from understanding Rio's superior strength, because he is one of the top 400 best warriors, he will not reach such a level. He has been the head of the province for the last 10 years, and he is also the vice president of the Martial Arts Association. Many dream of becoming a part of it. The master asks why don't they have tea, since he was invited here. They deeply respect Rio and give him a gift in the form of an item, a link to the world of martial arts, which should help him. The master is glad to receive such a generous gift, the thousand-year-old spirit, but considers it expensive, but his interlocutors insist. Rio says that Burke can apply to the Martial Arts Association for two more years, and Burke thanks him. Spencer asks the master what he thinks about tomorrow's fight with the boy Johnson. Rio replies that this is just a boy and asks why he should be afraid. Burke replies that although the guy is not very strong, he bought a forbidden pill at an auction and can take it before the fight, then his power will increase. Master Rio exclaims that if the boy dares to take the pill, he will die in front of Burke. Spencer continues to bully his ally's teacher. Rio says not to add fuel to the fire. He understands that these two want to take revenge on him for the death of his sons. The master says that Johnson is the scum of the martial arts world. He promises that the guy will not be saved tomorrow. They say that they also wanted to ask for help in one other matter that does not concern the guy. Three strange girls come in. Spencer says that these are students from the university. He has always admired Rio so he invites him to a separate room to discuss some issues. The master chuckles lustfully and says that the current students are good students. He, as a representative of the older generation, must teach them well, especially the larger one. The next day, Michael meditates while levitating with his stone. 
The guy believes that the spiritual energy in China is less than there. But his training speed has increased. Is it really because of the stone? The stone moved. Michael does not believe that he can be alive. But he just answered. Michael says he can now call upon the power through the graveyard of rebirth. But he doesn't know what lies behind the ancient symbols. He decides that thinking here is useless and takes out coins and a turtle shell. Johnson is participating in a duel for the first time, so he decides to test his luck in this way. The shell stands up on its edge, leaving the guy confused about his immediate future, without giving precise answers. He understands that, as before, he knows nothing. The old man said that Michael is not competent enough to interfere in the affairs of heaven. At this moment Bell knocks and comes in, she says that she will lead the gentleman to a duel. Michael did not know that there were so many masters in America, and they would all come to watch the battle. And there are quite a few familiar faces, he sees the Sanders, Nick's and Jenkins families with his brother, and even the Voxes. Somewhere in the crowd the master was lost. Du and Locke, who is pretending to be Du's little brother. John thinks he will protect his lord if his life is in danger, no matter what. Onlookers notice that the three great judges are already at their workplace. God, is this really the same Master Rio? And with him two more cool masters Rio, as a member of the ministry, should strive for justice and maintain order. Bell informs Michael that these masters are among the first five hundred masters, and Rhi, according to some sources, made his way into the first three hundred. For the first time, Michael is overcome by doubts about his own strength. He is afraid that Master Rio has reached a kingdom above him. It seems that he underestimated the ancient warrior. Stark reports that in order to hold the position of judge, one needs not only strength, but also charisma and power, and also suggests keeping in mind that he is the vice president of the association. Few would dare to insult him. Bell warns him that the guy now has the opportunity to please the master. Michael is outraged. They pay attention to the second judge, Master Me. His family is very strong. If Michael has a good relationship with him, then Burke will not be able to touch him. Master Re comes on stage and asks Johnson and Burke to come up to him. The old man, baring his teeth, warns Michael that he is a corpse. The hero sighs with indifference. The audience is shocked that the insignificance of the Johnson family on the same battlefield with the master. How can he even compare with him? Master Me orders everyone to shut their mouths. He turns to the stands and angrily warns that whoever persecutes heresy and disrupts the duel process will regret it. Then he turns towards his rivals and sadly thinks that he feels sorry for such a young master who will have to end up here. Rio chants that the start of the battle means that the two are fighting to the death, however, he hopes that the loser will admit defeat and they will do without casualties. Now, standing between two rivals, he announces the start of the battle. The elder Burke bursts into flames and threatens to pay brutally for the deaths of his relatives. Michael says that now he understands everything, and the old man will join his children, and his family will go down in history. Burke launches a furious and rapid attack with name-calling towards Johnson. Michael jumps away from the blow and says with satisfaction that he cannot be defeated with such a rude technique. Burke sends ten of his fists into the air in Johnson's direction. Michael blocks both hands and another of his essence stands behind him and says that the enemy is just a turtle. Onlookers notice that Master Burke is rapidly losing control of the situation. Burke, upset that the battle did not end immediately, yells at Michael that he is a degenerate and only knows how to dodge. Michael with an angry face says that he can play with the master for a long time, but he wants to see what kind of crappy family these Burks are. From these words, the master flares up in streams of strong blue flame. His eyes glow and he wishes the enemy to die. Johnson and Burke meet with their fists filled with millions of particles of magical energy. Michael smiles maliciously and notices that his opponent is weaker than he thought. Michael's fist knocks back the enraged enemy, who is in a state of shock and falls onto the battlefield. The judges notice that Burke trained for so long and fell under the blow of the boy. How is this possible? Bell exclaims admiringly about Johnson's strength. Locke smiles contentedly and thinks that Michael really deserves to be called a ruler. The main character tells Burke that, having such power, he allows himself to be defeated by the younger ones. His family definitely deserves death. Burke, in a cold sweat, says that he did not want to use his special technique. But Michael leaves no choice, and the old man rushes to attack. Michael feels the familiar power of strong cultivation. As soon as this art is applied, great damage is caused to the internal organs 
Now the guy understands why the old man was talking about retribution. The judges notice that a blow of such force is inevitable death. Burke flies at the guy. His force field creates the shape of a palm. Michael notices that this is not a technique, but a pathetic trick. The master crashes into Johnson, going deep into the ground with him. A bright column of light shoots out of the hole. Bell and John are very worried about their friend, and Lucy is happy that finally something could kill her enemy. Spencer is angry that Michael doesn't deserve such an easy death, and he feels sorry for the Burke family. When the smoke leaves the site of the impact, everyone notices the living Michael and the body of the master. Spencer only says that this cannot be. Judge Rio is completely shocked. He notices that the guy didn't even have time to accumulate energy. He understands that Michael simply put his fist under Burke's rapid attack, but does not know how he was able to break through such power and fight back. Judge Rio himself flies up to the guy in a murderous attack and says that the fight is over. But if the guy wants to die, then first he needs to defeat him. Michael does not understand why the judge, who stood for justice, did not stop the fatal attack on Berku. The guy reports that the old man is not the only one who will die today. A dog named Rio will go after him. Spencer sneaks up behind Johnson while he is distracted by Master Rio. He makes a dishonest attack from behind on an unsuspecting guy. Locke shouts for the Lord to turn around. He did not expect that they would flout the rules so vilely. Spencer's sneaky strike is successful and breaks through Michael's flank defense. Now, the opponent is about to strike to the head, but the guy is already preparing his counterattack. Michael knocks the crap out with one punch, leaving his opponent's attack ineffective, yelling at Spencer that he's an old bastard who likes to attack on the sly. He says that he will send him to the next world, and then inflicts a series of magical blows. Michael, in a state of bloody rage, continues to strike repeatedly. The other judges understand that he just like that, in an instant, defeated the head of the Spencer family, who was ranked 514th in America. Master Rio can't believe his eyes, Spencer is torn apart, he wonders what kind of technique Johnson used. Burke begs the master for help, because Johnson can destroy him too. Rio seriously says that as long as he is here, the kid will never dare to kill him. The last Burke is instantly overtaken by an energy blow to the forehead, Rio is in shock. Michael says that even if Jesus himself had come to his aid, he would not have been saved. Michael clearly provokes Rio, saying that he didn't seem to want the murders. The other judges are baffled by Johnson's boundless arrogance. Rio asks why he killed Burke if the outcome was already a foregone conclusion, and he says that since he took someone's side and thinks he can kill him on the sly, then he's a shitty old dog. Master Rio blazes with multicolored flames and shouts in rage that the guy is tired of living. Michael says that only Rio will die today if, of course, he dares to challenge. All of Johnson's friends understand that the guy's words are deadly to himself, that you can't talk to Master Rio like that, and that Michael is no longer a tenant at all. The master concentrates a sea of energy in his palm. Michael notices that this one is smarter than the previous ones. Michael does not get lost and blazes with magic, concentrating all his energy. Master Me stands in the middle of the two fighters, he orders them to stop. He resents Master Rio's ardor towards the younger master's threats. Rio sternly says that the guy kills everyone indiscriminately, and doesn't respect the judge, shouldn't he take his life. The second judge explains that Michael acted within the rules, Spencer attacked on the sly, he broke the rules, he should have been killed. Me, pointing at Rio, asks why he intervened in the battle, since he is quite capable of taking care of himself. Master Rio wonders if Me really thinks that he can contradict him. And since he so wants to protect this child, then there will be a conversation with the president. He says that Johnson has nothing to do with the Me family, and therefore he can calmly kill him. Is he sure that he still wants to protect him? Me thinks about how best to get out of this situation. Michael calmly asks if he is finished. Master Me asks Johnson if he would like to join the family. Rio stands in shock. The whole audience is delighted. No one understands how this happened but it seems that there is a new addition to the Mi family. Lucy regrets that she missed that chance in the form of young Johnson. Rio shouts that accepting such a bloodthirsty killer into the family is a very reckless act. In his head, the master thinks that there is nothing he can do if Michael accepts the invitation. Johnson wonders who this member of the Mi family is now, and whether anyone has messed up anything, leaving everyone in shock. Mi hints that only this will save the guy's life, but he says that he doesn't need to be saved. 
Michael apologizes and arrogantly says that starting a family is not part of his plans while the gentleman with the last name Rio is still alive. Lucy calms down and is glad that she still refused him then. You can't make a wall out of mud. Me sadly tells Johnson to take responsibility for his life now that he is ready. Me sadly says that, unfortunately, young people make mistakes. Rio angrily says that he has never seen such an arrogant person. Michael himself deprived himself of his chance of survival. Johnson says that his opponent is a fool, and thanks to me, he was able to live an extra couple of minutes. Leslie and John are shocked by what is happening in the arena and do not know what to do. Master Rio is full of rage and says that it will take no more than three blows to kill the boy. Michael calmly notices that the master has concentrated frantic energy between his fingers. The entire field is permeated with the destructive energy of Judge Rio. Michael thinks that his opponent really isn't as bad of a fighter as the other two. Johnson grins a terrifying smile and wants to feel the power of Rio to find out who is in the top 400 masters. The judge notices that Rio uses the ancient technique of breathing a thousand blades. Not everyone can do it, but Michael easily dodges the blows. Johnson considers this a good move, but since he is still alive, everything is not so successful. Michael launches a counterattack. Master Rio understands that there really is something in the guy. It is not surprising that Burke lost. Rio wraps his magic nets around Michael's knee and shouts that the bird will soon be in the cage. Rio is incredibly happy about the hit, but Johnson understands that all is not lost for him. The master delivers an unexpected blow. A beam of light is knocked out of the hero, throwing him upward. Rio is furious that this blow did not kill Michael on the spot. Anyone else would have already been torn in half. Me doubts that with Rio's enhanced technique the hero has any chance, since he is severely wounded, even if he is alive. Johnson thinks that although he has an advantage in cultivation, it is still difficult to face such a strong warrior in such an intense battle. Michael takes out the crystal with the rebirth cemetery, and says that this is all that remains. Black power envelopes Michael, and Master Rio understands that he must act faster. Unexpectedly, Michael finds himself in a rebirth cemetery inside a crystal. The spirit of Claude Crank, whom the hero wanted to summon, flies out of the grave. He is interested in how he took possession of the cemetery at such a low level. Michael wonders if it is really Claude and thinks that he feels insignificant in comparison with him. Crank understands that Johnson thought that a hundred warriors were buried here, but among them only one remained. The spirit wonders if he is better than those who could have been in his place. Michael does not understand what this guy is talking about. Claude decides to give Michael as much knowledge as he wants, since the guy was able to subjugate the cemetery of rebirth. His inheritance will not sink into oblivion, and the aura of the outside world is too weak and his presence here is too limited. Johnson again finds himself on the battlefield, where Master Rio flies towards him in a swift attack. Michael laughs at Rio, calling him a non-entity, and creates some kind of shield with his fingers. The master does not understand how Johnson was able to stop his blow with all his might with one finger. Rio flies away from the protagonist, the last of the strength knocked out by young Johnson oozing from his body. A moment later, Michael stands over the body of his opponent, who raises his head and is indignant that the guy did the impossible and does not understand how he did it. Johnson explains to his opponent that he noticed that the master could not control himself in moments of rage and the guy himself simply followed his own technique and caused Rio's true energy to dissipate. Michael raises his fist filled with power and proclaims that now it's time to end it all. Master Rio, in tears, does not understand how someone can use their magical energy to such an extent. The judges are shocked, they wonder what kind of deity this guy is and who can even concentrate true power in this way. The master thinks that the gap between him and the guy is like between a mountain and sand. He really doesn't want to die. Rio begins to beg the guy to save his life, says that the devil has misled him, he was mistaken and is even ready to become his slave. Michael, not allowing the master to finish, erases him from the face of the earth. Now in its place is a pillar of blue glow, going far upward. Johnson looks at the pillar with a deadly gaze and says that such a non-entity is not worthy to become his slave. The public does not believe what happened. Everyone sits in a cold sweat and shouts questions to which they already know the answers. They simply do not want to admit it. Nick's Jr. asks his father why they didn't know about the existence of such a guy before and says that he had the feeling that he was not human. His father completely agrees with him. 
Locke does not know how the master managed to reach such a level. He believes that Johnson should be included in the history of American martial arts. John decides that he must keep up with the master, be a match for him. The third judge asks the second if Michael is really an ancient warrior, since he feels that something is wrong, and he tells him that it looks like Johnson really is not so simple. Apparently he is a cultivator. The master reports that he has heard of such things, but does not understand how this can be. He wonders whether cultivators who destroy heaven and earth even exist. Me notes that Johnson has made too much noise and if this becomes known, he will become an enemy to the entire martial arts world. He says that the big players will not tolerate force that does not obey the laws. According to this, a strong man from the association should have watched the battle from the shadows. If he left the battlefield, the news would spread, and the entire power would turn against Johnson. This man in the crowd says that Michael will die for killing the vice president of the Martial Arts Association. The main character notices this man and asks his strength, Claude, if he is an accomplice, this is Master Rio. That guy realizes that he was noticed and wants to run away, but Michael is already directing a powerful stream of his magical energy at him. He falls dead, and people around ask what happened and why the man vomited blood. Johnson stands on the battlefield with the spirit of Claude, who ecstatically states that he was able to kill a man thousands of miles away. There is nothing wrong with killing. Michael is worried that his friend is causing a lot of problems, and now they have become a target for some people to which Krunk asks permission to change the memories of these people. Johnson is shocked that this is possible. Claude informs him that he needs to use true force to delve into the brains of everyone present. The spirit says that there will still be someone who will follow them and ruin everything for everyone. But the memory still needs to be changed, and the guy himself now needs to improve in order to quickly see the power of the second tombstone. Johnson allows Crank to do whatever he wants with everyone, but not touch Locke and his spirit warns him that there is one person who worries him, and after everything he wants to talk to him. Claude, with the help of Michael's body, sends a beam of light into the heads of everyone present. John does not understand what is happening around him. In addition to Locke, the beam also does not hit the head of Master Me, who, looking around, also does not understand what is happening. The spirit of Crank stands before the Master and tells him that for him there is a choice, devotion or Claude, me can either forget everything that happened here, or continue to remain a non-entity. Me notices Johnson standing behind him, but realizes that it is not he who is talking to him, but something higher. Weighing the pros and cons, the master decides to become a servant of the spirit, and kneels before Michael. Crunk directs a beam at Me's head and warns him that once he turns his back on him, the true power will tear the master apart from the inside. The spirit tells Johnson that he has some more time, and they need to find a quiet place to finish one last job. Michael leaves in spirit, calling for Master Me, who is still on his knees. At Johnson's estate, the guy himself and Claude's spirit are sitting in a secret room where no one can disturb them. Crank notices that Michael has many doubts in his soul, but the spirit does not have much time to resolve them. Johnson, with a serious face, asks Claude why he is imprisoned in stone, and why he is helping him. The spirit reports that, firstly, they are imprisoned not in stone, but in the cemetery of rebirth. It just so happened that the cemetery is in stone. And secondly, the cemetery chose Michael, and now he is the master of rebirth who rules the world. Claude says that the only thing they can do for the guy is to help him overcome all obstacles and become immortal. Michael asks another question. He wonders how to summon the remaining 99 tombstones. Krunk says that to do this, the guy needs to be strong enough to convince other spirits that he is worthy then he can summon them. Claude offers another option, saying that we can try to interest them in something, and the spirit also sadly reports that he is the weakest in the cemetery. Michael is shocked by what he heard. He thinks about the power of the cemetery, and realizes that it is probably capable of splitting the void and destroying the stars. The spirit says that he only has an hour left, and plans to teach Michael everything he knows. They start the lesson, the guy sits in a meditation pose, Many images related to martial arts flash in his head. The spirit says that in order to reincarnate, Michael needs to have a hundred powerful forces under his control. He wants to convey his experience to the world and asks to call him a teacher. Claude complains that he doesn't like this life, but really hopes that he and Johnson will meet again, after which the teacher disappears. The main character's head is filled with various thoughts that he cannot understand. 
he understands that he has reached the ninth level of the kingdom of enlightenment, notices that the power is not released, but only intensifies, the guy is happy that he was able to improve in this way. Michael throws his arms up, his power shaking everything around him, he screams about the kingdom of movement that he was able to enter. People on the street think there has been an earthquake, they even want to call the police. Johnson feels like a superman, he can now crush anyone, and more importantly, he sensed the appearance of a new grave in the rebirth cemetery, and if he becomes stronger, he will be able to summon it. Then the guy's phone rings. It turns out to be Jessica. She asks where Michael is now. He says that he's at home. The girl, in a panic, reports that she is about to have enough convulsions, saying that an earthquake just happened near the house, and wondering how Michael could not have felt it. Jessica calms down and tells the guy to hurry up to Sarah, because today is her birthday. The guy who completely forgot about the holiday, says that it will be soon. Leslie tells his boss what he saw yesterday, saying that he remembers how Johnson killed Burke and Spencer, but he does not understand at all how Master Rio was killed. The guy himself only saw his torn body. The boss considers this circumstance very strange and asks for a more detailed story, and is also surprised at the power of the main character. Clinton tries to remember but realizes that his memories seem to be blocked and impossible to respond. Only vague outlines appear. The boss understands that we are talking about erasing memory. He flies up from his place in shock, shouting something about psychics. He asks his subordinate if he was wearing these clothes yesterday, and having received a positive answer, he orders Leslie to quickly take off his pants. He says that he is not like that, but the boss stops his stupid thoughts saying that he needs a belt that contains a video recording device. Clinton, connecting this complex device to a computer, admired the genius of his boss. They look at the recording, the boss, seeing Michael's abilities, says that he is simply not a person, he is scared from the understanding that only the first 50 masters are capable of this. He thinks about the fact that Johnson is only a little over 20, the first 50 masters, old men who devoted their entire lives to their strength. These are two completely different ideas that do not fit together in the man's head. Leslie informs the boss that, judging by this recording, their Order of the Dragon is unlikely to be able to resist the powerful Johnson. The boss warns Clinton that he should not tell anyone what he just saw, and if the guy spills the beans, he himself will accuse him of treason. The warden also realizes that anyone who witnessed yesterday's massacre could have had a similar recording device so he instructs Leslie to check everyone and get rid of all recordings using any means necessary. He also orders a plane to be prepared for him. He immediately flies to an unknown high-ranking gentleman in another city. Jessica is at the Walsh house for a birthday party and notices influential people everywhere that she had previously only seen on TV. Sarah angrily asks her friend where Michael is. She replies that she just talked to him. He will be there soon. The birthday girl is unhappy since the guy did not come himself and he had to be reminded about the holiday. The girl's mother intervenes in the conversation, saying that an important guest has arrived, and they should personally greet him and get to know him better. This guest turns out to be martial arts master Nick Board from the family of Sarah's future husband. Megan tells her daughter that their family really needs the protection of some strong master, and Nick is just one of those, he is in the top 600 in America. The Walshes express that they are very glad that such a gentleman has come. He says that he is sorry that his young master could not be present in person and invites Sarah to meet him at their house after the banquet. The girl politely refuses the invitation, citing numerous concerns, and offers to reschedule the meeting for another time. All the guests are shocked by the younger Walsh's refusal, because their contracted marriage with Board has not yet taken place, and there is no need to irritate a wealthy and influential family. Megan tries to tell everyone that her daughter was just joking, but Sarah persistently tells her mother that she will not be in this house for long, and will never be Derek Board's wife. The master understands that his master will not accept refusal, and therefore, the consequences will not be long in coming. Master Me appears at the party, telling Nick that he has great power. Megan is shocked by his arrival, because he refused the invitation. He says with a smile that he is glad to be here and congratulates the young girl on her birthday. All the guests are confused, since the Mi family usually does not interact with other families. Someone asks the question why he came then. Mi speaks out that it is better for Sarah not to stay in this province for a long time, to which Nick reacts sharply, saying that in fact Walsh will soon join the Board family. 
The master asks Nick not to rush to conclusions, but he thinks that Mi is too arrogant. His family is no longer as powerful as ten centuries ago. Mi says that he understands that the Bored family is grander than his family, but in this house he is the representative, and Nick is just the Bored dog. Nick furiously directs his energy at the other master, but Mi stops the attack. The attacker decides to simply walk away from this conversation, saying that they will meet again. Megan approaches the master and asks him what's wrong with Johnson, because Mi is the judge of yesterday's duel. Sarah runs up to her mother and asks what kind of duel this is, and she replies that Michael himself is to blame. He accepted Burke's challenge and paid for it. The young girl is very worried about her friend and asks the master if he is alive. Then, to her relief, the guy himself appears and wonders why people are already talking about him, since he just came in. Megan can't believe his eyes, seeing Johnson alive and unharmed, because two great ancient warriors had a grudge against him. How did they admit that he was still alive? Master Me bends his knee in front of the main character, warmly greeting him and calling him Master. Everyone around is shocked by such a gesture from the great and venerable Master. Megan believes that his family will be furious if they find out what Me did. Sarah, with her eyes lighting up, thinks that with such support Michael will be able to protect her from the terrible bored family. She believes that the guy has a promising future. Nick, looking at Sarah and seeing with what eyes she looks at Johnson, concludes that the girl is in love with him. Michael asks me to get up from her knees, because the guy has already attracted too much attention to himself, which should go to the birthday girl. Johnson, spreading his arms for a hug, approaches the girl apologizes for being late and hopes that she is not offended. Sarah defiantly puffs out her cheeks and says that she will be angry if the guy does not give her a worthy gift. The main character pats his pocket with a smug smile, saying that there is a gift there, and the girl will definitely like it. The other guests are unhappy with the behavior of this narcissistic guy, who believes that his gift will be the best. Then Megan takes the girl, interrupting their nice conversation with the guy, and says that it's time for them to go on stage. Three women of the Walsh generation are on stage. Megan begins her speech, thanking everyone present for coming to congratulate her little girl, with a special thank you to the Bored family. Michael notices Sarah's good-looking grandmother, and Jessica tells him that this family respects their elders with dignity. The girl asks the guy where he was for half a day, saying that she was looking for him everywhere, to which Johnson says that he was solving minor troubles. Nightingale notices that the gift-giving ceremony has begun on stage and a man has already come out to congratulate Sarah. He gives the birthday girl an imperial jade, announcing its value at $50 million. Discussions immediately begin among the other guests. Everyone criticizes such a gift, because the Walsh family is already rich, and they don't need such an ugly figurine. Jessica draws attention to her gift, for which she immediately feels ashamed. Michael supports the girl, saying that Sarah values attention, not money. The girl decides to go give it next, because the longer she hesitates, the less she wants to give this box, she wants to get rid of it quickly. Sarah meets her, laughingly says that she will not forgive her best friend for a bad gift, and she reports that it is inexpensive, but from the bottom of her heart. The gift turns out to be a small copy of their house, where you can see their figures in the window. Jessica reports that she made it with her own hands. Sarah is delighted with the gift and looks through the small window to get a closer look. The joyful girl hugs her friend telling her that she is wonderful and she loves her to death. Jessica laughs and asks her to keep her gift carefully. Master Me is touched by their sisterhood and decides to give his gift next. Me gives the girl a jade order from his family, which shocks everyone present, and he also wishes the girl all her wishes come true. Megan understands that with the help of this order it is possible to obtain protection from the Me family. She asks to take the gift, since her family will not be able to accept such value. The master reports that his gift is nothing compared to the relationship between Sarah and Michael. He hopes to soon attend their wedding, where he will present a much better gift, leaving the girl confused. Doubts arise in the crowd. Everyone calls this a confrontation, because Sarah has a wedding contract with the Bored family. An enraged Nick quickly appears near me, warning him that he is now in such a situation that no one will save him. The master just laughs. Nick turns to Sarah and gives her the Bored family order saying that this amulet is better than the one me gave, and also says that he has another gift for the girl. He takes out a box with a magic pill, saying that if a person who does not practice martial arts takes this pill, he will immediately become a master 
and reach the highest realm. In the crowd, everyone is whispering, talking about the power of the boards and realizing that the pill has eclipsed all their gifts. They discuss that such a family can easily afford such gifts. Megan quickly flies up to Nick and says that she will gladly accept such a gift for her daughter, and hopes that one day their family will be able to return the favor. Be Michael knocks the amulet and pill out of Master Board's hands, and with a displeased face asks how he can give Sarah such garbage. Nick flares up in rage. His energy fills the entire space around him. He tells the guy that he does not dare spoil the gift of young Board and now he is a corpse. Johnson reports that such expired pills will only give Sarah a stomach ache, and if Nick wants to take normal medicine, it's better to contact him himself, and the guy hands the master a handful of pills. The guests are shocked, they smell an amazing smell and notice an engraving on the pills, which convinces them that the pills are indeed of the best quality. Megan understands how much she underestimated Michael, he is not only an amazing master, but he also gets his pills from somewhere and they are also of such quality that Borda's pill is real trash compared to this one. The protagonist pours a handful of pills into the shocked Sarah's hands, telling her not to hesitate. Then he says that this is just an addition to the main gift and hands her the box, saying that if she doesn't like it, then he's ready to do her and Jessica's laundry for a year. The girl unties the ribbon on the gift and warns the guy that she is very picky. The box contains the very necklace that her grandfather once wanted to give her, the girl is delighted. The guests present laugh at Johnson's gift, saying that they expected more from him. Sarah cries with happiness and looks at Michael, thanking him for being able to return the necklace. The girl shows the gift to her surprised grandmother, and she confirms that this is the same tier of stars necklace that her grandfather made for her. Sarah warmly thanks the guy, saying that this is the best gift. Michael exhales exaggeratedly glad that he won't have to do the girl's laundry. The inspired girl rushes to the guy and kisses him on the cheek. Michael is very surprised. The crowd is indignant at how one of the first three beauties of New York, a girl ideal in all respects, could fall in love with such a guy. And the guests also notice that she is the bride of the young board, and this act entails treason. Nick is furious. He is irritated by the girl's action, rushes at her with insults, and raises his hand. Young Johnson stands up for the girl, catches the master's hand and tells him that he has crossed the line. Nick insults the guy, and he gives him such a powerful slap in the face that Bored, spinning, flies to the other end of the hall and hits the tables. Nick calls the guy a bastard, reminding him what kind of family he comes from. Michael flares up, and a rage overtakes the already lying master, puts his foot on the man's chest and asks him what's wrong with their family. Those present are amazed by the guy's behavior. They don't understand how he can afford to talk to Bored like that, and they think about what would happen if the head of their family arrived now. Michael says that Nick was lucky today. If it weren't for Sarah's birthday, he would have killed him. But now, he just doesn't want to stain the room with blood. Bored can't stand it and tries to hit the guy, but he uses his strength to throw him out of the house. A dissatisfied Nick threatens Michael with his master, to whom he will now report everything and then Johnson will be ground into powder. Johnson orders Mr. Me to get rid of the Board family's dogs, because he is a great professional in this matter. Me quickly leaves to complete the task. People in the area do not understand how the gentleman agreed to do the dirty work for the guy. This will lead to a decline in the status of his family. Megan talks about what a powerful and strong young man Michael is. She already believes that he is not such a bad candidate for her daughter, so she calls him over. The girl's mother offers to pour tea which is made especially for their family, there will be no more chance. Michael says that he did not expect that she would serve him herself. She laughs that he is afraid that she will poison him. The guy laughs, saying that no poison will kill him. No. She tells the guy that she underestimated him before, admits that he is full of surprises and quite an impressive young man. Michael wonders if this is the only reason he was called. The woman says no and informs her of her daughter's engagement. Johnson asks in surprise why he hasn't heard this before. Megan says that the engagement was planned a long time ago, but it was necessary because their family is strong only from the economic side and they need the support of martial artists. The mother continues, saying that they have several masters, but this is not enough. Sarah's father talked to many families, but only the boards agreed, this is their last hope. She admits that the guy has a reason to hate her but asks him to understand that everything she did was to protect the family, then suggests the guy give up her daughter, 
since the boards will take revenge. Megan also warns the guy that revenge awaits him from the boards in any case. Help can only be expected from the Nixes and me. She sincerely repents of past mistakes and asks the guy to go somewhere far away before the boards find out about him, saying that this is the only way to stay alive. Johnson, with an indignant face, asks if the board family is really so powerful, if he is stronger than the Martial Arts Association. Megan explains to the guy that these are two completely different concepts that cannot be compared, but as far as influence is concerned, the association is much more powerful than the boards. Michael thanks Walsh for the information and leaves, she offers to give him a private jet. Johnson says that no one will force him to kneel, and since the board family hurt him, he sees nothing wrong with getting rid of her once and for all. The main character, sitting at home, realizes that he has been too tired lately and decides to get some sleep today. Then Jessica comes to him, who says that Sarah will not come to spend the night today. The girl wants to discuss what happened with the guy. Nightingale asks what Michael thought of Walsh's kiss, and the guy, breaking out in a cold sweat, says that it wasn't that bad, then quickly corrects himself and says that it wasn't anything special. Jessica kisses Johnson sharply on the lips and asks if she's better than Sarah. Michael replies that he cannot judge fairly, since the girls kissed him in different places and invite Jessica to kiss him on the cheek. The girl gets angry, attacks the guy and demands to answer her question, to which he says that, of course, she is. Michael realizes that praising another girl in front of Jessica would be too stupid. Nightingale laughs, she tells the guy that she doesn't know whether he's deceiving her or not, but she decided to conquer him today. The guy turns the girl over, saying that he won't let her tower over him. Then his phone rings, which he instantly burns through with his power. The guy is very dissatisfied that someone dared to interrupt them. He, very excited, invites the girl to continue what she started. At this moment, the second phone rings. Michael is furious and is about to destroy it too, and Jessica catches his hand and shouts that it is her phone. And Johnson, with an extremely dissatisfied expression on his face, says that next time he will just buy her a new one. The girl says that Clark called and since he called both of them, the matter is clearly very serious. Michael, very upset, thinks that he missed such a great chance. The guy answers the phone on Jessica's phone and asks Clark what happened. Robert says that things are very bad. Someone stole the recipe for their drug. A guy and a man stand sadly near a safe that has been torn to pieces. Michael demands an explanation. Robert says that around 8 o'clock in the evening, a group of men broke into the company building, killed several bodyguards and stole the recipe and other important resources. Johnson thinks that no one could destroy the safe, because he sealed it himself, which means it was broken into with a fake key. Michael concludes that these are not ordinary robbers, because the bodyguards are Locke's subordinates. They are professionals who fought side by side with the governor. Why did they die so easily? Clark asks to punish him for losing the recipe, because the mole in the company was his subordinate, but Johnson says that it doesn't matter anymore. Now is not the time to shift the blame to others, he invites Robert to go check on the victims. Michael, when examining the bodies, notices that they were all tortured before death, and especially cruelly. Clark asks what to do with the stolen recipe. Johnson says that he can always write a new one, but people's lives cannot be returned. The guy asks if they checked the recordings from the cameras. Clark says that they were disabled, but people are trying to restore the data. Michael suggests looking for clues in other places and also tells Robert to transfer 10 million each to the families of the victims. Clark notes that Johnson truly values every person in his company. Michael notices that one of the dead has a fist clenched. He bends down to unclench it. The guy takes out the family coat of arms. He realizes that before his death, Locke's people left them a clue. Someone calls Leslie. He picks up and asks where they got his number, but it turns out to be Johnson. He says that he borrowed Clark's phone to call. The guy sends a photo of the family coat of arms and asks for help in identifying it. Clinton recognizes this as the coat of arms of Akita. Michael asks again in confusion. Leslie reports that Akita is a foreign mafia organization. They even tried to penetrate America. The head of the mafia is named Alex Bay. He himself claims to be immortal and has 100,000 students. In his native country, everyone reveres him like a god in the flesh. Clinton reports that he has already dealt with them. They were able to drive them away, but then they lost seven people. Members of the mafia are not to be joked with, and recently information has appeared about a group of foreigners. Probably this is Akita. 
Leslie knows that they are staying at the same hotel. Michael asks to send him the address of this place. Leslie immediately agrees. Clark asks if Johnson is going to Akita. He says that they could live happily in their own country. But since they decided to come all this way to get here, then he will send them to hell at his own expense. The members of Akita discuss among themselves the results of the previous operation. Each takes his place. Only the mole stands in the middle of the hall. The big guy says that he didn't think that the operation could be so successful, as if God had helped. The second one notes that God only helps the simple. Alex Bay helps them. The traitor is interested in what will happen to him and their agreement. They say that they will definitely transfer money to his Japanese account and also make citizenship for him. He asks to receive part of the money now because he urgently needs to fly away since he betrayed the Tazen group. The goon knocks the spy to the floor and asks who he thinks he is and does he really think they're lying. Ambao says that they still won't give him money, but he has made a huge contribution to the future of the nation. He believes that there is no longer any point in leaving him alive, and therefore it is time to finally deal with him, and he begs to be left alive. The giant says that Americans are pathetic and deserve to die. Michael appears and says that the man who kneels is pathetic. America has nothing to do with it. He also says with a smug smile that these guys aren't worth even insects. The mafia is shocked that this guy climbed onto the 18th floor through the window. A former company employee asks Johnson to save him, and quickly. The elder orders Michael's limbs to be cut off and brought to him. The whole gang rushes forward. Michael teleports behind the leader and suddenly asks who is in charge. The big guy tenses up, and Johnson says that it doesn't matter, because they're all going to die today anyway. Michael grabs the giant by the teeth and says that he seems to think he's tough but he's just a fat guy, and then rips out all of his top teeth. The smarter representative of the mafia says to be careful, because this Brad is a martial artist. Johnson effortlessly grabs the prone leader and throws him into the rest of the crowd of thugs, sending them flying far away. Another guy frantically thinks about how the guy threw a 300-kilogram carcass with one hand, and then admires the power of his opponent. He watches the intense beating of his teammates and continues to admire the skill of his enemy. He has never had the opportunity to meet such in America. Extremely bold, he says that he is one of the owners of the ancient art of using the sword in the Akita style, and he will condescend to take his life. Michael grins angrily and orders him to shut up, and also wonders if he killed his people and then stole the recipe. The killer says that he killed another, but he will not allow them to meet and Michael has already managed to bend his hefty forelock with his air attack. Johnson recommends that the thug call his men's killer now or else he will experience every level of pain a person can feel. But the guy only says that he was only hit because he wasn't expecting it. He exclaims that you can't touch his hair. He orders you to stop and says that he's generally an ambassador. People like him shouldn't be touched. Michael quickly pulls out the bandit's hefty hairstyle, and he screams heartrendingly in response. Another murderer arrives, he wonders why it's so noisy here, the previous bandit asks to save him, and Michael realizes that this is the same man who dealt with his people. The maniac, with an evil smile, realizes that Johnson is here and says that it was he who really killed them, and he also asks Michael to tell him something interesting about himself. He says that Johnson's people were silent, and because he wanted to play origami, so he folded and broke their bones, it's a pity, but no one said anything. The psycho says that they protected Michael, and he came himself. It's hilarious. Michael is silently furious. He lets go of the bandit's hair and slowly heads towards the madman. The thug is glad that a leader has come. Now the American is done for. Because he is a giant with 240 centimeters tall, he has the strength and speed of a monster that contradicts his huge body. He can tear apart iron with his bare hands. He is a savage. He is a killing machine. The bandit continues to praise his leader as Michael begins the brutal execution. Michael says that centimeter by centimeter will break his bones, says that he drank radioactive waste, and then makes this tortured body rise. Then Johnson, with madness in his eyes, says that he also wants to try playing origami, but with him. Michael turns his opponent's bones into finely ground flour, the body looking like a bag of meat. The bandit with a bald head does not understand how this is possible. His leader is not even able to get up. He wonders who this man is. While the master's body flies past, Johnson says that it is his turn, and he hints that there has been some kind of misunderstanding. He is trying to agree that they will compensate for all the damage, 
and in general Akita is looking for strong Chinese for cooperation, and he is the best candidate. Michael asks about compensation, he agrees, and Johnson says that he will pay with his life and completely burns his head out. Johnson stands with his hand on fire. There are many corpses lying around, including disfigured ones, and there is also a mole sitting on his knees. The traitor begs Johnson to forgive him, that he will work for the company for free all his life. He is a graduate of Harvard University. He will definitely be useful. He once again asks to be allowed to make amends. Michael kicks the rat in the stomach, knocking him away, and also asks how he plans to return people's lives, and he replies that there is no way. Johnson says that he will not kill him, he would rather bear the burden of the deaths of those people. He is one of the founders of the Tazen group. How low he has fallen, he has become just a piece of shit. Michael decides it's time to call Locke to clean things up. A gloomy fog emerges from a dead, disfigured body. Michael does not understand how he can even be alive, and the fog says that everyone is dead and laughs. Johnson realizes that he is still a corpse. He is just being controlled. The spirit of Alex Bay appears. He wonders if the guy knows what happens to those who cross Akita's path. Michael asks who he is and suddenly sees that someone has such a secret technique in Japan. The spirit asks him to give his name. Called his daddy Johnson, he shoots concentrated energy from his finger, vaporizing Bay telling him to know his place. Michael says that if they sneak into America again, he will kill everyone. Japan, Alex's soul returns to his body, which sits in the middle of a large hall with the family crest. The man says that Michael will pay for his treachery, and then spits blood from the damage received. Meeting at the Tazen group, Michael returns the lost documents. He asks what they have to say about this. They say that Michael was able to get the documents in a short time, but for some reason they are in the blood. Johnson says that if someone is not satisfied with something, he can leave the company. Because if someone betrays him, he promises that the consequences will be extremely severe. The guy is already at Jessica's house, she says that he is already here, but is still thinking about work, he regrets it. He says that if he had chosen his employees more carefully, this would not have happened, she says that he needs to stop blaming himself for this. Michael says that this is not enough and pulls the girl in, and then kisses her. The stairs to the bedroom. A lot of things are scattered on it, mainly underwear. They lie in bed. Jessica gently hugs Michael, and he smiles sweetly. Michael asks if the girl is in pain after the night's adventure, and she replies that she is not in pain after he healed her. He says that she shouldn't exhaust herself. Next time he will move because it's easier for him. The girl denies sharply but sweetly. Because she must dominate, Michael giggles sweetly. She asks permission to tell him a secret but only if he tells her his own in return, he agrees. Jessica says, blushing deeply, that she loved him five years ago. She is very glad that he finally returned, Michael reciprocates. She later found out what happened to his family. She is angry that she cannot do anything, and also says that she is weak. Even now she will only be a burden for him. But the girl says that she likes to cook dinner for him. Even though he cooks better, she just likes to do it and spend time with him. That's why she wanted to become his first woman, so that he would remember her all his life. He, gently pressing the girl to him and kissing her hair, tells her not to worry that someone will one day take her place. Michael asks what she wanted to know about him. She says that he has too many secrets, so let him choose which one to start with. He decides that he needs to talk about where he was for five years. When he fell into the lake, he was saved by an old man. He led Johnson to a place called the Appalachian Hollows which is deep in the Appalachian Mountains. There is a place where martial artists are not limited by anything and do whatever they please. There was only one rule, the strongest survives, and he spent five years of difficult trials there. Fascinated by Michael, Jessica asks a very strange question. She wonders if he might someday take her there. She wants to know more about the places where he has been. Johnson wonders if it's too dangerous for him to guarantee his own safety, let alone Jessica. But that's a thing of the past now that he has over a hundred magical spirits and a graveyard of rebirth. He says that when they have time, they will definitely go there on vacation. Michael offers as a reward for her to repeat the night's adventures in the morning format. The Martial Arts Association, its president Tyler White, is trying to find out who will take responsibility for the deaths of the participants. Someone stands up and says that they should blame that Brad Johnson and not them. He explains that an investigation has been carried out and they have no direct evidence. 
Tyler says that it is Johnson's identity that raises many doubts. Firstly, he became a master in too short a time, and secondly, he killed not only Burke and Spencer, but also the great Master Ree. Other members of the association agree with the words of the head. They say that eyewitnesses said that Rio seemed to be torn apart, and the arena itself was damaged. This would be possible if the guy was possessed by a demon. White doesn't understand how this is possible. Another master says that no one can really tell anything in detail, and their undercover man was killed. All this is suspicious. Tyler sends three of his best men to find out the details of Master Rio's murder. He asks them not to miss a single detail, and if they don't find anything, then let them bring Johnson to him. They cannot allow the vice president to die in vain. Clinton and the main character are standing at the base of the Dragon Squad. The guy thanks the fighter for his help yesterday, and he says that it's just his job. Michael asks why Leslie was looking for him. He replies that it was not he who was looking for him, but his boss. The boss asks Johnson to do him a favor by becoming an instructor for the Dragon Spirit Squad. He talks about the squad itself, saying that these are mysterious troops that follow the orders of only the first captain in America. They have sworn to protect the peace of the country and resolve all unusual situations. Michael doubts that he is the right person for such an important task, but the captain reassures him, assuring him that in all of America there is no more suitable candidate. The boss knows that the guy doesn't like boundaries, so he tells him to be free in his choice of training. For his part, he offers protection from the military forces for the guy's loved ones. As an example, he cites a sniper who will eliminate any danger that appears near Sarah or Jessica. He says that, of course, that's not all. He will also send masters who will be next to them and report every minor incident. Thus the dragon spirit will react immediately to the danger, and then he will inform Michael. Johnson reflects that only prominent political figures are treated this way. The guy thinks this offer is profitable. The boss understands that Michael has a lot of enemies, who, of course, are not dangerous for him. But for the girls they are very much so, the guy cannot always be near them, so they really need protection. Johnson asks what his responsibilities are. The captain explains that the guy himself chooses the training method. The longer he trains the fighters, the stronger they will be, and then the country itself will become stronger. Michael promises to justify the trust saying that for each experience from one of his trainings, fighters will be able to kill 110 enemies on the battlefield. The boss thinks that the guy is greatly exaggerating, because training yourself and training others are completely different. The main character turns to the squad and says that he is now their instructor. The fighters are not happy with the decision of their boss. They consider themselves quite powerful, and do not understand who this guy is what he thinks about himself and why their boss is humiliated in front of him so much. They begin to protest, saying that they will not trust their lives to this arrogant brat. Michael, starting to stretch his hands, invites all those who are dissatisfied to a personal fight, saying that he is not against even a collective attack. The fighters call the guy too arrogant and are not going to stoop like that and attack him in a crowd. The boss notes that since Johnson says he is ready to fight, then they have nothing to fear, let them fight. If someone defeats Michael, he will remove him from his position as an instructor. A confident fighter, he says that they will not humiliate themselves by attacking in a crowd, and to defeat the brat, he alone will be enough, and begins the attack. Michael tells the fighter to concentrate all his strength on the tips of his toes for more correct movements. But he does not listen to him, considering himself already powerful. The fighter senses Johnson's strong aura and cannot do anything with it and the main character knocks out his opponent by slamming him into the wall. The rest of the squad are shocked by the guy. Now, after he defeated a strong opponent, they realize that he is truly powerful. Johnson invites other fighters to the battlefield, saying that even their joint attack will not harm him. They rush at the hero with shouts, deciding that he is too arrogant and needs to be taught a lesson. Michael just laughs. Johnson notices that the fighters have a good understanding of combat, but decides to teach them more. With one swing of his fist, he sends all his opponents flying far away. They do not understand what is happening. All the fighters lie on the ground and sigh in pain from their injuries. And Michael remarks that it looks like victory is his. The guy is attacked by a bunch of other people, but he also easily throws them in different directions. The fighters are forced to admit that Michael is greatly superior to them, since no one can defeat him. The squad members line up in front of the guy and report to him, obeying the new instructor. 
satisfied, Johnson thinks that these guys are very good, and it will be quite easy for him to train them to the proper level. He enthusiastically invites them to learn the technique of calling the heavens. All the fighters enthusiastically agree. Michael asks them to be more patient and first decides to teach them a few simpler techniques, believing that he will make them all stronger. The main character thinks that if he manages to enlist their support, then his plans to expand power will come true. His underground forces are controlled by Locke. The company and Clark provide financial affairs. In addition to everything, he now has a dragon spirit military. Michael realizes that now he can protect his surroundings and finally gain the confidence to fight Master Torres, who took everything from him. It is very dangerous in the capital. The most powerful and wealthy families respect the families of martial artists, since they stand at the top of America and in order to compete with them, Johnson needs to develop his strength to incredible proportions. The three masters who were sent by the president of the association look at the destroyed arena. They understand that the cause was a powerful force. They cannot imagine a single master capable of this. They realize that there is some kind of master that they do not know about. One assumes that this is the work of a cultivator. Another thinks that Johnson met someone during these five years, since he himself could not kill Rio. The third says that this is all too suspicious and suggests that they simply deliver Michael to White. At Jessica's house, a guy and two girls are sitting at the table. Johnson admires the food Sarah has prepared, and Nightingale is surprised that she even knows how to cook. Walsh rejoices at the compliments, saying that during these days at home she learned a lot from her grandmother. Jessica asks the guy where he was yesterday. He replies that he went to a base whose name he doesn't remember, and now he's going to see Link and invites her to go with him. The girl is happy about the invitation, but Sarah says that they were going to go shopping, so they are busy. Michael says goodbye to the girls and goes outside, where he notices a military vehicle and a man next to it. He greets the instructor and asks where the guy is going. Johnson understands that this is a guard from the Spirit of Dragons. The main character says that he is going to the university to see a friend and asks not to call him an instructor on the street. In the dorm room, Link excitedly tells Michael that he has already completed the first level of cultivation and feels the power being born within him. Johnson hands his friend a handful of pills, warning him that he needs to take one a day, there will be discomfort, but as soon as he drinks the last one, the results will surprise him. Moresby is ablaze with his new strength and takes the pills, saying that he will definitely take them to protect his family. Michael dreams of his friend looking like the sweet boy he once knew, and not the angry man he has become with his acquired strength. On the street, Johnson is stopped by a man and asks how to get to the hostel. The guy kindly explains, but feels something is wrong. Michael doesn't have time to ask the stranger what else he wanted, as the man is already flying at the guy in attack, with his arms outstretched. Johnson dodges the killing blow by jumping up and says that he is a shameless old man. The stranger asks the guy to answer one question, calling him an arrogant boy who doesn't know his place. He asks the main character what happened in the duel, how he was able to kill Master Rio. Michael realizes that this is a master from the Martial Arts Association and calls him rubbish. He is outraged. Johnson, with a malicious smile, notices that not only his interlocutor is rubbish, but everyone who works in the association is shouting at the guy. How dare he say that? The master says that he doesn't care about the truth. He will kill this bastard today. To which Johnson delivers his magic blow, blowing off his head. The main character calls his assistant and orders him to quickly blow here to help remove the garbage. Suddenly, the phone of the murdered master rings. Michael picks it up and answers the call. At the other end of the phone someone asks how things are with the degenerate of the Johnson family says that White wants to see him alive. After a long silence, the interlocutor realizes that the master has been killed and hangs up. Michael says that he will still find ways to deal with these people. A car from the Spirit of the Dragon arrives at breakneck speed, the one that Johnson saw in the morning. A man jumps out of it and asks if everything is okay with the owner. Michael throws him the master's phone number and asks him to get through the last calls and get information about the Martial Arts Association. Johnson already sitting at home, receives the requested information. He is surprised that the association has existed for more than a hundred years. It includes over twenty families in the province. He concludes that such a rival should not be underestimated. He also learns that the president of the association has the right to rule the entire province. The current name is Tyler White, and he ranks 189 in the ranking, 
The guy concludes that he cannot be compared with Master Ryo. Michael notes that this information is two years ago, and it is difficult to imagine what place this person occupies now. Johnson realizes that he still has to deal with White, and therefore decides to train more and goes to the Cemetery of Rebirth. He chooses a grave and wants to summon the spirit, but realizes that he is not yet strong enough. The main character understands that he needs to level up as quickly as possible in order to summon this spirit. He alone cannot cope with the association. An assistant calls the guy and reports the location of the callers on the phone of the master who wanted to kill him. Michael doesn't understand why they are still there and didn't run away. The assistant warns the guy that there are two very strong masters in the hotel and offers help from the Order of Dragons, but Johnson replies that he can handle it himself and hangs up. The hero thinks about his further plan. All ideas with murders seem dangerous to him and he decides to use the power of submission that Claude's spirit gave him in order to make these masters his servants. Two masters from the association are sitting in a hotel room and do not understand why their friend has not yet contacted them. They think that he was killed, but quickly come to the conclusion that this is impossible. After some time, they realize that the master is dead, and Johnson really has some kind of strong friend. They decide to call the president of the association and report everything. As soon as one of the masters takes the phone, Michael, who has just appeared, burns it with his power, he wonders why they haven't called for help yet. One of the masters launches a throwing knife at the guy, but he turns it around at his opponent. The second master manages to knock off the knife with an iron rod, saving his friend. He tells him that Johnson is a cultivator and that he has a lot of trump cards in his pocket. They need to be careful. Michael pays attention to the rod, he likes it, he invites the master to become his slave and give him the weapon. In return, the guy promises to give him life. The masters rush at the master with shouts, saying that even though he is a cultivator, he will not defeat the two of them. Johnson dodges the attack of one and grabs the second by the arm and spins his body in the air like a tube. The one who missed tries to attack the guy from behind again. He raises his staff behind his head and jumps on Michael. The master summons a ghost spirit from the soul capture rod, black angry faces appear in the room. They attack Johnson, and at this time the master is going to break the guy's head. But Johnson catches the rod with his hands, the spirits disappear, the master does not understand how the guy managed to do this. The main character, with a malicious smile, says that he set himself up specifically to test the strength of the rod, and he had already encountered such a weapon many times. Michael hits his opponent's face with his own weapon with all his might, causing his nose to bleed. Johnson, examining the wand, states that it is indeed spiritual, activated by energy, but not as powerful as we would like. However, in good hands it can still manifest itself well. Michael punches one of the masters, causing his body to fly across the room and slam into the wall. From such a powerful throw, the member of the Martial Arts Association instantly dies. The hero approaches the second master and gives him a choice. Either he becomes his slave or goes to the next world after his friend. The master thinks about the family, understands that if he dies, the family will be in danger and decides to become a servant. He bows to Johnson and begs for mercy. Johnson says that the master made the right choice. He asks him to raise his head so that Michael can give him a drop of blood. The main character warns the slave that if he thinks about betrayal, he will instantly be incinerated. Wally F.A., who has submitted to Michael, says that he will do whatever he wants for his master. He feels Johnson's power and understands that he can get rid of him at any time. Michael needs that the association does not touch him for the next month. He orders F.A. to control this, and he is surprised at the thought that his master is going to deal with the president in such a short time. In the villa that Clark gave to Johnson, the guy sits and admires his new weapon, the staff, thinking that he has never held anything like this in his hands before. The main character imagines how in a month he will personally go to the association and deal with White personally. Someone knocks on the door. Johnson does not understand who could come to him at night. It turns out to be Belle Stark. The girl looks scared and unhealthy. She wraps herself in her clothes and asks permission to enter. Already inside, Michael wonders what happened. Maybe something is wrong with the Stark family. The girl turns her back, begins to take off her fur coat and says that the guy will understand everything when he sees it for himself. She turns out to have a jade pendant on her. Even the main character is surprised by this. He wonders where she got it from. The girl mentions that her family organizes auctions, 
and therefore she often receives unusual goods on the lots. Two days ago, a friend of my father arrived and wanted to offer it for sale. He also very much insisted that it be for sale tomorrow. Then he abruptly changed his mind and said that he would take it, but the acquaintance did not get in touch again. The father decided to go see him, but when he arrived at the family villa, only corpses remained. The girl fearfully reports that from the corpses it was clear that the killer was very strong. Not only the family died, but also everyone who crossed paths with her father's friend over the past two days, and all because of this pendant. Clark is afraid that her family is not strong enough for this, and therefore asks to take care of this artifact, and if something happens to the family, it will go to him. Michael agrees that he will do everything to keep the pendant safe, and then asks what needs to be done. The girl quickly jumps up from the couch, getting dressed, and says that the guy can use him as he wants, and the Clark family flies out of town for a while. Belle says goodbye and says that this may be their last meeting, and Johnson tells her that they will meet soon. As soon as he closed the door, Sarah and Jessica called him from behind. The girls look extremely unhappy and ask him what kind of girl it was. Why is he deceiving them in the middle of the night? Michael says his friend needed his help. It's nothing like they thought. Sarah looks into the refrigerator, and at the same time wonders whether Michael will appear at the Tazen group tomorrow. There should be a lot of reporters at the conference tomorrow. She says that tomorrow they will be promoting a new product for the company. Jessica says that tomorrow she will perform, and if Johnson doesn't come, then she will get nervous and won't be able to. The guy says that, of course, he will go to the conference and take wonderful photographs of both of them. Michael strokes Jessica on the head. She smiles sweetly and blushes slightly, looking at the guy with loving eyes. The guy holds a medallion in his hands and thinks that one of the strongest families was forced to flee with his tail between his legs. The enemy must be really strong. The young hero tries to use a jade pendant. Everything around is covered with energy the color of the medallion. Magical power flows around, and Michael realizes that this pendant can enhance his cultivation tenfold. Suddenly, a black stone appears and breaks the jade, simultaneously absorbing all its power. Even the Transfiguration Cemetery has changed a lot. Now the energy of spirits hovers around. Johnson is thinking how he can now explain that the medallion has fallen apart. He hopes that the bag of pills will fix the situation. There are a lot of people at the conference who are already familiar to Michael, and he is very happy about this. The girls, seeing that everyone has already gathered, are going to put on a performance, smiling mysteriously. They present two of their new products, these turn out to be the same longevity pills and a rejuvenating elixir, still in development. They also note that the pills can improve the physical condition of older people, they will help restore youth, and the elixir rejuvenates the skin. The public explodes when they hear this information, asking about side effects, what the test results are, and whether they are really effective. Jessica understands that their mistrust is valid and therefore says that the first few reporters will receive the product for free to try. A lot of people immediately appear among people who are willing to try the product for themselves. Journalists who receive the elixir for themselves are very pleased. Their skin became softer and younger. Jessica is sincerely glad that everyone was satisfied with the product. She says that now they know where to buy this product. Suddenly a journalist from Japanese news appears. She doubts that such a strong drug has no side effects. She asks for a sample for testing. Michael is angrily indignant that they have not yet managed to launch the product for sale, and they already want an analysis. They definitely want to make an analog of the medicine. Jessica says she cannot provide the product for analysis because it is a trade secret. The impudent reporter sarcastically notes that the composition contains many dangerous elements. They are simply afraid of the consequences. A murmur of distrust of the products arises in the crowd. Now, Visitors are no longer so confident in the quality of the goods offered. Jessica convincingly tells them that the product has passed quality control tests supervised by a government agency, so they should trust her. Sarah realizes that her friend is hosting a conference for the first time and might panic, so she decides to step in and help her. Suddenly Michael appears in the frame. He says that now he is taking matters into his own hands, and the woman wonders who he is. Sarah is overjoyed to see Johnson on stage shouting his name in gratitude, and the guy says he can allay concerns about the safety of the drugs. The woman persistently asks for the recipe, and Johnson repeats that they have passed government testing, and if she demands so, then she just wants to create an analog. 
The reporter flies into a rage. She says that she doesn't care, and in general, all the people who have become so dramatically younger are just specially hired actors. Such a means simply cannot exist. The woman grimaces and says that only the recipe will prove it to her, and she also provokes the guy to hit her. Michael is not at a loss, coats his brush with the miracle remedy, and slaps the woman in the face. Jessica and the victim herself are in shock, but he ironically reports that he did not hit her, but simply gave her a try. The woman enthusiastically notices the changes that have occurred in the part of her face that was touched by the medicine. It has gotten rid of wrinkles and now looks young again. All the other journalists notice these impossible changes and start taking pictures, saying that this should be on the covers. The woman asks what she should do with the second part of her face. Michael says that he has no idea, and that it even suits her. Also, the guy with a malicious smile claims that he gave her the whole half of his beautiful face for free. He says that if they are interested in the place of sales, then first they will begin in America. And after a month in other countries except Japan, the drugs will never appear there. Spectators shout that this is real racism, and it also violates the law on fair competition. Johnson taunts the audience, and says that only he decides where to sell the goods, and also asks to take out the scandalous journalist. Michael says with a smile that he said everything he wanted, and then leaves, telling Jessica to continue. Clark warns that if they don't enter the Japanese market, they will be shown in a bad light. Johnson says he doesn't care, but they will be confident in the quality of their product. Robert agrees. Sarah says that the province is unsettled, and the newspapers write that a private plane recently exploded, and Michael asks again with slight excitement. Johnson calls Little Dan and asks the special forces to find out information about the recent incident with the plane, and immediately asks to take him to the Starks. Michael and his employee get to the Stark house, he smells a very strong smell of blood and decides to knock down the door. Inside there is only a pile of corpses that were once members of the Stark family. This horrifies even Johnson, who is not so easily surprised. Michael notices that they acted extremely cruelly and slaughtered the entire family. Little John informs Johnson about the results of the investigation. The bodies of Belle and her father were not found on the plane. They must have suspected something. But soon the father's body was found. All his bones were broken as a result of the struggle. Michael breaks the pendant again and realizes that Belle gave it to him, which means he can use it for the search spell. Magic in order to find someone only indicates that she is somewhere on the reefs, but where is not clear. Belle lies in front of some unknown warrior with a large sword, in a fur coat and horns. He clearly has bad intentions. In front of the girl stands a huge man in a scary mask and with a padlock on his pants. He wonders if a family like the Starks dares to challenge him. Fred Wood, there is a way out only if she gives him the pendant. The man grabs her by the neck and threatens to twist her if she doesn't tell her where the jade pendant is hidden. Bell says that for their family the main thing is trust, and he not only spat on their foundations, but also massacred everyone, so she would rather die than tell him where the amulet is and then spits in his face. He throws her heart against a stone and asks why she wants to die so much. The girl says to kill her, but he says that it would be very boring, and therefore he wants to conquer her with his charisma, and begins to undress. He takes out a magic key and says that with its help he will be able to open his lock, and after that he will become an incredible handsome man in a mask who can conquer any girl. Belle prays to be saved, because this guy is a real pervert. Fred says that the preparations are complete, now he can begin. A large wave rises behind him. Suddenly Johnson appears and kicks him in the head with all his might, causing the key to fly away in an unknown direction, and one of the horns breaks off. Michael shouts that he is a pervert. Michael asks if Belle can get up, she answers yes, and Wood looks into the depths of the water, in the direction where his magic key flew away. Johnson wonders why she didn't come to him, even though she said herself that only he could protect her, she said that these were her family's problems, there was no need to interfere with him in their battle. The guy thinks that even under pain of death she did not give away his location, she is a true friend, and then tells her that she shouldn't have done that. Michael wants to offer the girls some kind of deal, but they are unexpectedly interrupted by a newly activated warrior. He screams that Michael did a terrible thing. After losing the key he will never be able to pee again. Wood knows that Johnson has the pendant, so he asked for it anyway. Now, in bad luck, he is preparing for battle. It blazes with red flames and furiously rushes at the guy, who stands with his hands in his pockets, not paying any attention. 
Then Johnson catches his sword with one hand. Fred is shocked. He doesn't understand how he can repel his attack. And the guy says that his weapon is just trash. He takes and smashes the enemy's blade, plunging him into incredible surprise. He has no choice but to scream. Michael asks permission to show the real weapon, and then shows his club, blazing with magic. Seeing the weapon, he realizes that he can handle it, and gives up, praying for mercy. He says that Michael will be finished if he does anything, because his uncle is the president of the Martial Arts Association. The guy says that if so, he will do the old man a favor. The pervert says that he is glad that they came to an understanding, but Michael explodes with energy and furiously says that now he can no longer dream of a peaceful death. Johnson beats the Master of Arts and says that he is strong enough, and he sobs, mentioning his uncle. He says that he will give the pendant to the guy if he pretends that he will forget everything. Michael asks again. He says that, however, he will pretend that nothing happened, and he will not tell his uncle. Johnson hits him in the face with a baton, crushing his mask, punching a hole in it. He says that if they kill him, then the guy obviously won't live. Michael asks how he plans to repay the lives of the people killed, and Fred says that he is completely different. He is more important. He is a martial arts genius. Johnson deals a crushing blow to the enemy, leaving only his panties with a zipper and a piece with a mask. He sends him to atone for his sins before the Stark family. The girl falls to her knees and says that it's all over now. She looks extremely broken. The guy asks what she will do, since her family is no more. She says that the president of the association will think that she killed his nephew. She will not live long. Then Michael says that he will take her with him. She will turn into a dragon spirit. And then they will find a new personality for her, which the association will never find. Meanwhile, Tazen Group products created a real sensation. As soon as the recording of the conference hit the internet, they have already earned 10 million, and profits are just beginning to grow at a breakneck pace. As a result, all the company's goods, to the last drop, were sold out in the near future. The Walsh House, Sarah's parents talk about the success of the company, that the Tazen Group has great potential. The father says that Megan seems to have lost the bet. She says that she has already come to terms with it. They praise Johnson in every possible way, thinking about what if it weren't for board. But at that very moment he appears and asks. He grabs his father by the neck and says that they really decided to marry his bride to someone else. And he kept coming down from the mountains to meet her. And it was so difficult. The mother asks to stop. And the groom leaves the father and orders that they immediately call Sarah for him. Grandma appears, she wonders why there is so much noise around here, why everyone is quarreling. Her daughter supports her position that there is no need for arguments now. The guy pounces on the old lady and touches her forehead using some kind of black magic. He says that now she will slowly destroy herself until he lifts the spell. Now Sarah will want to return here more. Johnson Mansion, Sarah and Jessica lie on the bed exhausted, because they held many conferences and sales of company products. Michael asks them if they are so exhausted that they can't even pour themselves water. They ask if he really doesn't know, because they sold out of all the goods. The company is now in disarray, but they will soon get back to work. Johnson realizes how tired the girls are and offers them a drink of water. Holding the glass in his hand, the main character thinks that the medicine was prepared by the cultivator. It is obvious that it was all sold, but he does not understand what will happen next. He knows that the city is full of influential people. At first glance Tyler White may seem to be the first person in the city, but more influential figures are hiding in the shadows. Sarah's father calls and tells her the sad news. Tears flow down the girl's cheeks. It is clear that she is in a panic. She runs away, apologizing and saying that she must return home immediately, leaving Jessica and Michael in disbelief. Johnson asks Nightingale what happened to her friend. She replies that she doesn't know. She didn't even take any things. Apparently something terrible happened. Jessica runs off after her friend. Michael wastes no time calling Locke, asking to find out what happened at the Walsh's. John immediately tells him that his grandmother has been taken to the hospital. Locke also reports that Board has come down from the mountains, suggesting a connection. Michael concludes that the area is becoming crowded and is going to move to a larger place in the neighboring province, closer to John. Johnson thinks that he absorbed the black stone from the jade pendant. This should increase the speed of his cultivation, and also remembers that the reaction to the second tombstone was more powerful. According to his calculations, it will come into effect in a few days. 
Jessica returns out of breath and says that she did not catch up with Sarah. But on the way back Clark called her and said that they were opening a new branch of the Tazen Group in a neighboring province and invited her to become president there. Satisfied, Johnson tells the girl that he was just going there himself, invites the girl to go together, and he himself thinks that although there are black streaks, everything is going just fine. The next day, Michael comes out with his things, the guard asks where he is, Johnson briefly explains the situation. Little Dan delivers the guy to a luxurious villa, he invites him to come in, but the guard refuses, since he cannot be on this territory because of the order. Master Me calls Michael and asks him to come to his house and meet the head, saying that the reception may not be the most cordial. Johnson realizes that Me is in trouble, he remembers how the master supported him at Sarah's birthday, and decides to come immediately. Michael quickly gets to the indicated address and thinks that he could not imagine that the first person he would meet here would be the Me family. The master warns the guy that his family has been negotiating with the board family for several days. They will probably soon reach a critical point, so the head is not in the best mood. Johnson decides that since this is the state of affairs, he better meet him now, before he does anything. Me says that there is still a chance to change everything. People from the association will arrive soon, they will help resolve all the issues, then the head will be calmer. Johnson walks confidently into the house, Master Me nervously following behind him. The daughter of the head of the family, Maya Me, and the head himself, Earl Me, are awaiting an audience with the long-awaited guest. The girl is interested in the fact that the one to whom Uncle Sean swore allegiance must have a core, and this one does not look so serious at first glance. Michael greets the head of the family, but is not respectful enough, and therefore one of those close to him explodes and hits the table with his fist. He doesn't even bow, which is what he even allows himself to do. Johnson does not agree that he should treat him as his master, and if he dares to tell him again, he will break his arm. Sean asks another family member to calm down, because Johnson always behaves like this, there is no need to blame him. He doesn't understand why such a master as Sean licks the feet of this small child, because he is a member of the Me family, and not some kind of puppy. Sean says that if that family member says one more word, he will be forced to take action, to which the second only says that he is ready if he is so protective of a stranger. Then the head of the family suddenly shouts, he orders everyone to shut up immediately. Earl says he doesn't understand why they put in a good word for the guy, but arrogance certainly doesn't suit him at his age. Everyone around feels the fighting power emanating from the head of the family. They believe that Johnson cannot cope with a master of such power. Michael decides to show what he can do since they're not taking him seriously, and he exudes real determination. Earl is obviously using some kind of pressure attack, but Michael is having none of it, Nothing will bring him to his knees. Everyone understands that the head of the family is separated from the president of the association by literally a couple of raiding lions, and his attack did not cause any damage to this guy. The daughter and father admire Johnson's capabilities, but he can't just get away with dragging two serious families into conflict. He says that he didn't come to ask for asylum. The guy came to say that he will single-handedly deal with the board family, and none of them will be involved. If they bother anyone, let them shift the responsibility onto him. The relative again reacts aggressively to Johnson's words, but the head of the family shuts him up, saying that the guy's words are worth something. Earl believes that Michael is still wrong, and therefore expels Sean along with his master so that the bored family will no longer pester them. The onlookers understand that now they will not be touched by another strong family, and their relative is no longer a family member, but he still remains a strong master. The head of the family says that he will not kill Sean, since he still made a big contribution to the family, but now let him go to all four directions and be who he wants. Me says he is grateful to his family, but he may look like a boy's servant now, but when Johnson reaches the heights, they will still beg him to return to his family. The rest of the family does not share his opinion and rush to drive him away in shame, because he is proud of the position of the mongrel. Johnson says he has never seen such baseness as in this family, so he leaves. Vice President Wally F.A. of the association has arrived, but he is extremely surprised by Michael's presence here. Mee's family members begin to feel a little nervous when they hear that even the vice president calls the guy master. After this act of unconditional obedience, the men proceed with their original plans and Michael leaves. Michael wonders what Sean plans to do since he left the family, 
The man says that he is now a free man, so he will serve Johnson. The guy says that he will not allow his subordinate to be humiliated by the Mee family, because he chose him without delay. Michael takes out the pills and tells Sean how much to take so that the power of his cultivation increases tenfold, and also promises that in a month the head of his former family will run away just by seeing him, from how much power he will have. The man understands that Michael does not consider him just a servant, for him he is a real person. Sean says he will definitely repay Johnson's efforts with his loyalty. New York's first hospital, VIP ward, Megan and Sarah stand in front of their grandmother. The girl does not understand what could have happened to her grandmother in such a short time, and the mother understands that she failed not only her mother, but also her daughter. Sarah feels that Megan is hiding something, so she wonders why the doctors cannot make a diagnosis. Then Sarah's fiancé Hugh Board appears and says that he does not believe that his future wife came all this way to see the old hag and not him. The girl angrily says that even with such a status as his, it is not allowed to offend her grandmother. Here he hits Sarah hard on the cheek, who clearly did not expect such an attack. Her cheek is dented, and she recoils strongly. He says that he knows how she seduced men here while he was away. She's actually still alive only because she's a virgin. Hugh says that he has no patience left, and therefore the marriage that was supposed to take place in five months will be in five days when he finishes with his affairs. He also adds that if she dares to leave New York during this time, she will never see anyone from her family alive again. He also adds that this is all because of Johnson, who has already annoyed the boards, and therefore he will soon bring him head. He says that this is an unusual gift and leaves, leaving behind two girls in extreme surprise and hopelessness. Sarah stands up and, still afraid but determined, says that she would rather die than become his wife. Johnson calls Sarah, but she does not answer. But he decides to wait a little longer. But if she still does not answer, then he will have to find her himself. Michael is meditating and thinking that in a few days he has reached the second stage of the kingdom of movement. And when he reaches the third, he will be able to summon the next grave. But then he hears a knock on the door. A girl in a closed suit and a mask appears at the door, she asks him to let her in for a while, because she is being pursued. Michael kicks her out because it is very suspicious and says that if he returns, he will become a corpse. She offers Michael some kind of pill and begs him to let her in. He knows that this province is currently undergoing a large redistribution of possessions, and therefore he cannot allow kindness to take over, and he does not need pills at all. But then the girl offers him a fragment of a magic sword in exchange for just one night, even if it is broken, it can be repaired. Michael accepts the gift and says that now she is under his protection. He asks how she found him. She says that there is a strong aura in this house. He tells her to undress, and the girl thinks that he wants her and is very indignant. Michael rips off her mask with the help of magic. He thinks that she is a good person, and therefore he can keep her. He notices a strange mark on her forehead, but at that moment someone asks to open the door. Michael says that he will figure it out himself. Strange people appear behind the doors. They are looking for someone suspicious, although they themselves look extremely suspicious. They ask to be let into the house to check, because the one they are looking for is extremely dangerous. One of them prepares a blow, starting to shout something like a peak, but Michael interrupts his blow, sending his body flying with his foot. The guys say that Michael is finished, and he notices that he didn't invite them and begins to fill with energy saying that anyone who crosses the threshold will go straight to the coffin. The attackers somehow quickly lose their passion and ask Michael to delay his answer. Michael very bluntly sends a token in the face of his rivals, which says that he has friends in the army, so they decide to get out while they are safe. The girl introduces herself as FIA Butler, and he says that she has poison in her chest, and fortunately, he is the best in medicine. FIA is not sure that Michael is really healing, but she can only trust him. He starts massaging her entire body with magic so that all the poison comes out of her body. Michael's eyes begin to glow even more with a violet flame, and turquoise energy spreads around him. He realizes that he needs to press harder to soften the hard spots. The girl feels a pleasant numbness throughout her body, but she makes her think that he is just treating her, and therefore there is nothing special about it. Michael says that they are even, she needs to rest for the night, and leave the estate in the morning. The next morning, all that was left of the girl was a sword and a note in which it was written that she was indebted to him three times and would definitely repay it. 
Michael believes that there is nothing special about it, but it was an extremely interesting experience. Johnson realizes that the sword is even more interesting than he previously thought. It is literally blazing with magical energy, despite the fact that it is broken, and what will happen when it is repaired is generally unknown. Michael decided to call it the Dragon Slayer. He really hopes that the sword will help in killing Hunter Torres. Then Sarah calls Johnson. He tries to ask why she hasn't answered the phone for so long, and she says that he can't go out anywhere, and in general, he's in great danger. Michael asks the girl what's bothering her, but she says that it's nothing. Johnson says that he'll be there in half an hour, and Sarah just repeats his name in tears. The guy goes outside and thinks that he needs to call little Dan to come pick him up. Michael sees Locke. He is interested in what he is doing here. He says that he came to see his master. Johnson says the point of his undercover work is to avoid contact, not assign it, but John says the distance is keeping them apart. He wants to bring Michael to a building where everyone wants to meet him. The guy politely refuses, but Locke doesn't believe in it. Johnson doesn't understand what John means and asks to take him to Sarah's house, and then they'll drop by to run his business. Locke thanks the guy. Michael, getting into the car, asks if there is any news about Hunter Torres. Locke says that it is difficult for him to penetrate his province. John has already sent six masters, but there is still no answer. John apologizes profusely saying that he should have gone there himself to find something worthwhile. But Michael says that is not necessary. Johnson says he's needed here, so don't worry about it, he just needs to send more people. Fia Battler meditates amidst the turquoise flames, wondering who that guy is and why his medicine not only cured her of the poison, but also enhanced her cultivation abilities. She holds information about him in her hand and thinks that he is some big shot and has hidden information about himself. Even his source cannot find anything. Michael arrives at the scene. There is multiple security at the Walsh house. She looks extremely tense. Sarah seemed restless on the phone. Maybe she is being punished. Johnson is afraid that his arrival will cause trouble. So he decides to sneak in unnoticed. The guy almost instantly finds himself at Sarah's window. He calls her. The girl only looks in his direction in fear. The girl says that she told him not to come. But he is still here. Michael wonders who is threatening her, but she very hesitantly reports that no one would dare threaten her. Because she is the daughter of the Walsh family, she is completely fine. The guy continues the interrogation, wondering who is threatening her, the Martial Arts Association, the Mee family, or the Board family. At the moment when Johnson names the last option, the girl turns pale, opens her mouth, and breaks out in a cold sweat. Michael says that's what he thought, so he asks her to tell her their address, he will put things in order there. The girl begins to try to dissuade the guy. Because this family is very dangerous. They have enormous influence. She begs him to hide somewhere. She cries and sobbing, says that she is very afraid for him and does not want anything to happen to him. Johnson hugs the girl, saying that everything will be fine. And he himself thinks about how much power he has, but cannot tell her. Because she still won't believe it. Michael says that the only way to calm her down is to deal with the Board family, and if she doesn't say anything, then he'll have to take matters into his own hands. Johnson hears footsteps from below, but they are extremely quiet, so he understands that martial artists are coming. The guy says that something will happen now and orders her to stay here and keep a low profile. He doesn't think about them breaking into Sarah's room if they're security and peeking around the door. But Michael understands that they could have been sent from the Board family to look after her, and then that would be a completely different matter. The girls notice the guy and wonder who he is and when he managed to come here in the first place. He says he knows what they wanted to do, so he invites them to go outside so as not to mess up the house and scare Sarah. Michael asks who sent them to follow the girl, if the Board family is by chance. The girls are interested in how he even had the audacity to enter Sarah's room if he knows about the agreement between the Walshes and the boards. Michael shouts out what he can do because she belongs to him. They shout that they will not allow anyone to discredit the young master's woman and go on the attack. Michael immediately responds by delivering a strong blow to the nose with the baton, blood gushing out and the girl being thrown back violently. The second girl uses her eagle claw move, but Johnson calmly intercepts her attack. He grabs her by the neck and mocks her helplessness and inability to get close enough to use the technique. The girl begs her not to kill her and makes a puddle, and Michael mocks the fact that the master peed himself, 
and then orders her to lay out all the information about the location of the estate. She gives the location of the estate, but she also notes that there is almost no one there now. Michael wonders why. The master reveals that her position is too insignificant to know for sure, but she knows that they went to the mountain to find someone. They said that if they had their support, they would become the strongest family in the province. Johnson realizes that they could go to the Appalachian master, but is quickly dissuaded because the family is not that strong. But then he remembers that there are cultivators expelled from the mountain, who are also not bad, and even Michael cannot cope with some of them. Johnson asks when the family will return, and the girl says that she doesn't know, it depends on that person, but in about half a month. Michael says he's heard enough and releases the girl, who immediately starts coughing violently. She thinks that he won't think much when she reports what happened. Johnson asks if she will kill herself, or give her such an honor on her own. She asks if he is really not going to let her go. He says that he decided to slaughter the Board family. Why then would he keep her alive? The girl tries to attack, shouting that she will resist. Michael sharply snatches the rod and delivers a crushing blow right to the jaw. A sea of blood splashes from there. Johnson calls Little Dan and orders him to call the guys because the Walsh house needs to be cleaned up. Steve Walsh, Sarah's father, appears. The maid said there was a fight going on, but he did not expect to see that same Michael Johnson here. The man calls the guy into the house. Sarah turns out to be there. He sends her to the room, saying that they need to talk in private. The daughter refuses to obey, because she knows that her father will obviously want to say something unpleasant to Johnson. Michael reassures the girl saying that she has nothing to worry about, she can go, they will see each other upstairs. Steve praises Johnson and says that calling him a genius would be a gross understatement. Derek Board is one of the top 200 martial arts geniuses in all of America. He is the epitome of fear. The man asks Johnson to stop, saying that he will do everything possible to beg for his forgiveness and save his life. He is doing this for the sake of his daughter. Michael smiles arrogantly and says that he is pleased with his kindness but he will somehow deal with the Board family himself. Besides, he thinks that they misunderstood something. Johnson notes that this situation is not because the Boards are breathing down his neck. It is he who is making his way into their estate. Derek is very surprised, begins to sweat and asks if he is hallucinating, if the guy is really going to destroy the Board estate. Michael tells the head of the Walsh family to rest, and he will go talk to his daughter so that she does not worry. Johnson goes up the stairs and Derek thinks that fearless fools are truly fearless. Michael is standing outside Locke's Quinlong building. There are a lot of craftsmen here, so if something happens, a master will immediately appear to handle the situation. Johnson approaches the entrance to the building and is stopped by a security guard wearing rose-colored glasses. Some girl runs out and says that he is a very important client, and therefore there is no need to treat him like that. The bodyguard moves away and lets the client go ahead, the girl will be glad to accompany him. The escort falls to her knee and asks for forgiveness for the guard, because he did not know about Johnson, but caused such a great insult. Michael tells her to get up, there's nothing wrong with it, because the guards don't report directly to John. On the 39th floor, they exit the elevator into a room with a large number of people, and the girl reports that they are there. Michael notices that the room is full of masters, whose aura is strong even compared to the head of the Me family. John Locke appears, he calls Johnson his master, and puts his hand on his heart. Locke takes a knee, and then everyone in the room greets Michael. Michael thinks that their loyalty is not in question, they are all here just for him. If they are properly trained, they will shock all of America. The guy orders everyone to get up from their knees, he says that he approves of their strength, like the strength of the masters of the Dark Palace, from now on they are all his brothers. He, blazing with energy and asks to show his devotion and in return will give them pride, he says that any stranger who dares to harm the Dark Court will be killed by him personally. Everyone notices that the demonic force inside the Master is insanely strong, how much blood is on his hands. He thinks that the fastest way to get people to obey you is to show them strength. He is sure that Locke will understand his action. John asks his Master to fight him, and Michael thinks about how he still understands him well. Johnson asks what rank Locke has in the ranking, in the underground he is seen as a leader, which means he must defeat him to prove that he is stronger. He says that he is not interested in such a ranking, but somewhere a couple of months ago he killed a master who was ranked about 200th. Johnson recalls that the ranking of masters is poorly updated, 
and their records could be broken by underground forces, since people like Locke are not taken into account. Johnson thinks that if John really killed that master, then his rating is clearly higher than Board. But whether Locke is an equal to the president of the association is not certain. John asks the master to forgive him, and Johnson says to start the fight. Locke, saying let's have fun now, flies towards Johnson, charging his power. John and Michael collide in a duel. They inflict many blows, but only their fists collide. They fight on equal terms. After another blow, Locke notices that his master is fighting quite well. John shouts that he hasn't had such a good fight in a long time, and also advises Michael to be careful with the consequences. Locke powers up even more and begins to punch at a higher speed, spawning several more arms. Michael realizes that the secret is that the enemy throws many blows, but only one of them is real, and then he strikes John. The attack turns out to be very successful. Johnson literally slams his faithful servant into the ground. All Locke's people are extremely surprised that at least someone was able to find their master's real blow, because this is the governor's strongest move. Johnson thinks that if he had taken the blow, he would not have been able to cope with the attack, but Locke's skill is weaker, so he won. John gets down on one knee and solemnly announces that he has lost. Michael asks his servant to come to him later because he wants to give him something. He agrees. He believes that Claude's skill, punching, will be very suitable for Locke. This will be great progress. Michael hands his servant the paper. Johnson says that there are a couple of meditations and skills. He orders John to study them in a couple of days. Locke realizes that this and what he studied before are on completely different levels, and he is extremely nervous. Johnson says that he will not become a martial artist or a self-taught master. He will become a cultivator like Michael himself. Megan stands in front of her mother and is sad about the current situation. She blames herself. Michael and Sarah enter the room. The girl says that Johnson came to visit his grandmother. The guy notices that Sarah's mother seems to have gone gray in a couple of days, so he offers her some fruit. Megan thinks that Johnson is rougher than bored, but he is definitely better. The situation is critical. The grandmother could die at any moment, which could happen in such a short period of time that she survived. Michael reports that the grandmother is not sick, but nevertheless, someone cut off her vitality, so she fell into a coma. Johnson wonders who was with her before she fainted. The women of the Walsh family are nervous. Megan says that she was with her all the time. She didn't see other people. She hid the truth. Because if Sarah finds out, then she definitely won't listen to her fiancé. Michael notices that the girl's mother is lying. He does not understand what reason there could be for lying at this moment. He does not understand what happened. Now only he can save his grandmother. Sarah asks Megan to tell her what really happened to her grandmother. She is very nervous, but begins to speak. Megan thinks that this idiot has realized everything he wanted, but she won't allow him to play with his grandmother's life. Threats from the boards and the life of his mother. The choice is not difficult. The mother says that it was Derek Board. He was the last one with his grandmother. Sarah says that she knew so. Michael doesn't understand how he could do something like this to an elderly woman. He will pay for it. Johnson uses his magical power. The grandmother even begins to levitate above her bed, from the energy filling it. The mother is extremely surprised that someone else knows the magic of acupuncture that can cure something like this. It should have been lost in the centuries. The gloomy spirit that kept her in a coma emerges from the grandmother, and she falls onto the bed again. Michael has enough courage, but he is still trying to hide. Johnson asks him to send a gift to a bastard in the mountains. Some kind of magical energy flies to the Appalachian Mountains, where Derek is now. Many people are standing in the square. The Bored family doesn't believe that they are being ignored, because they are one of the strongest in the entire province. It's just ridiculous. Then the guy is overtaken by the gift sent by Johnson. He screams from the unexpected impact. The Borg people are very surprised to see the son of the head of the family writhing under some kind of influence. He understands that someone lifted his spell, and now a return gift has arrived to him. The head of the family, Rick Borg, does not understand what is happening. For some reason his son is under the influence of his spell. Rick says that the mentor who taught him promised that no one would ever be able to break this spell. And the guy says that this is the Walsh family. Someone help them. The father does not understand how someone dared to harm his precious son. He asks him to tell the palace that they are finished. Sarah writes to Michael that her grandmother is already much better, and she is looking for an opportunity to quickly run away to him. Michael thinks that no one can stop this girl, 
Probably this is because of her grandmother's favor towards him. When she woke up in the hospital and understood everything, she almost decided to marry the girl to him. But Sarah said that no one would want to marry him. Michael opens the door to the house, realizes that someone is there and shouts who is there and takes out the rod. Johnson enters the house and sees F.I., whom he has just recently helped with treatment. Michael reminds her that he told her never to come here again, but the girl says that she owes him three times, and she doesn't like to be in debt, so she came to repay the first debt. She hands the phone to the guy and says that it contains a very interesting entry. It says something about the Board family being willing to pay a big price for Johnson's head. The girl wonders if he's surprised. When she found out that he was the target, she killed another person to keep him safe for a while, which was not a favor. Michael says that the girl has not yet fully understood everything, because it is he who wants to destroy the Board family, and not they him. He swears that one day the palace will meet the same end as the Board family. The girl simply laughs at this idea, says that he would take her inheritance if she died laughing, because this is the largest organization of killers in the American martial arts world. For money they will kill any master in the province. Even if they fail to kill him, they will send stronger masters. And if they fail, then even stronger ones. Faya says that there is a master of the 30th rank in the palace, so any relationship with him will end in death. And she saved him. Michael senses something and suddenly flies towards the door with great speed and determination. He hits the door with all his strength, embroidering it. There was a killer behind it, and therefore he flies off with it. The killer gets up and asks how he knew, but Michael doesn't give him time and immediately slams him into the ground again. He never thought that the target would be so strong, he would never cope with it. The girl says that the Board family still has backup copies, someone else took the task to kill Michael, besides her. The killer says that Faya needs to kill the target now, because this is a violation of the palace law unless, of course, she wants to risk her life. Michael says that any mercenary who swore to kill him is dead, and he is no exception. She says that he cannot do this, because then the palace will know that their man has been killed and they need to send the next one, who will be stronger. The guy under Johnson's boots says that if he kneels right now, he will think again, but in any case he will not live. Michael takes and breaks the head of the talkative guy, and the blood spreads so much that it even gets on F.I.A. Johnson reiterates that he said that anyone who goes against him will die, even the palace. The girl understands that he will have to pay with his life for this. Is he really crazy? He doesn't think about the consequences. Michael demands the girl to clean the house and bring him the corpse, since she is also from the palace. The girl is shocked by the guy's behavior and he tells her where the cleaning products are and which ones are best to use. Faya is annoyed, but she decides to carry out the order in the hope that this guy will live longer, because he saved her life. But at some point she gets indignant and throws the rag. She is not going to clean up after this idiot. Michael calls Locke and asks what he knows about the Palace of Martial Artist Killers. He reports that this is the main organization of killers in America. There are only 36 branches and the main one in the provinces all of them under the leadership of Lin Foam. Locke says that his abilities are no match for theirs, so if he wants, he can crush him like an ant. John announces that he will bring all the masters from the underground to deal with the local murder squad. Michael wonders what the palace does if the branch fails to cope with the task. Locke says that this is a very unpleasant part, because then the capital branch sends its best fighter. The main character says that if the palace wants an endless battle, then he will get it and he begins to blaze with magic. The guy understands that the rebirth cemetery is his last trump card, and therefore he should not show it thoughtlessly. He believes that his real task is to improve his abilities and powers. While meditating, Michael goes to the third stage of the kingdom of movement, which turned out to be even faster than he thought. The more he improves, the more he advances in different directions, he blazes with a variety of fires. Johnson is in the cemetery of rebirth, he understands that he can summon the next, stronger spirit, but only once, and therefore he should save it for a later time. Jessica walks through Johnson's house, trying to find his whereabouts. She comes into his room, but he is not there. But then he jumps out and sharply asks why she is sneaking into his room, and the girl simply screams in surprise. Jessica says that she wanted to surprise him, and Michael ironically wonders if she really didn't want to attack him. Michael says that if she's not going to behave, then he doesn't have to, and then they end up in bed and loving each other. 
The girl says that Tazen Group is so popular that they appear in the news and social networks almost every day. The products were sold out as soon as they went on sale, and on resale the price is double the original price. The company overnight became famous throughout America, and not just in the provinces. Michael calls the girl smart, and says that he will leave part of the business to her. Jessica notices a photo on the shelf and wonders if it's really a photo of his family. He says that this thing helps the estate feel more like home, and he thinks that it is also a reminder of revenge. A girl notices a spot on her mother's neck and wonders if it is a mole, and he says that this is really a spot that she has had since birth. She says she attended his parents' cremation, and she's sure she didn't have a mole then. Michael is shocked. He frantically asks if it was really her body. If she is confusing something, she says that it was the first time she saw a corpse so close, so she remembered it. Jessica asks if his mother had a mole removed, or if there was something else that didn't look like the photo. Now, Michael begins to think that his parents could have survived. He decides to find out at all costs. It will not be difficult to arrange with the help of the Tazen group, because he is its owner, and they could have looked, since they knew that he's alive. The guy calls Mark Seed. He says that they should meet right now. The man says that he is at the base. He will contact little Dan to give Johnson a ride. Meanwhile, Lucy Vox tries to get permission to go through with Lil John, but in vain. Then Michael appears and wonders what's going on, what all the noise is going on. Dan says that this girl wants to see him for some reason. She claims that they know each other. The girl thinks that one of the powerful families wants to try to make friends with Johnson by killing her family. She hopes that he will help her solve the problem. Michael says that he doesn't know this girl, and it's time for them to go. Lucy wonders how it is that he doesn't know her. They're real friends since school. He said he liked her, then they saw each other this month. She knows it might be unpleasant, but he's still worried about her. He takes it, and hits her with his hand on her weak face without any visible emotion. The guy says that if he sees her here again, then she's a corpse, so she'd better leave, and she, lying on the floor, thinks why he just can't help her family. Michael is at a meeting with Mark. He presents all the documents that they have about that incident five years ago. Johnson thanks the people. They are shocked that he can do this. The guy asks if they are sure that his parents are dead. Michael reports that he learned that someone switched bodies, Sid screams. He does not understand how this could happen. He thinks that it takes unimaginable skill to switch bodies in front of so many people. Johnson says he was told his mother didn't have a birthmark when she was cremated. Sid looks interested. Mark says that if Jessica's words are true, then the suspicions are still valid. Because they did not investigate at the time of the incident. Sid says there is someone who can help, the official head of the crime bureau. He was directly involved in this case and was the first one who had access to the bodies. But even for him, Albie Hughes, life was not easy. His son's wedding took place three years ago, and it was assumed that the day would be wonderful. No one knew that the girl, disgraced by a member of the wealthy white family, would decide to commit suicide. The ex-fiancé wanted to take revenge, but the master of the white family did not allow him and so the son was killed. Then Albi used all his authority and influence for the sake of revenge. He caused great damage to the family, but he paid a heavy price. Now he is imprisoned in the first prison of New York, and his cultivation base was wiped off the face of the earth. Sid asks if Tyler is the head of that family. Michael confirms that the head of the family is indeed the head of the Martial Arts Association. Michael says that Albi didn't do anything wrong. Why didn't the authorities do anything? To which Sid replies that, unfortunately, the world is not as rosy as Johnson thinks. America needs martial artists like no other, so it's immediately clear which of the two is more important. Sid says that even he tried to dig something up on the white sun, but they had already managed to hide all the evidence, so he couldn't do anything. Michael demands to be taken to the first prison so he can meet Hughes in person. Prison, Albie slowly and without emotion comes out to the waiting Michael. Johnson places a photograph on the table and wonders if Hughes knows these people. Albi sends Michael away and says that he doesn't care who he is, he just wants to be left alone. Johnson says that it was his parents who died, and he was in charge of the case, only he can tell more details. Michael says that they have a similar past, he also faced the fact that his loved ones were killed by such a powerful person that he filled him with horror. He did not have any strength to resist so he understands why Albi hates this world. Johnson says he endured five years of painful ordeal and torture. He only breathes because he is obsessed with revenge, 
and Albi is his last option to find out what he needs. The man says that the guy can leave, since he still doesn't know anything about these people. Michael shows a photograph of the white son and says that he can bring his head. Is Albi sure that he does not remember anything? The man becomes furious. He says that this bastard must die, no matter what, no matter how much he wants to crush him. The prisoner says that his father is very powerful. Who does Michael think he is if he intends to do something like that? Michael sprays energy around himself and says that he doesn't need to know. He wonders if the man will remember everything when he brings his head, and he loudly exclaims that if Johnson does this, he will remember everything that happened then. The man and the guy agree to cooperate and go to their places in silent determination. Some master is standing at the door of the whites. He thinks that the head of the family is powerful, but his son is a complete pervert, if he were even half the leader. Michael approaches him. He wonders if the son of the head of the family is inside. Johnson disappears from sight then reappears in a terrible aura. The man asks who he is. The guy replies that he does not need this information. He only needs to know that he has come to take the life of the younger white. The master throws his fists at the main character. He shouts how dare he even say such a thing. Johnson delivers a devastating blow, igniting a small sun on the enemy's belly. Michael looks at the face writhing in pain and says that he is sure that the master has done many terrible things to white. Johnson throws the defeated enemy straight into the door, who flies there at breakneck speed. The body knocks down the door with its weight, and inside there are two girls in bunny costumes with ears and tails, who do not understand what is happening. White screams how they could kill his uncle so quickly, it's impossible. He sits against the wall and screams in horror. Michael reminds him of the girl he dishonored, and he arrogantly asks what Johnson wants, is it really revenge? The guy says that he has a very influential father, so you can't harm him in any way, otherwise you yourself will die in a couple of days. Michael says that, unfortunately for the guy, one person has what he needs, and he said that he would only talk in exchange for his head, the pervert also whispers something about how he shouldn't kill him. Tyler White sits on the couch in his house and thinks about how he's going to kick his son's ass when he gets back from whatever hole he's in right now. His phone rings. The employee reports that his son is dead, and besides, his head has disappeared somewhere. Police officers stand outside the building, preparing to investigate the murder of the son of a high-ranking citizen. Tyler threatens the man, saying that if this is a lie, then he will not care. But he in fear reports that it is true. White begins to cry and shouts that they must find the killer immediately. Michael brings the head of White's son straight into the hands of Albie Hughes, who is sincerely glad that the bastard is finally dead. He says thank you to Johnson for putting this asshole down. He deserved it. Now his son and daughter-in-law can rest in peace. Michael says that this is a deal, and therefore he must tell what he wanted. The man says that he will tell everything he knows. He says that five years ago he was the head of the major crimes department. He arrived on the scene quickly as he was busy with another case nearby. When he arrived, the people present at the banquet had already been released, and his parents were seriously injured. Michael is very surprised and asks again with round eyes, clarifying whether he was mistaken in the fact that they were not dead. Albi says that yes it was, but the breathing was so weak that they could die soon, but judging by the situation, they had a chance. He immediately took them to the hospital, but in the end received a death certificate. Michael does not lose hope, he says that the certificate does not prove anything, he can save 9 out of 10 patients to whom it was issued. The man says that what happened next was very strange. The bodies were not opened according to the procedure, but a man appeared. He took secret documents and bodies, but after half an hour he returned them to their place. After this, the doctor said that a trial was not required, even though Albi wanted to do something. But then he immediately realized that someone from above was manipulating this, and therefore doing something would still be pointless. They were supposed to be cremated, but no one could sign the document. Some girl came and introduced herself as a member of the Johnson family. Michael understands that it was Jessica, who already told everything that happened next. The greatest interest is the identity of that guy and the reason for the absence of bodies for half an hour. Johnson asks if there is anything else. The man says that he further investigated and found out that the man had previously met his mother in a cafe. After the conversation, they suddenly quarreled, and the woman immediately left there, not being in the best mood. Albi says he wanted to keep the footage from the cameras in the cafe, but then the man showed up and threatened him, 
so he had to give up the investigation for the safety of his family. Johnson asks if he has any recordings, but he says they were all wiped clean. Michael asks to draw his face, because obviously he is a man, this is a clue. Albi takes some time, but then shows a good drawing and asks if that's okay. Johnson says he doesn't have enough details, so Michael suggests they look for ways to get him out of prison. Michael says that then he can draw it using a computer, the man says that he can do it without any problems. Master Howard meditates on the stone, releasing large waves of energy. A servant appears and says that someone came to see Albi on a date. The master wonders if someone really decided to visit him. After so much time, the servant says that it is Johnson from the Spirit of the Dragon. The man says that the special forces are not of interest, but Johnson is quiet. The guy says that he didn't believe it either, so he did an investigation. He wasn't dead. He became the first master of art in New York after he mysteriously disappeared five years ago. He says that the creature seems to be blessed, but there is nothing like that. This creature will only stay in our bloodline. The servant offers to send people after him, but the master says that for now he means nothing and does not threaten them. The master thought that Johnson died like a cockroach. He thinks that he can solve everything, but he is just an insignificant fry. The main people of almost all the families of the Martial Arts Association are holding some important meeting. Their faces do not look very happy. They learn about the death of the son of the head of the association, but he loved him very much. Everyone is completely bewildered. The head of the White family says that today's meeting has only one goal. All the families present must help him find the one who killed his beloved son. The man says that he sent everyone a photo of the killer. He wants them to use all their powers to catch him. Sarah's father notices that the photograph shows Johnson. He does not understand what to do. He is extremely surprised. Meanwhile, the child's father is tearing up and rushing. He is blazing with magical energy. He says that he would rather kill a thousand people than allow this person to live. He wants to get the heads of all members of his family, torture them to death. Stefan Nix understands that White has gone crazy. He will kill everyone who has similar clothes or figure. How many innocent people will die? And while he was thinking about this, he also realized that this man is suspiciously similar to Michael Johnson. Stefan thinks that he will need to contact Johnson later. After all, he is his friend. And meanwhile Sarah tells her father that Johnson is at home. Steve Walsh is relieved that it could not be him. But then the daughter sends a new message that he just returned and she doesn't know where he was all night. The head of the Me family also understands that he saw this man somewhere. And Walsh increasingly doubts that he is right. Me asks if there is a clearer photograph. But the vice president says that all the records were erased. And this photo was taken as if on purpose. He says that this is definitely Mr. Johnson so he will need to warn him soon so that he has time to protect himself. The father says he leaves it up to his vice president, Wally F.A., who says he will do his best to find the culprit. White is counting on him and says that he knows what will happen to him if no information appears within three days. F.A. is terrified and breaks out in a cold sweat. Strange people took the photograph. They grabbed anyone who looked like Michael. Today the law in the province ceased to apply. A dark night is coming. The head of the Me family tells his family members that the incident is very public. If anyone can provide information, they will be generously rewarded. He has already sent out photos to everyone. One of the Me family's masters notices that the man in the photo looks a lot like the arrogant guy who was here not long ago. The father of the family understands why the man looked familiar, and then thinks that Johnson would have enough strength to do such a thing. The guy says that he doesn't like Michael, and therefore he himself would like to get down to business. The main me tells him to take another one with him and grab Sean in order to find out all the questions before grabbing the boy. Sean sits in his chambers. He trains the art of cultivation. The man is very grateful that he received this gift of divine flame from Johnson. In a few days he became much stronger. He asks to give him one more month and then the head of the me family will be able to do it. Then someone breaks down the door to him. The man displeasedly asks who is there. The master fights off the attacks of two people. They lean on him, but he resists. These are members of the Mi family. The warriors insult the master, calling him an unwalked dog, calling this place his booth. Sean wonders what they even forgot at his house, especially in such a brazen manner, since he no longer has anything to do with their family. The arrogant guy says that they need to resolve some issues. That's why they are here. He is surprised to notice that Sean is a hardworking dog. People notice the pill. They wonder where he got it from. 
It's a concentrated healing pill with an engraving. The man says it's none of their business and orders them to get out while they can. They say that he knows that their powers are higher than his. Is he sure that he can communicate with them like that? People rush at the man, saying that he deserves to die, but he throws them in different directions. Sean's eyes sparkle. He doesn't believe that Johnson's help and cultivation could improve his abilities so quickly. The guys notice that their target has become stronger. They are going to use some kind of secret technique. One shouts that Johnson is here. Sean turns around, but it turns out to be a trap. The second is already starting his blow. They take him by surprise, but he thinks hard about what skill he should use so that he doesn't get killed by these two idiots. The Mi family members have won and are wondering where to find Michael now and where he got the pill from. Sean, even lying in a pool of blood, says that by crossing Johnson's path, they will be signing a death warrant for their entire family, and they say that he will die first. Michael is on the phone, wondering if the dragon spirit could somehow influence Hugh's release. On the line they say that he is a criminal. It's not so easy to free him. Johnson says that his parents don't understand where now they may be in danger. It can't be that they can't come up with something. From the phone they offer to take Albi tool for accurate facial recognition. Michael is happy that the company is now run by Sarah and Jessica. He doesn't have to worry about that at least. It's time for him to start cultivating. He decides that he needs to find out how Sean and John are doing first, and then do something. Locke reports that learning a new skill is going flawlessly. He never thought such powerful skills existed in the world, and he also wants to pass on something. Locke says that white spies are everywhere. 36 teenagers disappeared overnight. All of them are either the same age as the ruler or look like him. Michael says that he is already aware and knows what to do. Where Johnson has a bad feeling about the connection with Sean, but he starts calling anyway. The subscriber's phone number is unavailable. Michael displeasedly notes that he is usually available 24 hours a week to receive a new order. He uses spirit possession in hopes of screwing himself up, but sees Sean begging for help. Michael finds himself in his servant's house. He shouts if he is okay and notices blood. He realizes that this is the work of the Mi family. Mi's family members throw Sean in, saying it's done. They look very pleased. The father of the family is extremely indignant. He says that he asked to be brought in, not to be beaten. He is still a member of the Mi family after all. The guy arrogantly asks for forgiveness and says that Sean is just a dog, and therefore there is no difference in bringing him alive or dead. The important thing is that he is a naughty dog. He did not give away the location of the bastard. He shows the pill and, smiling mysteriously, says that he hid it. Earl Me quickly takes the pill away and says that it still has the carving on it, which means it was created less than a month ago, and then eats it. He is filled with unprecedented energy and says that it is much more effective than the pills that their ancestors left them. Earl wonders where they got the pill, because if they find the source... They will become the strongest family in the province. No one will care about the white and bored families. They say that they took the pill from Sean. At first they did not plan to harm him. But he not only did not give up Johnson, but also single-handedly wanted to take the pill. Earl immediately runs to Sean and asks him in the nicest terms where he got it. He says he just wanted to see him. He would never let those idiots hurt him. He genuinely wonders where he got the pills. He will take him to the hospital. Hand him over to the best doctor. Take care of him so that he gets back to his best self. Sean wakes up and confronts Earl, saying that there are things beyond his control. In the end, he will ruin the Mi family with his tunnel vision. Earl is going to stab Sean in response to his insolence. Because the only one who does not see the line here is him, not the Mi family. The girl shouts at her father and asks what he is doing. Because Uncle Sean has always been honest and courageous. Why is he doing this to him? Earl tells his daughter to stay out of adult affairs unless she wants to be punished. The subordinates say that they have collected all the data, and the head of the family wonders whether Sean seriously thought that they could not do without him. Sean says Earl can't destroy the whole family, and Earl tells his men to find Johnson because he knows more than his dog. Earl thinks that Sean was ready to become the boy's dog in order to get pills from him. Perhaps the younger white wanted too, that's why he was killed. The head of the family understands that he must find Johnson before White. Because he must get all the pills, he laughs and says that then the entire Mi family will gain unimaginable fame, and his employee flies behind him. Michael is standing here, holding the one who was just sent after him in his hand. Earl is in shock, 
and Johnson is wondering if this is not who they were just eager to find. He thinks that the guy has so many abilities at such a young age. He killed both servants. How many pills does he have? And he says out loud that he underestimated the guy and asks if he killed White's son. Michael asks what difference it makes to him, and says that maybe he will join him soon, then he'll ask. The head of the family says that Johnson is now in the Mi family's territory, so he won't let him leave here so easily. Michael says that a lot of people came to the party, which saved him a lot of time searching. Then everyone rushed to attack, and Johnson made a counterattack, scattering all the members of the Mi family to the sides, leaving them no chance to win. This is a clear victory. Michael gives Sean a pill and says he will get better, Earl is shocked. Me says that he knew that these pills were from Michael, he doesn't know where he got so many pills from, because cultivators are very rare, but he should distribute them to everyone. Michael asks if he should give him the pills, and then says that there is no point, because corpses don't need pills. Earl asks in shock what kind of corpses he is talking about. Can pills really raise the dead? Johnson asks if he is stupid and then explains that he meant that they will soon become corpses. The head of the family wonders if Michael has any idea who he is. He is in 192nd place in the ranking. The guy has no chance. Earl begins the attack and screams for Michael to pray for a quick and painless death. Me launches a series of attacks, but Johnson calmly dodges his attacks, even noticing that he is not bad. The opponents clash fists and Earl is thrown away. Michael arrogantly remarks that this is all he can do. Earl says he underestimated his opponent, but Johnson thought he would have more fun. Everyone complains that Johnson is fighting unfairly, because all the master's strength is in the sword. The guy gets tired of this whining, so he tells the enemy to take the sword. Earl says that his name is famous for his mastery of the blade. He flares with energy, throws off his coat, and prepares to attack. Sean asks Michael to be careful because Earl could kill him but the guy tells him that he can rest. Me swings and releases his magical blade attack towards Johnson. Earl shouts that Johnson must die, he dodges, appears behind him, performs an attack and says that he was already dying. Earl's father appears and grabs Johnson by the hand. He asks him to stop. The son asks what his father is doing here. He should be at a closed training session. The father looks like a very strong master. He says that if he had not appeared, Earl would have already fallen at the hands of Johnson. He asks how it is that he is the head of the Mi family and cannot be equal to Michael. The father ignores his son's question. He turns to Johnson, calls him talented, and that he generally likes him. But he created a mess in the estate. So why not explain what happened? A black aura emanates from the old man, and Michael wonders what to explain. He tells Michael to stop his cultivation, then maybe he will save the guy's life. The old man notices an ancient sword. Does the boy really think that the blade will change his life? and Michael thinks that he needs to use it. Johnson cuts the old man's head into two halves. Earl screams, not understanding what happened to his father. Michael looks at the sword and thinks it's pretty good for something broken. The whole family is in shock. There were legends about that master. But he died like that at the hands of a child. He is the strongest in the family. This cannot be. Michael waves his sword and tells them all to kneel before him. Everyone except Earl kneels. The head of the family turns around. Shocked by this event, he is extremely dissatisfied, even his daughter is on her knees. Michael repeats his order in a more commanding tone, then the last me falls to his knees. Family members beg for mercy, saying they will do anything. Earl is very ashamed. Michael asks why he doesn't beg for mercy for his family and himself. He says that Johnson still won't let him go, although he is very interested in what his death will give him. White is only getting stronger every year even though he was previously in 100th place. But that was years ago. So if Johnson crosses his line, he won't have long to live, because he is stronger than everyone Michael has faced. Johnson grabs the man by the neck and says he talks too much for someone in that position. But then a girl runs up and says that she will do anything, she will serve Johnson, but let him save her father's life. Michael wonders if she has really decided that she is in a place where she can ask him for something. Earl has some kind of black liquid coming from his eyes, he is choking, and the girl continues to beg. Johnson says he doesn't like killing women, but he has to kill his enemies, so she will join her father. Sean stands up for the girl and says that she is not like everyone else. She tried to help him and tried to stop the person who wanted to harm Michael. The main character asks the girl to name the reason why he should not kill her now. She says that she cannot take revenge on him in any way, 
because her family is everything she has, and even if she remains alive, she can guarantee that Mi's family will not will cross his path in the future. Michael tells her to accept this drop of blood to become his servant then he will let her go. She is nervous but agrees to accept it with tears in her eyes. Sean thanks Johnson very much for avenging him, but now he is useless. He says that there is no way to serve, he asks for permission to be alone. Michael says he wouldn't be here if he were useless and writes some kind of list for the girl. He calls Miami over and tells her to buy these medications at the best pharmacy and give them to Sean three times a day. He won't be able to walk for a couple of days, and therefore she must take care of him during this time, she agrees. Sean warmly and tearfully thanks Michael for his attitude towards him. Leslie Clinton drives up to Johnson in the car and says he has news for Mr. The head of the special forces is also sitting in the car. There is a real field laboratory there. They tell Michael that they were able to recognize the face with a 90% probability. He looks at the photo. Johnson thinks that this person looks like a relative of his mother. Dragon spirit specialists think so. And through their database they can get information about him. Michael wants to see him right away. But information about him is classified. We only know that his name is Jesse Howard. Johnson says his mother also had the same last name. Her name was Mary Howard. And they look similar. He remembered that in the family they always changed the topic of conversation. When it came to his mother's family, one of the parents always started talking about something else. But he saw his mother many times looking at the sky of New York. She was very sad at these moments. Michael does not understand why Hunter Torres wanted to destroy their family, and who this Jesse is. Why did mom look at the sky? What did she see? What happened to her parents? Michael must know the answers to these questions. Michael involuntarily flares up with energy, offending his comrades. Leslie complains that if the gentleman does this again, he might throw away his skates. Michael sincerely apologizes. He just gave vent to his emotions a little. He wants to know more about why people's data is hidden. Mark says that this happens if the person is important to the state, as in Michael's case, or if the person is in an unusual martial arts family. Johnson thinks this guy is more likely to have the latter but it's unclear why he didn't have martial arts abilities before, and mom didn't say anything. And ninth place in the ranking is occupied by some unknown Jesse Howard. Michael thinks that this is damn far away. Now if he pushes himself, he will end up in 150 place at most. And even so, he still can't get to the ninth place. Going against him is a real suicide. Michael calms down a little, realizing that he still has a rebirth cemetery. And if he uses the second one, the third one will certainly react. Johnson says to let him know if they find any information about him. Leslie reminds about those people who were recently killed by Michael. People from the mafia called Akita can resist even America. And not just individual people. Johnson says that if they come here, he will let them feel the primal fear on their own skin. Martial Arts Association meeting. The president complains that all these people are useless. During this time they only found a few people similar to the killer. He says that these people are of no use. He needs a criminal, not these stupid people. The vice president says that he will soon turn 60 years old. He needs to calm down. By this date they will find the killer. But he explodes and says that he lost his son. And they talk about his birthday. He is not going to celebrate it. People say that things are not going very well. Which means that the fate of the president will be decided this year. Since the year of fate is coming, nothing is going according to plan and a lot of bad things are happening, you need to switch to something good, and the birthday is quite suitable for this. White thinks that it really wouldn't hurt to have a party. It would be nice to change the mood radically. A man comes and says that someone has sent a package for White. He wishes him a happy birthday. He tries to shoo the courier away. At this moment, the man realizes that something is clearly not as it should be with the gift. He pulls the gift with his power to see what kind of crap is there. Then he opens it and sees the head, his child. People are screaming about how dare they send something like this for a birthday, especially a 60th one. White asks who sent this package, where they went, how they even dared. The courier says that they were wearing glasses and went further down the road. The president, enraged, personally goes to find the sender of the 60th birthday gift. Half an hour later, the president returns. He looks like he is ready to devour people. Everyone is afraid for their lives. It seems he has not found the person he was looking for. White angrily declares that this child has declared war on him. He says that he will see who laughs last. 
Suddenly the phone rings. People at the table are thinking about who will answer it at such an inopportune moment. The head of the association swears that someone should finally take this phone. Why should he do everything himself? Someone takes the phone. They say that Mi's family was destroyed. People are frightened that the whole family is no longer there. There was a great master there. White says that in his opinion the same person who killed his son dealt with the family. He doesn't give a damn about all the laws and provokes the association so that they killed. The president says to call him a hunter until they find out his real name, and also that everyone in the province needs to be warned about him. He says that all members of the martial arts association are obliged to consider the hunter as their enemy. He wants to see his face. Michael asks the messenger if he delivered the gift. He reports that yes, but recommends being on guard, because they called him a hunter and declared him an enemy of the entire martial arts association. Johnson wonders if he intends to celebrate his birthday. He thinks yes, since he liked the idea with the Year of Destiny. The man wonders if Michael intends to do something about this. There will be so many masters there. Michael says that he will say that day that anyone who crosses his path will become an enemy. And the man says that he worries, but is in no position to change anything. The guy examines the broken sword and says that it turned out to be quite useful. And in general he has the opportunity to repair the sword. But it will require a lot of resources and time. Johnson asks that he seemed to be telling Faya not to come to his house anymore. But she says that she came to say that the palace has stopped any search for him. But if information gets back again, it will be harder to stop. Michael understands that since this girl was able to hide information about him, it means that her status in the palace is very high. The girl asks if the guy wants to fix the smashing dragon. He responds by asking where she even got it and thinking about what she called it, and realizes that the name is not bad. Faya says that she will tell, but in return she demands to find out whether it was his doing that he got rid of the Mi family and the death of White's son. Michael says that yes, it was him, and from the photograph it is very clear, even though it was taken from the back. The girl widens her eyes and thinks that the guy is really very strong, but fortunately, she has no complaints against him. Then she says that she knows a little about the sword, but she gave it such a name, she thought that it suited him but it ended up in her hands by accident, because its previous owner died in her arms, and then she received it. The girl says that she knows that the sword is expensive and was forged two centuries ago by the hands of a brilliant blacksmith. For three years he put his heart and soul into it, but in the process of forging the sword he was cursed, so he soon died. Faya says that she wanted to repair the sword, but could not find the necessary resources in all of America because they are very rare. The girl says that, fortunately, that blacksmith still has his relatives. Michael asks where they are, and she says that they are somewhere in New York and their last name is Sanders. Michael is surprised to notice that the Sanders may well be his relatives. He decides that he needs to talk to them as soon as possible. The girl, noticing the guy's face, says that the family he knows is obviously involved in medicine, but this is just a disguise. Their ancestors forged many types of weapons for countless craftsmen. That's why they don't dare mess with her. Jessica and Sarah's voices are heard from behind the door. They say that they are very tired, and then they think it is because of their huge breasts. Fia says that it seems that his mistress has returned, so it is time for her to go. But the girls appear and say that they heard a woman's voice. Where did she go? Did he really bring the girl here? Michael embarrassedly remarks that there are already two beauties here. Why does he need anyone else? Sarah says she told Johnson not to be greedy and Jessica comments that he's being too nice today. We should check out his bedroom. Michael quips that they should check the balcony on the second floor, because there is a great view from there. And F.I., meanwhile, hearing that someone is talking about her, jumps off from there, because it's time for her to get out. Johnson sits with the Sanders and says he didn't think they'd be this close when he called them. Jacob says they ended up here because there's a family meeting that's going on here. He asks if Johnson needs anything. Michael shows off the sword and says he wants to know about it. Sanders asks if he really wants to fix it. He says he needs materials. Johnson thinks about whether it will be now or later, but he needs to fix this sword. The old man says that if the sword was really forged by that master, then the materials must be very rare. But Lilia notes that there are a lot of stingy people in the main family, so she cannot imagine that they would give the materials to an outsider. Michael, with a thoughtful face, Wonders if they will accept the trade, if he offers them cultivation pills, he doesn't think they will refuse. 
Jacob offers to take him to the main house. He will be able to give him excellent recommendations there. Michael says that whether it will work out or not depends on them anyway. He leaves it to his discretion. The Sanders estate. The granddaughter with her grandfather and Johnson have arrived at the site. A meeting of relatives will begin soon. Some people come out and demand that those who came introduce themselves. Jacob identifies himself and says that he has a report for the head. People say they need recommendations from senior members to meet the head. They are told to go where they came from. Sanders says he thinks it's time for Johnson and him to bow out and come up with something else. Some girl appears, she says. Don't they know that her father is busy with important things? Lilia says that this is one of the three beauties, like Sarah. However, she says that this girl ranks first among them. And she also notes that if she helps us, there will be hope. Then Lilia notices that she is specific and very accommodating. And Michael says that he had no intention of communicating with her. Katie Sanders wonders if it is Johnson. She has heard so much about him. Because she is Jenkins' best friend. So she knows that Michael is the youngest master in America and the instructor of the dragon spirit. The girl says that she paid attention to him because the dragon spirit notices few people. But he noticed him. Katie asks that he is unlikely to be here because of her. And Michael says that he knows that the Sanders family used to forge swords. And he needs materials. The girl giggles slightly and says that she will do everything in her power to help. But they have forged countless swords. Which one is he talking about? Johnson puts the sword on the table. The girl becomes furious, asking how it came into his hands. Michael notes that this sword is apparently very valuable to their family. The girl shouts out that her great-grandfather bequeathed before his death that the appearance of this sword is foreshadowed by the return of the emperor. She cannot believe that the broken sword appeared today. She approaches Johnson and shouts out that she is ready to buy him at any price. She is ready to give 200 million. He can make all the demands. They will be an immeasurable debt to him. Michael arrogantly remarks that money and their favor are worthless to someone like him. He only wants to get the materials. The girl gets very upset and asks to forgive her. Because she takes such things seriously, she cannot tell him anything about the materials. Because this is their faith. Johnson assumes that this conversation is over says goodbye and gets ready to leave. Someone is sitting on the roof and targeting the window with Sanders and Johnson. Michael feels the shot, catches the bullet with two fingers and looks out the window. The girl is already screaming into the phone that someone tried to shoot her. She orders that a killer be brought to her in ten minutes. Faya thanks Johnson and says that she is indebted to him. But he interrupts her and says that her kindness is not worth a penny. A dungeon, a tied-up man hanging upside down, a girl wondering who wanted to kill her and who ordered it. The killer says something incomprehensible. She is not satisfied with this answer. So she takes this man's life with a knife. Johnson just left the coffee shop. But he realizes that someone has already come for the girl. They are really something. And then he thinks that the Sanders family hid their origins with pharmaceuticals. The Unknown and the Me family are just the tip of the iceberg of this province. Jessica calls Johnson, she asks him to return to the Tazen Group building, because they are having some difficulties. Michael says that Sarah understands much better than he does, but the girl reports that Walsh left with her mother to see off her grandmother, she will return in a week. In the background, Jessica has a strange man with guards, she asks not to ask anything and to come here. The guy asks who is in charge here, the girl says that he is already on his way, they can contact her with any questions. He wonders if she knows what his company needs most now. Jessica asks what, and he impudently says, that is insecurity. He says that if they want to stay afloat, they need protection, so they can be the ones to take them under their wing. He is from the Lay family. He says that for 20% of the company's shares, no one will dare to lay a finger on them anymore. This is great news for the company. Nightingale says that they are not selling shares and are not going to, and he says that she did not understand, he is not buying them. But taking them. He says that the action is a gift. He says that the easiest way for them is to knock Tazen Group out of the business world. Lei says that he doesn't mind reducing the percentage if she spends the night with him and offers to indulge in love. He orders his guards to go out the door and make sure that no one interferes. The girl asks what he wants. He says that he wants to take her. Then Michael appears. He knocks down the door with the bodies of the guards, hitting the guy too and asks if it was him he was looking for. Johnson, Ignoring Leia, asks if this guy has touched Jessica. She says that not yet. She says that the security will start working only tomorrow. Michael says that the main thing is that she is safe and asks to wait for him outside. 
The girl sweats a little, but agrees. Lee asks if Michael knows who he is, and Johnson questioningly says that he's some kind of amo punk and slaps him. The guy, filled with tears, asks what kind of amo punk he is. He even knows who his father is, how he even dares to touch him. Michael slaps the guy on the cheek once again, wondering why he should care if he's not his father. Lay clutches his face, cries, and with a very sad look complains that he was touched again. One more blow, and his family will begin the hunt for Johnson. Michael ignores the guy's threats and kicks him into the ceiling. Johnson tears off a bunch of hair from the guy and says that today he will lose his wig, despite all his nagging. Michael calls and says that the Lay family must leave the province in ten minutes, and the head must call his useless son again. Lay tries to complain and wonder who Johnson thinks he is, but he gets another slap in the face from Michael. The emo punk asks not to be touched anymore, then his phone rings. He says that it's his dad calling. He says that Michael still has a chance to improve, or Lay will tell him what he did. Johnson tells him to shut up and pick up the phone already. The guy thinks why his father called right now, when they told him about the disappearance of the family. But this can't happen. Michael says that this is the last call of his life. Is Lay sure that he does not want to answer? Punk doesn't believe that his family could have been dealt with like that in 10 minutes, but he still picks up the phone. The father is on the line, he asks who his retarded son has contacted. Because of him the entire estate is filled with corpses. The child is shocked. He cries and repents, asking to be forgiven, saying that he was just mistaken. In fact he is different. Johnson cuts off the head with his hand and says that the moment he decided to touch his girlfriend, he lost the right to life. Martial Arts Association meeting, Tyler White complains that a lot of time has passed and there is still no news. A trusted man says that someone is destroying evidence as soon as it is found. The hunter's past is more complicated than they thought. A young man appears and says that there is a girl outside who knows the identity of the hunter. Lucy Vox appears and identifies herself. She says that her family is now being threatened. Will they help if she tells about the hunter? White is indignant at first. But then his face changes and says that he will not just help, but will make her his goddaughter. She will be granted fame and protection. She points and says she knows the man in the photo. White thinks about whether this child really killed Rio, who was in the 300th place in the ranking, and his son. The girl says that she filmed him killing Mr. Rio during the Duel of Masters. The president looks and realizes that this is really the same man they called the hunter. White's face changes and seriously shouts that everyone needs to find him immediately. He wants to get Johnson's head. Lucy thinks that Michael didn't want to save her family, so let him run away from the wrath of the Martial Arts Association. Wally F.A. calls Michael. He says that the president has learned that the hunter, this is Michael, urgently needs to flee abroad, preferably somewhere far away. Johnson asks who told. He says that Lucy Vox appeared and pointed to the photo. Now she is his goddaughter. Michael promises that he will kill her, although he does not like killing girls. Michael tells Jessica that she needs to stay in this building. It is under his control. And then, when everything calms down, she can leave. Locke appears, sits on his knee and greets the girl with Johnson. All the people in the building warmly greet Johnson and Jessica. Sarah thinks in shock about how much power Michael really has in his hands. She realizes that everyone present here is a martial artist. John says that the Lord can leave Mrs. Nightingale here without any fear until not a single hair falls from her head in the building, no matter how many masters the Martial Arts Association sends. Some big guy in the Walsh house asks Steve why he didn't tell him earlier about the similarities between Johnson and the hunter. If he knows him very well, he says that he's not interested in this child. How does he know much about him? The healthy guy says that he won't be fooled so easily. Everyone knows that Sarah is close to Johnson. He tells her to come to him. The guy continues to press, but the father says that Sarah, the bride of one of the boards, thinks well and decides to leave, saying that they will contact him if there is new information. Katie sits and reads the news that Johnson slaughtered the Ng family and White's son. The head of the Sanders family comes to her and, calling her madam, asks why she called him. She says that there is no need to be so polite to her and reports that she found the same sword on Johnson. Patrick is shocked by what he heard. Is he very nervous? Wonders if this is the same Johnson, who was recently named a hunter, the girl confirms his fears. Katie wonders how likely it is that the Sanders family will do anything to protect him. The man says 70%, because helping Johnson will put them among the enemies of the White family. 
The girl says that compared to the value of this sword for their family, the White's disfavor is a small problem. Patrick says that he will do everything possible, but at the moment he is the enemy of almost the entire province. Jesse Howard practices cultivation. He says that he would not have achieved such success if it were not for his old master, because ninth place in the ranking is strong. The Minion reports that Johnson killed the son of the president of the Martial Arts Association and the Mee family. The old man asks what he was told. He thought that Michael would not last long. Who would have thought that he would not only survive, but also create such a mess? The servant says that now every dog of white is looking for him. Jesse decides that Johnson may be a bastard, but he has some kind of attitude towards them, so they can't let him just die like that. Jesse sends the servant to further observe the situation, and he himself thinks that Johnson really interested him. Tyler White sits and angrily tells his people that a whole day has passed and there is not a single news about the bastard. He even knows how to fly. The big guy comes and says there are still a few places they haven't checked, some families they've been avoiding, and a dragon spirit. White shouts in rage that if his parents are dead, is there really no other relative? Vox shows his voice and says that he knows that Johnson can be influenced with the help of his friend Jessica Nightingale. Perhaps they are in a relationship. White says that he definitely hid Jessica. Lucy also talks about other acquaintances, including Clark and the family of restorators. White looks mysteriously and tells Lucy to go and take with her all the craftsmen needed to bring Robert Clark and the Moresby family here. Tyler is asked where he is going to hold the banquet in honor of his birthday. He says that he wants to hold it in a villa restored after the murder of the Johnson family. He wants this child to come to where his parents died and watch the death of his loved ones. Michael sits and thinks about how he's been here for five days and nothing has happened yet. Locke has blocked communications inside the building, so he doesn't even know what's happening outside. Michael asks to go outside, and John gives him a large satellite phone. The guy is even shocked by its size, and Locke says that it is modified, you can even hit him with it. Johnson calls the vice president of the association and asks about the news. He tells him all of Tyler White's plans. Michael instantly becomes gloomy. The phone cracks in his hands. He orders Locke to immediately organize quick access to New York for him. Johnson rides a motorcycle, while he is informed that Clark could not be protected and the diner was destroyed. Lucy comes to her old bullies, who, seeing her new support, step back and say that they never intended to harm the Vox family. She says that the most resourceful survive, and why would they think that the Voxes will not touch them now? The girl demands the man to kneel otherwise his entire clan will be destroyed. The head of the Meng family is extremely dissatisfied with this situation, but he has a family and a child, and they need to be protected. The man breaks his forehead in his pleas, but the mean girl doesn't care, she sets on her thugs. The Meng people go on the attack, the masters fight, the father thinks about how to protect the child, but the girl says that the child should not be lost. The man lights up with a beige flame and tells her to stop this chaos, he is still the head, he should not be underestimated. The association master sends Meng flying, swinging at his young son. The fist is almost in contact with the innocent head of a small innocent child, but then the main character appears and stops the blow, confusing his enemies. Johnson delivers a series of crushing blows, turning the recently strong master into a mess of bones and meat. Lucy orders the remaining masters to capture him, because it is Johnson himself. One of the thugs starts a pompous speech but Michael orders him to shut up and knocks his head off his shoulders with one kick. The last master understands that Johnson's abilities are simply unimaginable, and therefore he must report this to the association, so he runs. Vox shouts after his last fighter, how dare he leave her? Tyler White will find out about everything and he will be finished. The master says who cares about her life when death is at stake. Michael, running alongside him, says that he speaks the truth. The master does not yet have time to come to his senses, but the guy delivers a crushing blow, sending him to the next world. Michael says that God did not deprive Lucy of her appearance, or her rich family. Why does she continue to interfere with him? He says that she humiliated him five years ago. He saved her life only because she is a pathetic woman and is not worth his energy. He has only one question. Where are his loved ones? The pretty beaten girl says that she will tell everything and will not refuse anything. Michael, without any hesitation or mercy, 
slams his fist into her face, shouting whether she is even worthy of this. After the blow, she flies away a decent distance. Michael repeats his question. She answers with difficulty that all his friends are already in that villa. Johnson calls Locke and asks him to immediately send a car for him as quickly as possible. Lucy thinks that she was carried away, but Michael says that he is not leaving because he is afraid of getting dirty in her blood. He throws a stone at her, punching right through her. The Meng family hardly notices how quickly everything ended. Not a single master remained. They admire Johnson's incredible strength. All the family members bow and thank Michael, but he says it's nothing. There is a banquet at the villa. Everyone congratulates White. There are many craftsmen. Everyone is waiting for the hunter to arrive. The Sanders are wondering if they can protect Johnson if he does come, since they will become White's enemies. Tyler stands in front of everyone present. He speaks and says that everyone must be aware of what actions he intends to take based on the events of the last few days. The doors open. Clark and the Moresby family come out. It seems they had a hard time getting here. Clark says he doesn't understand why they were called here. He wants to call the police. But White shouts, using magic, that they must kneel. Link calls the head of the association an old senile. He says that you would have to be crazy to mess with his parents. White grabs Moresby by the head and throws him against the wall. He says even though his cultivation has improved, but his upbringing is exactly the same as Johnson's. Tyler says it would have taken half a second to get rid of this guy if he hadn't used him as bait for a big fish. White crushes Robert under him. He says that he knows that this man runs on business errands for Michael. He is sure that his tongue, like that of a businessman, is suspended. Tyler says that today is his birthday, and therefore, if Clark says something nice to him, then he might spare him. But the man, despite the fact that he does not know who he is dealing with, only says that anyone anyone who crosses Johnson's path ends his life in agony. Clark flies into the wall, and Johnson appears at the door with a coffin and says that he brought a gift with him. Everyone around is surprised by the hunter's appearance. Katie Sanders is especially surprised, and Steve Walsh doesn't understand what he forgot here. This is absurd. Johnson, with an arrogant face, displays the gift and invites the president of the association to lie down in it. A crowd of association thugs rushes at Michael from all sides, but he wields the coffin like a weapon and inflicts great damage on everyone. Witnesses wonder why the hell Johnson is using the coffin as a weapon, it's so heavy. White orders everyone to kill him, calling his people non-entities, and Michael emotionlessly reports that everyone who crosses his path is dead. Johnson turns the coffin around like a light toy and destroys all the attackers without difficulty. White, in the blood of his people, thinks that Michael does not seem to feel the weight of the coffin. It is like feathers to him. Michael, blazing with energy, throws the charged coffin straight at the president of the association and shouts for him to catch it. Tyler knocks the coffin off, but with some difficulty. Besides, that blow should have smashed the coffin into dust, but there is not a scratch on it, but White orders him to bow down. The president thinks that he did not use all his strength, but the energy from the coffin is really inexplicably powerful. He reflects that if he had not managed to put the block in time, his arm might have broken. Tyler looks at the coffin and realizes that he underestimated Michael's strength. He understands that only with all his might will he be able to defeat this opponent. Johnson is distracted by the injured Clark, but Moresby is told that they still have some pills left. They can handle it themselves. Michael is needed elsewhere. He says that whoever even touches them with a finger will not leave a wet spot. White says he admires Michael's arrogance. He really thinks this banquet is so important to him. The only thing he wants is to behead Johnson, calling on his people. There are several masters around. They occupy some places from 178 to 203 in the ranking. Everyone around notices that they are the highest ranking masters in the martial arts world of the province. White states that he can no longer hide his abilities. In fact, he is not in 189th place, but in 147th place. Tyler says that Johnson may be a genius, but this is where his path ends. He orders his men to capture the guy, strip him of his abilities and plunge his soul into despair. The Sanders come down the stairs and ask if he will allow this to continue if they side with Johnson. White does not understand what is happening and asks again what they are talking about. Katie says that she hopes to see the true face of Mr. White. She says to have mercy on Michael. The craftsmen notice that the Sanders are no slouch and recently some strong master ordered weapons from them. Tyler asks why they made this decision, 
Sanders says that the guy has what they need, she is sure that the president would not want to face the consequences of a hasty decision. Katie says she will get Michael out of here alive, and he will give her the sword. White gets angry. Johnson wonders why he didn't say that he was going to leave. The girl looks at Michael in shock, clearly not expecting such an answer. He says the Sanders family has nothing to do with this, so let her go. The Masters and Tyler are shocked. They think Michael is out of his mind. The head of the Sanders almost explodes, but the girl stops him and says that they will wait. She tells him not to hesitate to contact them if he changes his mind, but with strong dissatisfaction he sends her away to just watch. White says that since death is what he wants, then so be it. He even rejected his last chance to survive. Tyler orders that Johnson be dealt with quickly, and all the eminent masters rush at him. Michael multiplies, dodging all attacks aimed at him by enemies. The masters see this and don't understand what happened. Some think it's an illusion. Some say they've never seen anything like this in their lives. Johnson appears behind one of the opponents, about to strike, but he manages to dodge. However, it turns out to be only a copy, and the other Michael grabs the master's leg and hits him on the floor. He crushes his opponent's face with his foot. Everyone around is shocked by what they see. Are their eyes deceiving them? Katie doesn't believe that he is so cool. But the masters see that their ally is dead. They call it meanness. One says that the others should be on alert, because the guy uses illusions and strikes on the sly. Michael ironically remarks that the four of them were the first to attack him, and now they call him a scoundrel, and then says that he understood one thing, none of them are his equal, even without illusions. The strongest one notices that Johnson is extremely arrogant, and Michael says that it will be interesting to try his sword on them. The masters take out their weapons, saying that they can't do anything with a broken blade, and they will smear it across the wall in a second. Three masters simultaneously rush at the guy, using all their skills. Michael deals with all his opponents without any problems. Those watching don't believe it, they think they are dreaming. The Sanders note that Johnson only needed one blow per man, which may be the strength of that sword. Johnson wonders how these clowns can be called martial artists. Disgraceful. The last of the masters tells Michael to stop looking down on people. He cultivates unshakable strength. He will not wait for an easy death. Johnson asks if that means he can have fun, and the master says that's not what he meant. The president says that this is his rival, and the fighter says that the guy is cunning and the sword is blind. Problems may arise, only a joint attack can come to a good ending. White says that he will attack first, and let the warrior wait for the right moment to attack. The men rush into battle and shout that they will kill Michael right now. The guy does not understand how Tyler took the presidency. Laughter and that's all. White acknowledges Johnson's strength, but says today is the last day he stands on earth. The president uses the spiritual seal of snakes. Patrick notes that one must have considerable strength for such a technique. Michael deflects, saying that the performance intrigues him, but his blade doesn't care about all his skills. White taunts Johnson, saying that he can only swing the sword, so he will never reach his speed. Michael teleports straight to the president, saying that he is finished and he calls for a second warrior to strike right now. The fighter catches Johnson and says that he will now do nothing to save himself. White rushes at his opponent to finish him off. But Michael, even from that position, hits the president in the face right during his flight. The big man, despite the slight defeat, shouts that he still blocked his only fatal move. He is helpless in his hands. Michael swings his leg and kicks his opponent in the balls as hard as he can, crushing his opponent. The man bends into a fetal position and sweating profusely says that, apparently, his indestructible strength still has a weak spot. Johnson swings his arms and says that, having lost control, he becomes an ordinary person, he is finished, but he asks him to stop and wait. But despite this, Michael delivers a fatal blow, leaving his opponent no chance. People are shocked that his head was cut off, the guy has not been human for a long time. Katie thinks she misunderstood, because in fact, what matters most is not the sword, but Johnson himself. Michael goes down to his injured opponent. He says that now it's his turn. He wonders if the president will listen to him, or throw away his last chance at life. Tyler rips his clothes and screams that Michael destroyed his power, reputation and family. He will never forgive this, even if today is his last day. White says Johnson, the first opponent in as many years to put his life on the line to achieve death, admits he underestimated his enemy 
but the feud will end here and now with the death of only one. Michael prepares to attack and quips that it will be the death of Tyler White. The sword cuts through Tyler's side, severing a limb and creating a deep cut into his body. Michael wonders if the president really put his strength on defense so as not to fall apart, and he says that the guy is in vain to boast, because he is just a dog in the world of martial arts. White wonders why Johnson killed his son if they had no reason to be feuding. The hero says that White and his entire family did a lot of crap. They massacred the entire Stark family for some piece of jade. Many other families suffered. Do they even know what karma is? He also says that he killed Mr. Ree even earlier. This already cast doubt on the friendship of the Whites and Johnson. And his vice president, Wally F.A., standing next to him, is also his subordinate. White says that even as a ghost, he will still get Johnson. Michael says that being a ghost of this level must be difficult. But now, it's time to end this circus. Someone enters the hall and orders to stop what is happening here. Some people appear. They say that they came from the American Martial Arts Bureau. The main one asks to give him the blade. White rejoices that his precious master came to save his life, just in time. Some elderly man in a top hat says that Michael must put down his sword. All issues are resolved by the Bureau and he is just a malicious offender, and must pay. Michael asks again, saying that he has not heard of such people. Katie calls him over. She says that this is the highest authority in the martial arts, comparing them to the spirit of the dragon. But among the masters, everyone must obey them, he should lower his sword, even Johnson is a little surprised. The man says that he is obliged to report this dispute to his superiors, everything must be considered impartially. White invited people from the bureau here to prevent Johnson from winning over the masters to his side, but he did not expect that he would lose while he waited for them. Michael silently raises his leg over the president's head and crushes it. Johnson apologizes, but says his smirking smile annoyed him. The audience explodes. They see that Michael disobeyed. Everyone says that now he is finished. Nothing will stop the wrath of the martial arts bureau. The old man reluctantly reports that the young man nevertheless decided to challenge the Bureau. He says that only the Bureau has the right to judge criminals, and therefore everyone else should leave the building. Everyone is afraid and decides to disperse, but Wally F.A. does not dare to leave his master, but he writes him a message, saying that he can leave him. The foreman from the Bureau is indignant that Johnson is on the phone, but he tells him to wait, soon it will be his turn. Sanders is trying to convey to Johnson that insulting the Bureau is not at all the same as irritating the association. The Bureau belongs to the state, and a simple warning will not get you off. Michael asks if she's mocking him, who allowed her to interfere in the first place. She doesn't like him anymore. What the hell is she doing? The girl gets embarrassed and says that it has absolutely nothing to do with it. The man asks Katie to leave the premises, otherwise she will be treated according to the law. The girl leaves dissatisfied and says that she didn't give a damn about Michael, he just has a blade. The old man says that Johnson violated the ninth article of the martial arts law, so they can sentence him to death. Michael gets irritated by such formalities. Do they really want to shame him? The man asks if the accused wants to speak out, but he sarcastically refuses. The old man asks Michael not to put him in an awkward position, and then calls his warriors, who land near the master. They turn out to be a special squad of the American Martial Arts Bureau. Michael says that he has no idea who these clowns are. The old man says that these people are so strong that even the Chinese general said that his troops would not dare cross the border if the American Martial Arts Bureau were fighting against them. Michael says that they are talking outright nonsense, and the fighters rush to attack him. The masters begin to circle around Johnson. The head says that this is a bait to lower his guard, but Michael is already aware. The strategy is for the special squad soldiers to surround the opponent, and even if he attacks one, the other three will attack from behind. The soldiers rush, but in the end they only collide with each other, because Michael was not there. The masters go on the attack again, saying that there are more of them, which means they are stronger. With one blow, Johnson puts the entire special squad on his shoulder. They are finished. The old man asks if he even realizes what he has done. He says that if he does not stop, then it will be his turn. He uses his technique, gives birth to a cute pony and tells this foal to incinerate Michael. Johnson dodges all the blows. The bureau member is shocked. He trained this skill throughout his life. He can deliver 10 blows per second, and Michael seems to be playing with him. The main character swings his blade towards his opponent, 
he says that it is time for the old man to get acquainted with the masters of the younger generation. Another person, to Michael's irritation, tells him to stop, that he passed the test. The man thinks about how strong this guy is, despite his youth, and the old man thanks for the help. The man reports that he did what he had to do. The new man says that killing a bureau member is a crime, and therefore he will be executed by him personally. Johnson, with an arrogant face and the stump of a sword, says that he will still see who will kill whom. A man notices a bullet flying near his face. A special dragon spirit squad appears. They say that this meaningless battle must end. The man asks if they really decided to go after the martial artist with a firearm. Mark Seed says that this also applies to the spirit of the dragon. The man notices that the special squad commander is nervous. Mark says that Johnson is their main instructor. So they have a lot to do with this. So he, Ken Evans, must stop if he does not want to face the consequences. The old man says that Sid must think about the consequences. Michael will stand trial. Which means that there is now a conflict between the Bureau and the Special Forces. Mark shouts that as long as Johnson is in America, the Dragon Spirit is not afraid of any battles, so no one will dare to lay a finger on him. Ken, with incredible anger, says that Mark needs to take back his words, otherwise he will regret them. Michael says he doesn't want the two most important organizations in America to confront each other, so he proposes to fight in a duel of masters in five days, this battle will have nothing to do with the Bureau or Special Forces. It will only be Johnson and Evans. Sid says that Ken is an unusual master, but the Dragon Spirit will do anything to protect Michael. Evans asks if Mark still wants to save Johnson, but Sid says that he seems to have been misunderstood. He came to save the Bureau from Michael, not Michael from the Bureau. Ken explodes at the whole villa and says that since Johnson accounts for death this way, he will get it in five days. He will show what the Master who occupies 99th place in the ranking, is worth. Sid says that Michael will not gain a foothold in the martial arts world if he kills Ken. Johnson appears, saying that he had no intention of settling there. Besides, they couldn't let him go anyway after White's death. He says that if Mark protects him now, it still won't change anything. They will attack him later secretly. But Sid's act touched him. So if the dragon spirit needs his help in the future, he will not stand aside. Appalachian Mountains, Board has recovered from the reverse curse sent to him by Michael. He is much better, but the wound still hurts. He asks his father how long they will stay here. They have been here for more than a week, and the door has not yet been opened. The father says that with enough sincerity, a great one will definitely appear. If the Board family wants to earn a reputation, then this is the only way. They must be patient. The man thinks that their goal was never to become the strongest family but shouts that for the sake of the father they will ascend and become the strongest. In the process of these reasonings, that same master appears, he comes out, surrounded by waves of his energy. The ancient master asks how long they have been waiting for him. The boards invite him to visit, but he says that he is already used to living in the wilderness, and he loves to feel freedom. Father Bordov asks you not to make hasty conclusions and shows you something that immediately attracts the interested master to you. It turns out that this is a box with a key. The master asks where they got this key from, then realizes that they are martial artists, not cultivators, and therefore cannot know about it. But he continues to wonder how it came into their hands. Board says that this key has been passed down in their family from generation to generation. They hope that with its help the master will take control of the family. He says that he is ready to go beyond the gates for this, but no more than a month. The father sadly thinks that the relics of his ancestors unfortunately, are only enough to keep the master and the family for so little. The master says that during this time he will find himself a student, and the father quickly introduces his son. Derek sits down on his knees and nervously introduces himself to Master Kyle Phillips. Kyle says that the muscles and bones are pretty good, and therefore he offers a gift as a student. Derek thanks him profusely. Villa, Michael comes in and sees Moresby's sad parents. He wonders why they are like this. Do they really not like the place? Katie thinks that there is not a single scratch on Michael and brings out Link, who is almost completely bandaged, but still cheerful. He says that Michael is very cool, the guy wants to be like him. Johnson says that while Moresby trains, he becomes tougher, and the girl wonders if Michael is interested in a deal with the sword. The main character asks if she has really changed her mind, and she says that the blade has become Johnson's weapon, and now she is unable to take it away. The girl says that the materials are still hard to get, 
but Michael wonders how much he will have to pay to get them. She says that the blade does not need a price. If it is already worthy of a hero, let him come to the Sanders tomorrow. They will think together about what can be done with it. Johnson says that he will definitely come tomorrow and thinks that then he will definitely kick Ken out of 99th place. Johnson in his villa thinks that his girls should no longer hide, since the problem with the association has been solved, the house has become lively. Michael says that there are no messages from the capital, nothing is known about the parents. The only lead at the moment remains Jesse Howard, who ranks ninth in the ranking. Michael is delving into his past and future, but at that moment he sees that someone is watching him from the window. Outside the window there is a guy with white eyes and a gloomy appearance. Johnson carefully peers out the window, but there is no one there anymore. Did it really seem to him that someone was definitely watching him from the window? He doesn't know who. Capital, Master Howard is playing a game with some old man. Jesse is interested in why he came. He reports that he came to visit his son. Howard worries about his strength, but his father reassures him and tells him that he is the strongest son he has besides the one who went to Appalachia. He asks about Johnson's mother. But the old man explodes, saying that he's talking about her, that she doesn't deserve a family. She gave birth to a man who spoils their whole family. But that guy comes running, he says that Johnson killed White. The old man asks his grandson about which Johnson he is talking about. He is clearly shocked by the appearance of his grandfather. He says that this is the same Michael they are thinking about, and White was the leader in the province. The father is interested in how such an influential person as Tyler White fell at the hands of some boy. The son says that he fell to members of the Martial Arts Bureau. The guy also killed five masters. The grandfather asks his grandson to tell him more about this Johnson. He is very interested. He seems to the old man to be a fairly strong master. His grandson says that throughout America he is considered almost the second master in the entire country. Jesse says that he wants to meet with him because he was investigating the incident at the villa, and it's very interesting where he disappeared for five whole years, what he was doing then. But grandfather says that he is one of the top hundred masters, and therefore the meeting with the Howards is not worthy of him. The old man wonders if his rich pedigree influenced his powers, maybe that's the case. Grandfather says that to meet them he needs to at least top the rankings. Johnson sits and asks F.I.A. why she would appear like a ghost and ask for a room when she could just knock. She doesn't believe he killed White. He asks what she really wants from him. She says that this matter has caused a lot of noise in the palace. Michael is the first daredevil who went against the bureau. The girl says that tomorrow he will go with her to the palace to find out the real head of the province. He thinks that the girl is just a pain in the ass and wonders what kind of head he is. Jessica knocks on the door and says she's back. Faya immediately disappears. She asks if the guy missed her. He says that she seems to have gotten used to living here. But she says that it's nothing like that. Nightingale says she thought about it for a long time and decided that even though she didn't like to fight, she wanted to protect herself. Michael argues that he is glad that she has finally made up her mind. All that remains is to think about what will suit her better, and says that he will take note of her desire. Johnson happily says that then it's time to try to do this. Jessica looks on blankly. Palace of Assassins, the head asks if he understood correctly that Johnson refused an audience. But the girl reports that he is busy and will definitely come later. He asks again how the father is. She has no choice but to say that he is simply not interested in the palace. Lin Fong says that the guy is not a prick, then he will meet him himself. It's very interesting to look at him. Michael came to the Sanders to forge a sword, but for some reason he ended up in the bedroom, wondering if Katie was going to charm him. She says that he didn't quite understand because this is not only her bedroom, but also a secret forge. The girl hits the wall with her fingers. A secret passage opens. They go deeper into the room along the stairs. She says that all the attributes are just the cover. Michael thinks about it. It's not so easy to make a tunnel like that from the bedroom. Johnson sees that there are many weapons around, the sword flies into the air, and the girl says that there are souls of 10,000 blades, but even they are all no match for this broken blade. Michael jumps up for the sword, grabbing it. The girl shouts that it is too early, since it has absorbed a lot of energy, and can be dangerous. Johnson feels the resistance of the sword and chuckles at this, he waits for awakening. The girl screams that if he uses power like this, something will happen but she sees that the guy is already coping with the power of the sword, she understands that the power in the sword is incomprehensible, and Johnson subjugated it to himself like this, he is even more terrible, 
than she thought. Katie shows the mineral from which the sword is forged. She says that to repair it, you need to break the crystal. She also says that this stone is unusual, so she must wait for a master to help. But Johnson decides to do it himself. With brute force, while the girl screams, he knocks out a piece of crystal from the masonry, leaving her in horror. A strangely dressed man appears, he says not to touch the stone. How did he even get here? Michael comes to Katie's defense, saying that there is some kind of pervert here. She says that he belongs to her. The girl reports that this is the best swordsmith who arrived from the capital, and he is also a friend of her grandfather. He shows off and asks if he should make a sword for this guy today. Michael thinks that the guy is somehow strange. He would rather forge the sword himself. The blacksmith is indignant that Michael simply cannot know everything that is necessary. It will take at least ten years. Michael asks if the girl has prepared everything he asked. The girl agrees and wonders if he wants to give up the master. Johnson says he must forge his own blade. Michael wonders if there is another way when he puts the hot ore into the furnace. The girl says that he uses the furnace without a master. But the master laughs that he is already giving up. Johnson successfully forges the sword. There is smoke and flames all around. You can feel the intense heat and confidence of Michael. The guy starts using stones. The man says that the stones cost almost as much as high-quality pills. The girl says that for the sake of this legendary sword they didn't mind. Michael casts a spell over the smelter, using his powerful magic to set everything on fire. The girl says that she has never seen anything like this before. What kind of tricks with fire are these? But the master confidently shouts that this is a trap for a ghost. Blue flames blaze around. The sword's spirit appears in the form of a dragon and begins to look at Johnson. The blacksmith is very surprised. He curses and does not believe that what he sees really exists. The master says that he was an unsurpassed blacksmith all his life, but it turned out that he was nothing but crap. With a sinking heart, the blacksmith notices that this guy is a real master, because he managed to restore such a legendary blade. The man asks old man Howard why he is so nervous, whether things have been bad lately or whether practice is not easy. Another says that he already saw such a face on the master five years ago. Is it really because of his daughter again? A third says that with her dedication to training, she was able to set foot in the Appalachians like her older brother. Only she decided to marry an ordinary man. The man has heard enough of this nonsense. He orders it to stop. Today they have gathered to discuss affairs in America, and not his personal life. In the distance there is a large flash of energy in the skies. It seems to them that this is a phenomenon of God's creation. It is a beacon giving guidance to the heavens. Some people resist the will of heaven, and some terrify them. The masters understand that this is a threat from heaven. Has a demonic force really appeared in America? An unknown man sits in front of the sigil and casts many spells. Gradually everything around him becomes dark. Something happened to his face. Everyone asks what's wrong with him. He says that this is the payment for the power of heaven. The victim says that this signal is in New York. The old man thinks with horror about that illegitimate child whether he has inherited such spiritual talent. He thinks that at the birth of the child, he sent a servant there. He said that Johnson does not have such power. He is just a child. His mother's power was wasted. Michael swings his new blade and realizes that it exceeds all his expectations. The blacksmith sits down on his knee and begs to be forgiven for the insult inflicted on such a master. He asks to take him as an apprentice. Johnson says that he doesn't care. He won't take him as an apprentice let him get up. He thinks that he will now teach this man a lesson, but his strength leaves him because he has spent too much. Michael wakes up in the Sanders' house. Fortunately, the sword is still with him. No one took it. He can't believe he lost consciousness. Johnson realizes that he has no clothes and is in Katie Sanders' bedroom. He hopes that this girl didn't do anything to him while he was sleeping. Katie appears and says that she didn't think he would wake up so soon. Maybe he should get some more sleep. Michael asks if she undressed him. She says she did it because his clothes were wet. She didn't want him to catch a cold. Johnson did not expect that this would happen and does not blame the girl. Now Johnson is in debt to her family. If she needs something, then let her ask. And he also hopes that no one will know about today. She can guarantee that. Sean is training. Michael is interested in how he recovered so quickly that he is already back training, all thanks to the pills. Johnson says that he has 20 pills in the package. But he gives them for a reason, but with the goal that Sean will join the first 150 people in the ranking in two months. 
Former me thinks that this is madness, but understands that the gentleman believes in him, and he has first-class pills, which means he can handle it. Sean shouts with enthusiasm that he will unconditionally carry out the assignment. Michael leaves and says that he expects good news from him in the future. A leaf flies near Johnson and sticks into the wall, cracking it. Michael realizes that there is no such a strong master in the province now. The main character walks through the park, there he sees a strange guy. He wonders where he came from, it turns out to be one of the killers belonging to the palace. He says he just wanted to see the guy who turned him down twice to see what he can do. Luckily he's not disappointed. The head of the palace offers a bet. If Johnson can catch up with him, then the palace will not have any claims. But if not, then the guy himself will become a killer. Michael wonders if their organization is worthy of having a killer like him in its ranks. Lin says that he has a lot of strong masters in his ranks. Nothing should face him. But Johnson says that he may not be ready to do what they do. But the weapon in his hands is very interesting to him. Finn thinks he only has two of these shuriken. But if it helps him get Michael, then so be it. So he says they have an agreement. He says that Johnson must take them away, launching his powerful magical attack that surrounds the entire area. Lin asks if Michael still wants to get his shuriken. Why is he so quick? Johnson says that he is not obliged to respond to such childish attacks. Michael tells his opponent to take the bet seriously. He calls him names and throws a shuriken, telling Johnson to fight him off. The magic, along with the shuriken, collides with Johnson's shield. He almost withstands the attack, but at the last moment the shield splits. Finn sees the explosion. He wonders if he accidentally killed Michael. Lin comes closer and sees that Johnson is holding his shuriken in his hands and says that now it belongs to him. The head of the palace opens his eyes in horror, sweating. He thinks about how he even decided to cross the path of this monster. Johnson leaves and hopes that now the organization of killers will become unstuck from him. And if he is disturbed again, he will not be so courteous. Lin Fong doesn't believe in his defeat. If it were another person, he wouldn't have tried so hard. But this is Johnson. He can't stop it. He got him interested in his indifference and lust for murder. Pink steam comes from his mouth. He understands that Michael is a born killer. He was born as one and will die as one, whether he knows it or not. Johnson realizes that everyone is noticing him because with this sword he attracts a lot of attention, but also scares off the common people. He thinks about what's the matter, the sword is fine, and why the stone is glowing. Michael again accidentally finds himself in the cemetery of rebirths. Now, a dragon is flying around, he doesn't believe it, but he understands that it's all because of his dragon blade. Michael thinks that the cemetery likes such strong auras. He didn't think that the stone could withstand such a spirit. Johnson awakens and reflects that the very essence of the cemetery is to contain powerful spiritual artifacts. Michael gets a call from Leslie. He says that he spotted an entire ship from an island state. It seems that this Akita is sailing towards Johnson's soul. Michael thinks that there is no point in making a fuss about this. Clinton says she will continue to monitor them, and Michael should be more careful. Johnson quickly forgets about the Japanese. He is more interested in thinking about the Black Pebble. He is terribly interested in learning everything about it. Leslie says he has found a target. Michael believes him, so he gives him an interesting chance. Jessica asks where Michael is. Because he is hanging with a fork in his mouth and a TV remote in his hands, he says that he is not thinking about anything. Johnson thinks why there is still no news about Akita. Reports should be provided about them too. But then Sid calls. Michael asks if he has already dealt with that ship. But he says that the operation was a failure. And Leslie has serious problems. Michael says he thought Leslie was dependable. But he seems to have let him down. Here Mark finds himself at Johnson himself. He says that Leslie took ten people but all the chips implanted in their bodies simultaneously stopped giving a signal. Michael displeasedly asks what their last coordinates are. Only today he wanted to give Leslie a chance, but it seems that this is some kind of joke. Sid says that the message about the game starting was sent from Leslie's phone, but then he disappeared. It seems he is captured by the enemy. Michael asks to trace the message and learns that it is impossible, but when he looks at Leslie's photo, he realizes that he may no longer exist. A strange man in a mask answered from Leslie's number. He greeted her, saying that they had finally met. He says that he prepared a gift for such an occasion and shows Leslie Clinton tied up. The guy asks when Johnson will come to play with them. Michael says to let this guy go if he's not tired of living. 
Johnson says that he promises to save his life if he lets Clinton go. He says that such a tone will not suit, because those guests arrived without an invitation, which means that he, as the owner, wants to entertain them. Leslie shouts at Michael not to make any deals with criminals, to not fall for their tricks. He shouts that Johnson should not think about them. Any evil must be punished in the end. The man slams Clinton's head on the floor and says that he caught his men stealing. He still thinks they are joking. He heard that Johnson, the chief instructor, he says that he needs more practice. Otherwise you will not achieve anything with exercises alone. The sooner they come, the better. The, sooner the masked man says that Johnson wants to come to them, but that won't stop them from playing a little, and then sticks a kanai into Leslie's body. Sid orders him to be released, but he says he will do this from time to time. He flirtatiously asks how many of them will miss, and then says that the game has begun. Johnson says that he will deal with this himself. He only needs a speedboat from Sid, who quickly agrees. The masked man is bored and wonders why Michael hasn't come here yet, and Leslie says that when the time comes, Johnson will come and cut all their throats. Mask says that Leslie seems to have a lot of trust in her instructor, but he certainly doesn't criticize him for it. A man runs in and says that the radar has just detected a boat that is approaching them at great speed. He asks how many people are there. The employee says that there is only Johnson there. The gentleman says that the others should gather and prepare to welcome the new guest. The subordinate asks what to do with Leslie, but the boss says that the fish has already been caught, so he can already be killed. Michael climbed onto the ship. The militants are looking at him. He is also looking at them. They say that they must remain calm. They definitely will not let him through. One asks if Johnson is really such a good teacher, and the other says that he is, because the soldiers he trained had the kind of strength that not every instructor has. But here everything is done to get rid of him, so his head will be at them. From behind him, Michael says whether he will be lucky to survive today, and then he knocks off the masks along with the heads of all three criminals, and then says that Lady Luck herself should favor them. He is noticed by other killers and they head in his direction using machine guns. Michael rejoices at their hospitality. His face expresses a lust for murder, and he himself is simply blazing with flames. Johnson calmly deals with a crowd of heavily armed militants, scattering everyone across the deck. The remaining militants understand that they cannot do anything against this guy. They are not sure that Johnson is even a person. Michael comes up and spends one hit on each of his new opponents. One of them is still breathing. Michael is going to finish him off, but he asks not to kill him, because he will tell everything. He emotionlessly wonders where that jock with the scar and pink hair is. Another masked man says that he is very glad that the famous commander of the dragon spirit fell into his hands, because his guys killed a lot of his people, and now they have a chance to get even, and Leslie only notes that villains who talk a lot die first. Ta Michael is in another warehouse and asks where his man is. He is told that in the third warehouse, he silently crushes his rival's head. The chief of Akita's men went outside to meet him. However, Michael notes that this did not stop him from sending goons after him first. That man only says that he can only have real fun with Johnson, all in the name of Akita. The man notices that the deaths of people were not in vain, nor were they all in order to catch Johnson. He says that now it is his turn to act and bursts into flames. The masked man begins to resurrect his people from the dead. Michael understands why they came here to die, and spirits move into the former bodies of the terrorists. The masked man begins to use some special technique, continuing to resurrect bodies. He says that the Akita members who were killed by Michael will never leave him, they will show Johnson that running is useful. The main character, fighting off the spirits, says that he did not expect such a move and praises his opponent, and he says that even his vanity cannot resist him. Johnson says that offended souls are excellent food for his sword. The masked man wonders where he got this sword, dripping with cold sweat. The shaman orders the spirits to devour Johnson, but he rushes to attack and asks what the noise is. He points his blade and commands his blade to devour the spirit. Now that the sword is full, Johnson is satisfied. Now it's the little bastard's turn. The clown offers to discuss everything. There was some kind of misunderstanding. He wants to know where to look for Leslie. Michael begins to say something, but Leslie appears behind him. Johnson asks how he escaped, whether he was injured. He says that everything is fine with him, he's strong, and this clown left some idiots to look after him. When they were distracted by the noise, that's when he killed them. The main character offers a pill to recover, he is very grateful, and at the same time the Akita fighter is sweating a lot. 
Johnson flexes his fists. He says it's time to start a new round of their game. Here the guy in the mask begins to make excuses. He asks to discuss the information that he can give them. But Michael says that it's not worth it. Because after the game he will tell everything anyway. Akita's boss finds out that Johnson has arrived after all. He is furious. He thinks that if it is one of the top ten masters, then he will be finished. But just like the Martial Arts Bureau of America sent a strong master, they also signed a non-interference agreement. A servant comes running. He shouts that that young guy with a sword killed almost all the members of Akita. The boss runs with the servant and asks that there was only one guy. He confirms this information, but says that he had a terrible and unusual sword. They go out into the street. There is only a sea of corpses of mafia members around. Even the head is in shock and does not understand what is happening. Michael says that the restored dragon blade is truly shocked, so he will cut off the heads of the strongest enemies with it. Kitano asks why Johnson wants to destroy Akita. He replies that he ignored his warning and sent his subordinate to America. The boss says that if this is so, then he will remain here forever, and begins a magical attack. Johnson says that the boss can handle his strength, but the guy's strength is much higher than his. But it's too late to run away, so he must survive. Bay thinks that this guy has surpassed him by only a few kingdoms. But at the same time, he completely destroyed his kingdom without much effort. Michael says that he understands why this boss became the idol of these people. He is possibly the most powerful man in Japan. And in the ranking he was somewhere in the 30th place. Kitano admits that he is strong. The guy will stand out among his peers. He is considered a genius. But he has been practicing martial arts since he was three years old. He is not American but he knows everything about America. The boss says that they should have sent someone from the top 30, but they sent him, and therefore he will die soon. The masters mutually swing their weapons at each other, intending to deliver the strongest blows. After the skirmish, the boss's katana cracked, and Michael was thrown back violently by the force of his opponent. Katano can't believe that his sword is of a lower level. It is completely broken. The boss madly rushes to the attack and says that this brat is not worthy of such a weapon. Kitano shouts that it will belong to him, but Michael throws his shuriken at him, hitting his opponent. The mafioso gets even more furious, losing concentration, but their fists meet, Michael reflects all the blows. Kitano doesn't understand what this kid is doing. The fight promises to be difficult, but he won't give up. Johnson is sitting at a table with an unknown man. He is interested in how he ended up in the cemetery with his power. The man says that Michael will know when his power reaches the required level, then everything will be explained to him. He says that no one should know about the cemetery, much less enter. If someone finds out, then Johnson should kill him immediately, not giving him a chance to become a slave. The man says that during his lifetime he was the patriarch of the fire sect, he had thousands of disciples, but in that era there was no person with absolute power, there were certain rights. He says that he is sorry that the Great War ended, countless sects scattered throughout the world, and his disappeared. They practiced all their lives and could not handle losing. It was the burden of their generation. He asks if Johnson wants to become his only disciple and accept his inheritance of the higher path. The man says that his education, pedigree, and strength are mediocre. Michael thinks that the old man in Appalachia said that he was very talented, but this guy is an order of magnitude stronger. The man says that Michael has a cemetery of rebirth, he has a whole army of spirits behind him. He is destined to destroy all living beings on earth. So does he accept him as his second teacher. Johnson gets up from the table and says that he recognizes him as his teacher. The man beams, putting his hand up. He says that at this moment in time Michael is only able to accept part of his inheritance. The higher the level of development becomes, the more knowledge will be revealed. A giant magical hand pats Johnson on the head. He hopes that Michael will be skilled enough when he has mastered all his knowledge, but he hopes that the guy will then remember to enter the cemetery. The master disappears and says that Michael is the hope of hundreds of warriors, and he is sad that he cannot repay the teacher with kindness. Is this really the curse of the cemetery? Johnson doesn't understand how he can be a hope for such strong masters. Michael returns from the vision, he meditates, blue lights disappear from the air, he thinks that training at night will help him achieve the fifth level of the kingdom of movement, this speed, an unthinkable process. Every time he summons a graveyard, his cultivation base increases by several levels, this is his advantage. No matter how many techniques and skills he masters, 
but Dale Thompson is still stronger than Claude Crank. I wonder how strong the third master will be, after all. About him there's not even any mention. Kitano appears and asks if Johnson is finished yet. He asks to organize a plane for him to America. He has an important meeting. The servant says that he understands. Michael says that he will also fly with him. Johnson says he doesn't like the name Kitano. So from now on he will be called Loex. People gather to watch the upcoming duel between martial artists or cultivators. Mark asks how Leslie's wound is doing. He says that Johnson is a wonderful doctor. He can already move without pain. He will not forget his kindness. And then wonders why Michael has not appeared yet. Ken says that if the guy doesn't come, he will be banned from the world of martial arts. The soldiers are afraid that this means that Michael will no longer be able to be an instructor and will never enter America again. All information about him will be erased. Sid asks if Leslie knows where Johnson is now. He says that he was going to get rid of annoying flies. And this morning Akita announced that he was stopping his activities for an indefinite period. Most likely he dealt with the mafia. And then went after them later. And Evans says that their master pissed him off to come to the duel. And they think that he went to deal with terrorists. What nonsense. It turns out that the dragon spirit takes some kind of trash as instructors. You can't stand up to die. Mark says that Ken can insult the dragon spirit. But he is forbidden to offend the master. The same says that he does not care. And if their instructor does not appear in 30 seconds, then there will be trouble. Michael enters the door and wonders if he really wants to die. The dragon spirit soldiers shout that the instructor has appeared. He will not bow to anyone. Johnson says that he will fulfill Ken's wish. And Leslie and Mark wonder who Michael came with. Johnson orders his new servant Luo X to provide cover. But not to interfere unnecessarily. Otherwise he will regret it. The judges appear. They want to read the rules before the battle begins. But Michael says that this is not required. Let them better tell where they came from here. They say that their mission was entrusted to them 30 years ago. Justice comes first for them. Johnson says it's time to get started and wonders how impartial the judges will be if they're Ken's relatives. But he's actually prepared enough that he doesn't care. The master is indignant. And Ken says that this is Michael's last fight. So the judge will leave the platform. Evans begins to give a speech. But Michael appears and delivers a lightning quick punch to his face. Ken, wiping his face with displeasure, says that it was a sneak attack. How dare he? You can't be so arrogant. But Johnson already delivers a crushing kick to his opponent's face, knocking him back. Michael continues to punch his defeated rival in the face, wondering if he is still going to run him out of the country, kill his friends, or desecrate his parents' gravestone. Johnson makes an attack. The enemy disappears somewhere. The judges approach to stop the killing. Mark, Seed, and Leslie doubt what is happening. And is this still a fight or is it something else? Johnson says that he has already become Ember. They were late. Previously Ken was two kingdoms superior to him. So he decided to use the dragon blade against him. But there was nothing left of him. The soldiers don't understand how it could all end so quickly. The battle took less than a minute. It seems their instructor is much stronger than they thought. The judges ask if Michael understands the consequences of this murder. Now that there is no turning back. Loex appears, he says that murder is welcome in the rules, so one more step towards Johnson, and the judges will be sorry. Sid says that the Bureau is also not famous for its adherence to rules, and life and death issues are decided in a duel, and you condemn him for murder. The judge remembers that they agreed not to let Michael out alive if he wins, so, ignoring the laws, he says that it is time for him to die and goes on the attack. Law attacks the aggressor, easily killing him with magic, he wonders why not listen to his opinion. The dragon spirit does not understand how this man killed such a powerful master, ranked in the top 100, with one blow. But what's even worse is that he listens to Johnson unquestioningly. He's a real man-man. Leslie and Sid think that his movements are terribly similar to Kitano's style. Mark thought about this, but Michael could not subjugate him. Sid understands that now they will want revenge, which means they will have to call the first person in the ranking to help. The boards argue that even though the master took Derek as an apprentice, he still does not take the side of their family, but took the young master into the house, as if he wanted to teach him something. The son of the board family appears, and he looks completely different. He is blazing with magical energy and boasts. The father notices how much his son has changed. He is extremely surprised. Magic is around even now during the conversation. Derek says that the master seemed to open his eyes, 
The guy has been involved in martial arts since childhood, but compared to him, he completely sucks. The son says that he is now ready to fight at least a hundred masters, and the father laughs, realizing that his family will soon be reborn. The master says that in order to prepare the plane, he needs to take the student to one place, and also look at the rest of their family heirlooms. Michael comes to a villa in the province, and says that Loex will now live here, he agrees without further questions, and Johnson thinks that this should have been a refuge for Locke's people, but they refused. Johnson returns to the house, Sarah appears there, she jumps on him and asks if he missed her. He notices that she returned early, she says that her grandmother's work ended early, that's why she's here. The girl talks about how her grandmother is doing, and then goes to the shower. She says that he can join, but he says that two people won't fit in the bathtub. The guy notices that every time Walsh's jokes become more and more impudent, has she really picked it up from Jessica? Michael takes the stone given by his father and begins to meditate. Bureau of Martial Arts of America. Some man is meditating and thinking that damn this Johnson, not only Ken, but also three judges were sent to the next world in a duel. The man doesn't understand where he even came from. This is Kyle Reed. He takes seventh place in the ranking. An employee appears. He says that it was not Johnson who killed the judges, but a man close to him, a certain Luo X. His strength is enough to enter the first hundred masters. The man looks at the photo and says that he knows all the masters from the fiftieth to the hundredth place. But he doesn't know that. But it doesn't matter, they sign their own death warrant. The servant says that the rules say that the fight will end either in life or death. And besides, the whole spirit of the dragon is behind the guy. Kyle says that he has made a decision. He will not back down and will challenge Johnson and X to a fight. Make them bow to him. Howard shakes his son after learning that Johnson killed both Ken and the judges. But he corrects him. He says that a certain man named Law X killed the judges. He says that this man is even much superior to him. He would probably be in the top 30. And most importantly, he is Johnson's servant. Jesse says that they urgently call him a plane. He intends to fly there and show everyone the power of the Howard family. The son says that his grandfather told him not to meet with him. He broke ties with the family, and he says that he had no intention of meeting with him. Michael improves in the magic that his last mentor taught him. Johnson understands that the skill turned out to be worthy of a second spirit. It is unknown what will happen to him if he trains it even more. Sarah enters the room. She asks what Johnson is doing, noticing how he left a handprint in the wall. She wonders if he was really going to destroy the whole house. She is glad that at least Jessica is not here. She would be very scared. Michael says that he did not calculate the strength and that she has a good nighty, and the girl, embarrassed, leaves. Johnson says that Locke will send someone to repair the wall. He sincerely hopes that she will survive until then. He sees that the third tombstone has not yet been opened. He does not know who he will have to fight to open it, but he will definitely find a way out. Sarah thinks that Johnson doesn't know that she knows about his exploits. The rumors about his strength really don't lie and she has to deal with the boards, by the way, she hasn't heard anything from them for a long time. After all, they went to the mountain for the great master, it couldn't have worked out better for them. But then her phone rings, it turns out to be Derek. He tells the girl that he will return in a day and a half and expects that Sarah will meet him in a worthy manner. And he also says that from now on he should be called Master Derek Board. Michael sits and thinks that today's TV shows are completely boring. Sarah says that she has something for him showing him the amulet, and he wonders if he needs an amulet with his power. The girl feels the power of darkness and light from Michael. She wonders what's wrong with him. Johnson says that if something happens to a girl, she can always turn to him. He will take care of everything. Sarah wonders how strong Johnson really is now. Johnson says that the girl may have heard about the ranking of American masters, and so he recently killed the one who occupied the 90th place there. Sarah pretends that she is just interested for the sake of curiosity, saying that he is very strong, and then says that she needs to return home to get her things. Michael says goodbye to her. He calls Luo X and tells him to protect Sarah Walsh. He answers for her with his head. The servant says that he understands everything. Michael remembers his main mission to protect Sarah, but does not understand what else could happen. At this moment Mark Seed writes. He says that the first man of America wants to meet with him. If Johnson is ready, then his man will come for him. Military base. Sid asks if Michael has any idea why such a person wanted to see him. He says that he has important business, 
and he won't be able to come. A man appears on the screen. He says that he is glad to finally meet Johnson. He is a very dangerous and interesting person. He is immensely glad that Michael is on the side of the dragon spirit. The guy wonders if they were looking for him to say just this. But the man wonders what the guy did to Akita. Because Lo X is Kitano. Sid is very nervous. Because now the answer to the question that worried him will be given. Michael calmly answers that yes. Mark is incredibly surprised. Because some believe that Kitano is somewhere even more important than the president of Japan. He plays an important role in politics. The man asks for permission to cooperate with Kitano. Michael says that he can provide this without problems. But the guy is waiting for an answer to his question, what happened in the villa five years ago. The man tenses up and says that he can answer. Because the three strongest families of America are involved in this. Which, not only Johnson can't touch, even the first person of the country, Sid's jaw just drops in surprise. These people, they are the three pillars of America. The government listens to them. Even the Martial Arts Bureau is powerless against them. At their will the whole country can suffer. The man also says that he must tell him that his parents are alive. Michael is shocked. The first man says that Johnson will soon find out where they are. The right people are already waiting for him. And the man must take his leave because there is a plane waiting for him to China. He will return to Johnson when he arrives in America. He says that Michael needs to be very careful and not to get involved with the three families until he is firmly on his feet. Johnson walks down the street and realizes that the only clue about the three families right now is the Howard family, because they are definitely related to his mother. A huge car appears. A master from the Martial Arts Bureau is sitting in it. He shouts that Michael will die at his hands. Johnson sticks out his fist and hits the car, sending it far back. Michael says he doesn't have time. Let his enemies come out. He doesn't have time to play. Three men jump out and surround Johnson on all sides, preparing to attack. The opponents spend a lot of time bragging, but Michael says that they are completely unworthy of his attention. The opponents are left in shock. The masters rush at Johnson in a furious attack with the goal of killing him. Michael uses his new move, incinerating two of the three opponents, leaving the last one in shock. Johnson looks at the hand and realizes that the full power of the heavenly palm is so destructive. He didn't even think about it. It's just a gift of fate. But there is a downside to it. He exhausted all his energy for this blow. He realizes that there is a tough fight ahead, so he takes the pill. And his opponent is already running away, thinking that he must immediately report to the bureau administration about the capabilities of this boy. He is incredibly strong. Johnson, in his usual manner, turns up at the fugitive and asks where he is, if he didn't want to do something with him. The man hits him with a whip and tells the guy to act generously this time and not interfere where he is not asked. The master, running away, shouts that the weapon will not leave a living place from the guy if he gets into his net. The man catches Michael in a net, but the guy says that thing doesn't look strong. The master says something about how his whip is magical. No one can get out of it, but Johnson cuts the whip with his sword without any problems. The man doesn't believe it, but sees how the sword completely absorbed the energy of the whip, leaving nothing left of it. He asks if this is the sword from the legends. The guy replies that this is exactly the sword, scaring his opponent. The enemy tries to beg for mercy, but Michael cuts him down, ending the fight. Kyle Reed calls his masters. He asks if they have already dealt with Michael, if there is anything left of him. But Michael speaks from the phone. He reports that he took care of his people. Two were burned. But he thinks that he is not very will be upset by this news. Johnson says that he doesn't understand where he gets such people from and also that he is waiting for his father at home, and if someone else comes to him, he will personally turn off Reed's head. The man explodes, he doesn't understand why Michael even dares to threaten him, he was told that he was experienced, which is why he took 7th place in the ranking. Johnson examines the stone with the Cemetery of Rebirth, he understands that with its power, either the three families, nor the Bureau, nor Appalachia will stand against him, everyone involved in the tragedy will be killed. He thinks that, as the old man said, his path was not initially aimed at creation, he was destined for destruction, his power will not leave anyone alive, unbridled power wreaks chaos and death, his bloody dragon is a harbinger of the apocalypse. A third grave has appeared in the cemetery, it says that on the day of his return, the world will not allow enemies to escape. It seems to have awakened due to Michael's darkness, the first spirit said that in order to move the grave, 
Permission must be obtained or cultivation must be strengthened. Michael, with madness in his eyes, realizes that for this tombstone he needs to commit the maximum number of kills.